Honourable Members, the Deputy Speaker. Are there any constituent statements by honourable members? And I'll call the member for Franklin. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I today want to talk about four outstanding uh, citizens of my great electorate of Franklin. Uh, these four citizens are Tasmanian Australian of the Year award winners who will go to the national final to be held on Australia Day in 2021. And given what a remarkable year it has been, both in Australia and around the world, I think that these four Tasmanians uh, deserve particular attention and particular focus. So I wanted to mention them in the parliament today. The first is Tasmanian Australian of the Year, Grace Tame. Uh, people may have seen Grace uh, has been very, very active in the Let Her Speak campaign. Uh, Grace is an incredibly brave advocate for survivors of sexual assault, especially those that were abused in institutional settings. Indeed, she very bravely talks about how from age 15 she was groomed by an adult male teacher, 58-year-old maths teacher, and who has since been charged and has gone to jail for his crime, as he rightly should. But she has been very brave and very powerful in advocating for the rights of survivors to stand up and to tell their story and their side of the story publicly, should they so choose, and to encourage survivors and to show survivors that there is a way forward. She's a truly extraordinary Australian and Tasmanian, and I want to wish her all the very best at the awards and next year. The next one is Brian Williams. Brian is the Tasmanian Senior Australian of the Year, who also is from my electorate, and he's been part of the scouting movement in Tasmania now for more than 50 years. Indeed, he's been a stalwart at the Blackman's Bay Scouts Group for the whole time I've been a federal member of parliament, the whole 13 years, Deputy Speaker. And it's been a real privilege to work with Brian and his team at the Blackman's Bay Scouts in uh, trying to get some small grants and to try and assist uh, the scouting groups in the local community. Uh, indeed, we got them a Stronger Communities grant in the last round, uh, Deputy Speaker. And the Blackman's Bay Scouts are renowned in southern Tasmania for selling Christmas trees on the side of the road in December to try and raise uh, funds for their scouting group. So they're a very active group. Uh, and I want to wish Brian all the very best for the Senior Australian of the Year Awards. Uh, Edna Pennicott. Edna is an absolute uh, gem of a woman who is in the south of my electorate in Kingston. And Edna founded her own charity, Kingborough Helping Hands, in 2013 to assist people doing it tough in the Kingborough area. This is an area that was traditionally seen as reasonably middle class and wealthy, Deputy Speaker, but she knew there were a lot of residents in this local area who were doing it incredibly tough. Uh, she's been volunteering for her local community now for 40 years. Indeed, I wish Edna all the very best also next year. And the last one is Toby Thorpe. He's Tasmanian Young Australian of the Year. He's been an advocate for climate change now for many, many years, and he's a very strong advocate. And I also wish him the very best. These are four outstanding Tasmanians. The member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise today to speak about some incredible young achievers in the electorate of Ryan. Each year I run the Young Leadership Award, where local schools put forward students who have gone above and beyond and excelled themselves. This year, more than ever, it has uh, been a difficult uh, year for these students and their leadership amongst their peers has been even more important, so it is a great pleasure to recognise them all. Can I start with the Mayor from Year 10 in Bridgetine College? As a youth champion of the Queensland Family and Child Commission, she has done fantastic work amongst her peers. She works with other youth, providing consultation and action plans for kids on topics such as drug, alcohol and sex education. Her focus on families, on young families, is absolutely commendable. Millie Kent, also at Bridgetine College in Year 11, has done a terrific job as well. She's part of the College's Environment Club, raising awareness for recycling and sustainability. She's in the Justice and, Demo and Democracy Group, as well as, the Saint, as well as working for the St Vincent de Paul Society. Millie participated in the Peer Skills Program Training Workshop and is now a peer mentor to her fellow students, as I said, during a tough year. Her efforts amongst her cohort have been outstanding. Well done, Millie. 
to Malia Knox, Year 3 at Milton State School. What an incredible young uh, woman. She is only in Year 3, but she went out and identified a deficit amongst uh, women in the form of statues, pictures and plaques and representations of the wonderful work that women do in our community. And she started the hashtag Female Faces for Public Places campaign. Uh, and through it work with her local politician to improve female recognition in our local area. Talia Wiley from Year 8, Fernie Grove uh, State High. Talia is a member of the Fernie Grove State School Dreamcatcher program, which is for aspiring leaders who desire to develop their leadership skills. She is an up-and-comer within the Fernie Grove State High cohort, and her leadership skills were greatly appreciated amongst her peers this year. She is also a keen fundraiser with the San Filippo Foundation, raising over $239 for the foundation. Cassidy Ratcliffe, a year 11 at Ferdy Grove State School as well, president of the school's Interact uh, team. And in 2020, Cassidy facilitated the Easter egg drive, again raising much needed donations for the children's hospital and shared amongst the young patients of Easter Sunday, uh, on, on Easter Sunday, some much needed hope and enjoyment. Harry Collin from Year 6 at the Gap State High School. Harry is a fantastic leader in his local community, a keen environmentalist, a keen fisherman who's taking practical action to remove pest fish from his local waterways. I want to congratulate him. Josh Ho in Year 10 at the Gap State High. In a difficult year for all students, Joshua stepped up in a very big way this year. He supported his peers, particularly in IT, which is one of his passions. Thank you for all your support of your fellow students as well this year, Josh, and great work. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today I raise some of the shocking conditions facing staff and patients at the only public hospital in the Greater Blacktown area, Blacktown Hospital. Like many locals, I was born in Blacktown Hospital. It's central to the safety and livability of our community. That's why, like so many other local residents, I was shocked by recent revelations aired in the media relating to the treatment and resourcing of staff, particularly within the obstetrics ward and the heartbreaking accounts of the deaths of babies at the hospital. The sheer grief of their parents and families who have failed is unbearable to even read. A decision was recently made by the Blacktown branch of the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association to take industrial action, stopping work on Thursday the 19th of November. It was a decision that was not taken lightly. They were ordered back to work the following morning, but it sent a very powerful message that the medical staff and allied health professionals who keep our hospitals running have been taken for granted for far too long. I recently met with some of these nurses and midwives from the hospital. They are passionate people who love what they do, but they are angry, and rightfully so, as they are continually left understaffed in one of the fastest growing areas in all of Greater Sydney. They recounted stories of missing out on time with their families because they needed to do overtime to plug gaps in the roster and they didn't want to let their colleagues down and leave them alone. They described situations in which non-specialist nurses and midwives were ordered to work in some of the most high pressure environments, including for premature and complicated births, despite not having the formal training to do so. Horrifyingly, they told me it was common to be perpetually dehydrated, to not drink anything in the lead up to a shift or during a shift, to avoid having to take a bathroom break when they are so cripplingly understaffed. These fasting practices often continue into their own shifts. We expect our healthcare professionals to observe the highest level of medical integrity, to be ready to respond to anything and everything. And yet this government isn't even affording them the dignity to be able to eat and drink throughout their shifts due to current staffing measures, it is an absolute disgrace. I recently wrote to the New South Wales Minister for Health seeking an urgent briefing on the steps being taken by the New South Wales Government to address these very disturbing issues. I'm yet to receive a response. And while I welcome the Western Sydney Area Health District's commitment to hiring six to ten obstetricians to address starving shortfalls, I remain concerned that this will not be enough to address the demand caused by our growing population. I will continue to monitor this issue closely and advocate strongly for the staff and patients of Blacktown Hospital. This should not be happening. In a developed and prosperous nation like ours, this sort of maladministration is simply not on. The member for Curtin. What do you say? Deputy Speaker, there's close to 15 kilometres of beautiful beach land which mark the western boundary of my electorate of Curtin. From the flagpoles at Scarborough Beach down to just south of the Cottesloe Groin, you can't find a better stretch of coastline anywhere in the world. 
Because of the remarkable work done by leading Australian botanist, Professor Kingsley Dixon, we know that the Perth coastline has an amazing biodiversity, and his book, Coastal Plants, A Guide to the Identification and Restoration of Plants of the Greater Perth Region, identifies 128 of the most common plants along the coast. In addition to identifying the amazing biodiversity, Professor Dixon has also been instrumental in helping us to recognise the ecological vulnerability of the coast and has been involved for decades in both research and local community efforts to preserve and protect the natural environment. One of those local community initiatives that Professor Dixon was a founding member of is Cambridge Coast Care. Cambridge Coast Care commenced in March 1999 following a call from the town of Cambridge in 1998 for interest in people to establish a, co a coast care organisation to assist with the managing, monitoring and pr protection of the environment and recreational values of the coastline in the town. Since being incorporated, Cambridge Coast Care has managed $400,000 in grants for coastal projects, mainly trying to protect the nat natural dune system with planting of local native plants, fencing and monitoring. This coastline is 4.8 kilometres long and it has some of the best natural dune system in the Perth metro area. But it is also listed as one of the 55 hotspots susceptible to coastal erosion. This is of concern because it's recognised that the stability of the dune system provides a cost-effective natural defence mechanism against the, natural, against the hazards of sand drift, intrusion of waves, wind and salt spray. Cambridge Coast Care currently has 65 members, including 20 family memberships. As I discovered last week when I had the opportunity to visit, these are passionate people, people who belong to pay to Coast Care and then volunteer their time to weed, plant and, as I discovered last week, erect fences. Their current project aims to restore vegetation cover for the Dunes Fronting Floriot Surf Lifesaving Club. This year's winter storms, rough seas and high water levels the combined result of the storm surge, tide and swell direction washed away the front of the dunes by one and two metres, leaving potentially dangerous sand cliffs in some places. This erosion poses a threat to public safety and threatens to destabilise these, uh, these popular coastal assets. And so fencing has been erected and the design is to build up the natural sand, build up during the winter seasons to enable planting next year. Thank you Ivo Davies, Meg Angleseria and all volunteers at Cambridge Coast Care for the work that you do. The member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. There are 50 schools in Morton, but one in particular always brings a smile in my to my face when I visit, and that school is Milpera. Milpera has a special place not only in Morton but in the greater Brisbane region. It's a state high school that educates the children of refugees and migrants. It is essentially Brisbane's intensive English language preparation centre. Milpera provides quality education for newly arrived children from Vietnam, many South American countries, the former Yugoslavia, Africa, the Middle East, Iran, Afghanistan and Asia and anywhere basically. It aims to facilitate good settlement and a strong sense of belonging to Australia through carefully chosen learning experiences. Students learn to thrive in an Australian classroom at the school. The teachers at Milpera are very experienced and are qualified to teach English as an additional language. The student-centred curriculum uses highly contextualised language learning experiences and ensures that students develop the English language needed for their future learning pathways in whatever school they choose. And it's also got a great volunteer team. Children spend about 18 months at Milpera on average before they are then able to attend a school closer to their home. I went to Milpera for their recent NAIDOC week celebrations and had a quick tour with acting principal Julie Peel. She introduced me to two students, Ang and Rachel. Ang had arrived from Vietnam and Rachel from France, but via Canada. Ang and Rachel took me through a PowerPoint they prepared as part of their assessment to build an argument and convince the audience of their point of view. They uh, had a carefully structured argument and provided well-researched evidence to support their points of view uh, in their new language in English. So I joined in the NAIDOC week celebrations and it was wonderful to see the voices of our oldest living culture speaking to our newest voices. So irrespective of where Ang and Rachel's ancestral village is, or my ancestral village, which I think I guess is somewhere in France or Italy or Ireland, uh, we know that where we stand is where we make a stand. The earth feeds our heart where we are standing right now. So Ang and Rachel obviously have great affection for where they come from, great affection for there, but a loyalty to here. Now that is the story for every Australian. 
whether you're First Nations people or the rest, to tell people that we can't serve two masters, which is what some people have suggested, starts with the assumption that Australians are servants, and Australians are never servants. The free serve no one. The good people, the good ones, help all, but they serve nobody. So thank you to Ang and Rachel. Thank you to Mil Perra for yet another, another wonderful educational experience. And uh, thank you again, as I mentioned, Deputy Speaker, there is an incredible volunteer army that helps out Milpera. Uh, retired teachers, retired principals, uh, local community members from the Graceville and Chelma area that turn up at Milpera and help these people that come from all around the world to become passionate Australians. So well done, Milpera. The member for Petrie. Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. We get to meet some extraordinary people in our roles as federal members of parliament, but some people leave you profoundly affected and inspired to achieve more. I'd like to share a story of courage and bravery, not from a soldier or an extreme sports person, but someone in my electorate who is a single mother of two boys from North Lakes. Imagine one minute you're working as a lawyer worrying about packing lunches and driving your children to and from school, and then you are now learning to navigate around the furniture in your house with a cane. This was Jenny Kramerick's re reality in 2014. Her optic nerve was dying and the world around her was getting darker. I met Jenny at the annual Guide Dogs Queensland graduation ceremony last week, and she was kind enough to allow me to share her story with you today from feeling scared and alone to anxious to walk out her door some days to now regularly volunteering at her boys' schools. Her life and the life of her sons was literally changed when she was perfectly matched to her seeing eye dog, Layla, six months ago. Jenny told me Layla has taken away barriers for her. It has given her a second chance at living her best life and she feels unstoppable and better as a mum for it. She helps at the sports carnivals and volunteers with Learn to Read children at the Lakes and Greats Colleges. She said everyone wants to learn to read with the blind mum. Thanks to the NDIS, an incredible Israeli device that attaches a micro camera to her glasses and speaks the pages to her through an earpiece, she knows exactly when the child gets a word wrong. She said Layla was given her boys, uh, Sebastian and Nicholas, breathing space to enjoy life. They were constantly worrying about their mum, but now they see her overcoming adversity and being positive. The work that Guide Dogs does at its Bald Hills facility and around Australia is life-saving. It costs roughly 50,000 to breed, raise and train a seeing eye dog like Layla. Each dog is expertly matched to its handler, with consideration given to the speed of the dog and its temperament to the household it's needed in. It's an exhausting but hugely rewarding process. People like Jenny are living brave and courageous lives amongst us, and I am grateful for the opportunity to meet her and others. They say courage is contagious, and I challenge anyone who meets Jenny not to be inspired. The member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, Thursday, the 26th of November, marked exactly one year since the Currawan bushfire was ignited. This bushfire would go on to devastate my electorate on the New South Wales south coast, burning for 74 days, taking lives and destroying homes and livelihoods. All of this year's challenges began with the Currawan bushfire. On Thursday, I wanted to go back and speak with some of the impacted people I had met in those early days to see how they were going. I visited beekeeper Vince and his wife Maria at their farm in Yattiata. Vince and Maria had lost hundreds of their bees in the bushfire and they feared they would lose so many more with their food, the bush, almost completely gone. I helped Vince and Maria navigate the complex system of grants and loans, a quagmire for them at the time. Much of what they needed didn't fit with the guidelines and it was challenging to get the help they needed. Last week, they proudly showed me some of the equipment they had purchased with their grants and let me taste the honey they had produced. It was fantastic to see. I sat down with Katrina and Ken outside the rebuild of their home in Conjola Park. 
Their strength is simply admirable, and it was lovely to sit down at the same picnic table where I met them in the weeks after the fire with a very different view. It hasn't been an easy road. They told me about the struggles with their insurance company, struggles with the government's small business bushfire loans and with access to the home builder scheme. Asked to tell their story over and over, asked to value their house that doesn't exist. Asked too much for people who have been to hell and back. But the smile has never left their face. They say they are the lucky ones. I also stopped by Club Malua, the heart of Malua Bay, to chat with the club chairperson, Dennis, about their rebuilding plans. The club was lost in the bushfires on New Year's Eve, but it hasn't stopped them. They have been operating out of a very sophisticated marquee. The bowling greens are as busy as ever, and they are excited for what the future holds. I was even given my very own Malua Bay bowling shirt, so next time I am down there, I will be one of the team. While this year has been tough, it has also brought out the best in us. Our community stepped up in their time of need, and the truth is we have each other and every member of our community to thank for getting us through. I have never been prouder to call the South Coast home. New member for Brower. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I was pleased to present awards to the St John Ambulance Hornsby Division and Hornsby Cadet Division recipients of the Long Service Medal who have committed their, their lives to serving the St John's Ambulance. I also awarded recipients of the New South Wales Premier Citation and Volunteer Recognition Awards from the Centre for Volunteering. In 2018 alone, St John Ambulance trained a million people in first aid, provided half a million volunteer hours for first aid and event health, provided over three and a half million hours of community care and transported 160,000 non-emergency patients to hospitals, community or mental health services. St John was founded in Australia in 1883 and has since developed into the organisation we know today. The Hornsby Division of St John Ambulance comprises 50 officers and 35 cadets. The division was founded in 1958. The division alone averages 5,000 hours in the local community each year and helps over 200 patients. There are a number of St John members who are professional paramedics, doctors or allied health pro professionals, while others have no professional health background. The St John Long Service Awards have been awarded by the Order since 1898. It's a well-deserved acknowledgement of many hours of volunteering. Recipients of the Order of St John Long Service Medal included Mike Malcolm Knight, who served for over 35 years, Condi Kwan and Lachlan Liao, 20 years, Linda Zhu, 15 years, Kirsten Burkhardt and Nicole Simon, 10 years, Benjamin Mead and Andrea Skinner, five years, Dana Nash and Eloise Riviere, three years. The Premier of New South Wales Bushfire Emergency Citation is a new award established this year by the Premier to recognise the outstanding contribution of volunteers and service agency personnel who played a significant role in the emergency response effort to combat the 2019-20 bushfires. St John Ambulance volunteers tirelessly worked during the 2019-20 bushfires, with many being deployed to various evacuation centres providing medical services. The Premier's citation is an award that recognises their efforts. Recipients of the 1920 bushfire citations were Pierre Badou-Daniel, Kirsten Burghard, Rachel Chapman, Samantha Davis, Marco France, Callum Gray, Malcolm Knight, Lachlan Liao and Dana Nash. It's also worth noting that this year many St John's Ambulance volunteers have also served on the front line during COVID at testing clinics in hotels and checking temperatures at, at events. Volunteer recognition awards um, were given to Patrick Gibb, Amula Hadri, uh, David James, Michelle Lai, Emma Mead, Melissa Ng, uh, Aidan O'Sullivan, Adele Ong, Anthony Salol, Catherine Scott, Divya Sharma, Andrea Sono, Richard Wesson and Tiffany Wells. I also had the privilege of awarding cadets with their service stars. Congratulations to Gia Dong, Anna Hanelsman, Bailey Chapman, Ji Yi Yong, Mika Kato, Abby Kitson, Kiana, Tiana Kim, Crystal Lee, Jean Marshall Taylor, Vanessa Tan, Katarina Thordvoldson, Roy Zhu and Stanley Zhu. On behalf of everyone in the Barara electorate, congratulations to everyone in St John Ambulance. Member for Kingston. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. 
Well, Deputy Speaker, I've recently been spending time visiting uh, those living in public housing in my electorate, yeah. and I am dismayed at the fact that many people in my electorate are living in conditions that would not be acceptable in the private mental rental market. I recently visited Peter in Morphet Vale, and he told me he'd been waiting five years for water damage in his public housing property to be fixed. Yeah. While he waits, the lower cabinets in the kitchen are completely unusable and he has to resort to storing food and cooking equipment in his dining room. The damp is a health hazard and has attracted vermin. While I was there, a large cockroach scuttled along the bottom of the cupboards despite it being clear. Peter's house was otherwise clean and tidy. There are many stories like Peter's. 25 per cent of Australians in public housing are waiting for maintenance issues to be addressed. In my home state of South Australia, there are 15,000 public housing homes waiting for maintenance. Another example of tenants who have been waiting a long time for works to be carried out is Michael and Midge from Hackham. They noticed a strong mould smell in their public house just over a year ago. There was clearly an issue and it, was exacerbated, and it exacerbated Michael's respiratory conditions. It took coming to my office for help out of sheer desperation that led to them finally having a water pipe that was leaking beneath the kitchen floor fixed. Unfortunately, the job isn't finished. They've been left with safety hazards of having their cupboards propped up by wood and their floor left un unfinished and uneven. I saw a similar story when I visited Vicky and old Ranella. When works were carried out, they do not seem they do not seem to be done completely, and that the uh, public housing authority only pay for half. So, for example, there was water damage and mould caused by drainage issues in her home. They were addressed, but only half the bathroom was tiled. Same. The state government only paid for half the bathroom to be tiled. So there were two sets of tiles in the same bathroom. I can tell, tell you that Vicky takes a lot of pride in her home. The maintenance issues she is having uh, should be addressed and shouldn't have caused this amount of angst. Of course, there are stories on and on and on. And rather than stimulate in a time when we're in recession where stimulus could occur yep. by fixing these important issues, the government has ignored it. The state government has ignored it and the federal government has ignored it. And what have they got in common? The Liberal parties. Liberal Party that do not care about the very desperate situation so many people in social housing are facing. I urge the government to take up Labor's idea of actually using, uh, uh, investing in repairs in public housing to stimulate our economy. Not only will it be good for those living in public housing, but good for tradies as well. Yeah. The member for Hughes. Warren Buffett, the, uh, also known as the Oracle of Omaha, the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, is considered one of the world's most successful investors, with over 70 years of industry experience. However, if he was to come to Australia, Deputy Speaker, as at 12.01 a.m. on the 1st of January 2021, he would be banned from giving any investment advice unless he first passed the government qualification exam, Deputy Speaker. And further, Deputy Speaker, he would also be banned at the end of 2025 unless, at 90 years of age, he had gone back to university and had completed eight units of study and passed those exams. Otherwise, he would be forced into retirement. Deputy Speaker, such legislation, such red tape is an absolute nonsense. Yes, we want to try and do more to clean up our financial industry, find the Royal Commission. But to force people retrospectively to impose retrospective study requirements on people that have had 20 and 25 and 30 and 35 years of industry experience and have that count for nothing and force someone in their 60s to go back to university to do eight units of study. Otherwise, sorry, you're out of the industry. Deputy Speaker, such legislation is a nonsense. I'm sure people on both sides of the House understand this. I'm sure all of us have people in the financial industry, highly experienced, highly qualified, highly reputable people, that are saying, unless this legislation is changed, they'll be forced out of the industry. 
Now, there are a few simple and quick changes that we could make, Deputy Speaker, to avoid this. Firstly, what we need to do is anyone that has 25 years of industry experience without any black marks against their name, exempt them from going and doing the exam. Secondly, all those 500 exam questions, Deputy Speaker, of which they rotate and put 70 on at each exam, those questions should be published on a website with what are deemed the correct answers. So we, let's have some transparency in this so people know what the questions are, study the 500 of them and look to see what the answers are. Finally, Deputy Speaker, we need to make sure that we recognise industry experience. So my suggestion is we start at 12 years and after 12 years of industry experience, for every additional three years, you get one exemption of the units of study you must do. Therefore, someone with 25 years of industry experience that is in their late 50s or 60s, we are not going to say to them, we are going to force you back to university for you to continue your career. This is red tape gone mad. We need to fix I this. I thank the member for you. In accordance with Standing Order 193, the time for members' constituency statements has concluded. The clerk. Private members' business, notice number one, Australian National Audit Office, motion to be moved by the member for Bruce. The member for Bruce. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move the motion related to the Australian National Audit Office in the terms of in which it appears on the notice paper. Um, scrutiny of government spending to get maximum value for every dollar is more important now than ever. Given Australia's budget deficit is now at a record high, and government spending has blown out under this mob to the highest percentage of GDP since 1970, which is as far back as you can go in the budget papers. So while this motion might sound nerdy and niche, it really matters. Sticking up for the Auditor-General should not be controversial, and the motion simply reaffirms the importance of the Auditor-General and calls on the government to reverse its budget cuts and stop taking revenge on the Audit Office for doing their job well. The Auditor-General is a critical part of the Commonwealth's integrity architecture. It turns the blowtorch on government expenditure and performance. And it's made even more important by the government's complete failure to introduce a National Integrity Commission. Indeed, the Audit Office is one of the few independent watchdogs with real teeth to scrutinise government performance. Now, it'll never be always comfortable for any government, but most audits are uncontroversial. Every now and again, a scandal emerges, but generally not, that's not common. Except under this Liberal government, they're rife with graft, sports rorts, hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer funds funnelled to Liberal Party marginal seats in a dodgy process in the Minister's office. Okay. Airport land rorts. They paid $30 million for land worth $3 million. Liberal mates running riot in ASIC, racking up bills and personal expenses, billions of dollars wasted on consultant mates. Taxpayers rely on the Auditor-General to uncover waste and misuse of public money. But to do his job, the Auditor-General must be properly funded. The ANAO's budget has been in structural deficit for years because of this government's cuts, budget after budget. He's been recording unsustainable losses the last two years of 3.1 and 4.8 million. So the Auditor-General wrote to the Prime Minister requesting $6.3 million in new funding in his budget just so he could keep doing his job. Disgracefully, instead of giving the Auditor-General the funding he needs, the Prime Minister took more revenge and made more cuts to the ANAO, getting his own back for sports rorts. A $1.28 million cut to revenue, a reduction in overall resources of $14 million and another cut to staffing. It's the oldest trick in the book of governments worldwide who want to shut down scrutiny is to starve the integrity agencies of funds. Yep. And the Prime Minister's got the result that he wanted. The number of performance audits will now fall well below the long-standing bipartisan target, which has been there under successive governments, of about 48 per year to around 38, a 20 per cent cut. Shame. Now, the Prime Minister's in question time. He's tried to spin the issue. He said, oh, well, it's not really a deliberate plan, as resourcing will be considered in the 10-year review of, by the JCPAA. That is ridiculous and it's misleading. It's a 10-year review of the Auditor-General's legislation, not of his budget. That's the government's responsibility. Only the Prime Minister and the government can give the Audit Office more money. That's in the Constitution. The committee can't give him more money. Only the government can. But make no mistake, this is just the latest attack on the ANAO. Since the Liberals were elected over seven years ago, the Auditor-General's budget, as of this year, has been cut by 18.3 per cent in real terms. 
And shockingly, this latest nasty little budget bakes in more cuts. Four years from now, the ANAO's budget will have been cut by 22.1 per cent in real terms since the marketing department over there was elected to government. They're not my figures. That's the parliamentary library's analysis. But it's not a matter of money. They're racking up $1 trillion of Liberal debt, but pretend they can't find $6.7 million for the audit office. That is a false economy, if ever there was one. Yep. This is a sustained attack on democracy, trying to avoid scrutiny and accountability for the Liberals' own rorts and waste and pork barrelling and graft. I call on the government to immediately reverse its cuts to the Auditor General's budget. Now, this should not be a partisan issue. And if the government fails to restore funding to the ANAO before the next election, then I believe the opposition, of which I'm a member, must commit to do so, because integrity matters. And I also call out—I see the chair, I get on well with the chair—but I really call out the Liberal government members of the JCPAA for not standing up. Where are they in public? Where have they been out there defending the Auditor-General, doing their job as an audit committee, sticking up for the independent audit office? It's not good enough. Now, given the Prime Minister has proven that he can't be trusted to protect the Auditor-General, it's time that the parliament took the ANAO off him, took it out of his portfolio. We should legislate to establish the Audit Office as a parliamentary department, cementing the Auditor-General as a truly independent officer of the parliament, just like the parliamentary budget officer or the clerk. And frankly, I trust the Speaker and the President of the Senate any day to stick up for the Auditor-General more than this Prime Minister. Is the motion seconded? The member for Second Robertson? Motion. Thank you, Deputy uh, Speaker. Do, and I do, do you want to the, second the motion. Oh, sorry. Should, should the chair should second the motion? All right. The member, member for Bruce has had his go. Uh, I'm happy to second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Oh, thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the <laughs> member for Robert. Seconding. I thank the Deputy Speaker, and I also thank the member for Bruce for the opportunity to discuss the role that the Auditor General plays in our democracy. There are, of course, many areas where. Despite a, a, a personal friendship that the member for Bruce and I do not always agree, but the importance of the Auditor General and the work of the Australian National Audit Office is one area we most certainly agree. The ANAO's work in auditing Commonwealth entities assists in ensuring accountability and transparency, helping to improve public governance and administration. As chair of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I've seen firsthand the ANAO's valuable work in providing reports to the parliament that assist in improving the accountability, efficiency and effectiveness of government. And I want to place on record my appreciation for the role that the Auditor General and the ANAO play and the important work they do. The JCPAA has had a long tradition of operating as a bipartisan committee for su to support and protect the independence of the ANAO, and I take the activities of this committee very seriously. Deputy Speaker, this motion also outlines issues regarding the ANAO's budget. Under the Public Accounts and Audit Committee Act, the JCPAA is required to consider the draft budget estimates of the ANAO and make recommendations to both houses of parliament. As the member for Bruce is aware, the committee made a statement on Budget Day expressing its view on the 2020-21 budget, draft budget estimates and made representations, as is appropriate, to advocate its position. However, this statement is not the end of the JCPAA's input into the ANAO's budget. On 2 September 2020, the committee began an inquiry into the Auditor General Act, which includes consideration of resourcing arrangements. I note that the Prime Minister referred specifically to this review in the House earlier this year and said that the government would consider future ANAO funding in the context of its response to that review. The Prime Minister said there's a 10-year review currently underway into the ANAO and what their resourcing requirements are. When the government receives the outcomes of that 10-year review, review, we will consider the resourcing for the ANAO. The terms of reference for this inquiry will also look at many of the issues and concerns raised by uh, the member for Bruce in this motion, including the examination of governance frameworks and the independence of the ANAO, information gathering powers and the interaction of legislative frameworks. The review will look also look at the Auditor General's capacity to initiate audits, the accessibility and transparency of audits and audit conclusions, the audit priorities of the parliament and the role and appointment of the independent auditor. Deputy Speaker, this motion also argues that the ANAO should become a parliamentary department, inferring there could be potential conflicts created by the current structure. 
but the Auditor General and the ANAO already have statutory independence from government in the work they conduct. The motion seems to suggest a connection between the ANAO operating within the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio and that the ANAO did not receive supplementary funding that it requested in the 2020-21 budget. This would also appear to conflate the issues. For instance, the Parliamentary Budget Office, which is a parliamentary de department, also requested and also did not receive supplementary funding it requested as part of the recent budget. Deputy Speaker, however, ultimately these broader issues are matters for the JCPAA's 10-year review for the Auditor General's Act to be able to consider, and I would certainly welcome further consideration of these matters throughout the inquiry. The member for Bruce raised the need for a National Integrity Commission in this motion. Preventing corrupt criminal behaviour in the public sector is an important issue and one the government is taking strong action on. The Morrison government has released a consultation draft of legislation to create a Commonwealth integrity body for the federal pub public sector. This draft legislation will ensure the new body has appropriate resources and powers to investigate allegations of criminal conduct and will be led by an integrity commissioner. The model proposed builds on lessons learnt from state integrity bodies and strikes a balance between the need to protect individual rights and the need to pre prevent and target wrongdoing at the Commonwealth level. Deputy Speaker, the Morrison government will continue to ensure the highest level of integrity within the Commonwealth public sector. And I know that the JCPAA will also continue its work in upholding the independence of the ANAO and through the 10-year review process look to strengthen the existing governance frameworks to facilitate the important work of the Auditor General and the ANAO. And I look forward uh, to working with the member for, for Bruce on this very important inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, the member for Robertson. The question is a motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Dunkley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for Bruce for moving this important motion. I was elected to represent the people of Dunkley with vigour and integrity. I'm proud to be a parliamentarian and I'm proud to represent the people of Dunkley. But like many, many people in my community, and I must say many people who are also privileged to be members of this parliament, I am deeply concerned about the state of politics and the way that politics has been played eroding and corroding the community's trust in democracy and government. Before this pandemic, less than half of all Australians were satisfied with the way democracy worked, and trust in government had suffered a 20-year slide from 48 per cent to 26 per cent. While it is true that some of that decline has been halted during the pandemic because of the way the opposition and the government have, on many instances, put cudgels aside and worked together for public health matters, it is only green shoots that we are seeing. And sadly, some of the growing belief in the public that perhaps politicians can work together for the greater good has been undermined over and over again because we have a prime minister and a government that not only continues to be embroiled in scandal after scandal, but refuses to take responsibility for those scandals. We have a Prime Minister who has constantly denigrated and undermined this national parliament by calling it a bubble, who shuts down debate on topics he doesn't like, refuses to release reports or answer questions that don't suit his agenda, and ignores long-held conventions and protocols. This is a government which has undermined the trust of the Australian people by treating the privilege of being elected to parliament and forming a government as a political plaything, where the interests that they serve are too often their own, too often their own and not those of the Australian people. Before the budget, the Auditor General wrote to the government requesting $6.3 million in new funding so he could continue to undertake his essential role in scrutiny of government spending and programs. Because there's accumulated budget pressures and spending because of COVID-19, there's a trillion dollars in debt, and this is one of the highest spending governments in history. We have seen the Auditor General's work firsthand uncover 
the way this government has treated public money, money as its plaything. We have seen the sports rort scandal, which is not over. We've seen the Leppington Triangle. We know what um, allegations have been made about um, water buybacks in the Murray-Darling Basin. We know how important the Auditor General is. But despite the fact that the ANAO has been in structural deficit for years because of the government's cuts and the Auditor General has asked for more money, this Prime Minister, this Treasurer, this government has failed to deliver. We also know um, that we have a government that has wanted to talk the talk about integrity but just simply hasn't delivered. The Australian public have been waiting for years for the Prime Minister's announcement about a National Integrity Commission to turn into delivery. We must have a National Integrity Commission, one with teeth, one which has the power to investigate sitting members of parliament and government agencies and government departments. If we are to even come close to restoring that 20-year decline in faith in the public sector, we have a government that apparently has decided the Westminster system of responsibility doesn't occur to them anymore. Robo-debt. It must be one of the greatest public policy failings ever seen in Australia, where a government has preyed on the vulnerable in society that it is here to represent in order to fix a budget deficit. In most other Western democracies, that purport to follow the Westminster system, the government would have fallen over robo-debt, but we don't even have one minister willing to put up his, because they're his, hand to take responsibility, including the Prime Minister who started this entire shameful chapter in Australia's public policy history. We need integrity. We need it now more than ever, and the government needs to step up and deliver. I thank the member for Dunkley. The question is a motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Clark. Deputy Speaker, this has been a truly appalling year for transparency in this country, and the community is demanding to know what else have politicians got to hide. For instance, we've had the Clover Moore fake document saga, sports rorts, the outrageous price paid for Leppington Triangle, Cartier watches, and the ASIC chairman's massive tax bill. Honestly, it's no wonder that the community's trust in the government and in our institutions is at an all-time low. And now, rather than addressing all this dodgy behaviour, the government has gone and cut the funding even further of the Australian National Audit Office, even though it's the very agency tasked to scrutinise government spending of taxpayers' money. For heaven's sake, Deputy Speaker, surely independent, surely independent oversight of this nature is a fundamental pillar of a good democracy. And just as surely the ANAO has demonstrated time and time again the important work they do. Remember, it was the National Order Office that uncovered the shameless pork barrelling of coalition seats using community sports programs. And only last month, the Auditor General referred the Leppington Triangle deal to the Australian Federal Police after the Commonwealth paid a thumping $30 million for a piece of land worth just three million bucks. No wonder, I suppose, that the Audit Office is in the government's sights and has lost nearly a fifth of its funding since the coalition came to power. Seems secrecy is in their DNA, which also goes to explain the government's woefully inadequate federal integrity body. Frankly, Deputy Speaker, that will be a toothless tiger. For instance, it will not conduct public hearings into allegations of corruption, and it won't be able to report or make public findings of corruption. Moreover, there's no remit to look at conflicts of interest and will rely on self-referrals by MPs. Even worse, Deputy Speaker, it would actively discourage whistleblowers because public service whistleblowers would risk being turned away or even prosecuted for making allegations, even if they have reasonable suspicion of corruption. Frankly, we'd be better off with nothing rather than this appallingly designed integrity agency. No, what we need, Deputy Speaker, is a powerful independent body that can hold public hearings, make findings of guilt, lean on a broad definition of corruption and accept referrals from any member of the community. In other words, we need an integrity agency that actually has the resources and powers to do its job and to do it properly. Deputy Speaker, I regret to add that in my home state of Tasmania, things are just as bad. Indeed, the Tasmanian government has officially been named Australia's most secretive government, with the Tasmanian Ombudsman last week confirming Tasmania is the worst jurisdiction at releasing information. 
Indeed, approximately one third of requests for information under the right to information law is refused by Tasmanian authorities, which is a rate of refusal 750 per cent higher than Australia's most open jurisdictions, Victoria and the Northern Territory. And that's just the start of it, Deputy Speaker, because as revealed by an Australia Institute report released today, compared to other states, Tasmania has weaker political donation laws, less government transparency and limited public accountability than the other jurisdictions. Indeed, the report finds that as other states fix their accountability mechanisms following a public corruption scandal, Tasmania routinely does nothing to fix the problem and, if they do make an attempt, it's often unsuccessful. For example, you just need to look at the 2018 state election, where the Tasmanian Liberal Party spent a record $4 million to ensure its re-election, but we simply don't know where all of that money came from. Then there's a refusal of the Premier to tell us which businesses shared in the $26 million COVID hardship grant program. Nor can we be assured that Tasmania's so-called Integrity Commission will give us any answers because According to the Australia Institute report, since its establishment in 2009, the Tasmanian Integrity Commission has made no misconduct findings, held no public hearings and referred no cases to the Director of Public Prosecutions. So in closing, Deputy Speaker, it's simply not good enough all this secrecy and the community is sick of it. Instead, we need effective national and state integrity bodies with teeth and we need to end the culture of secrecy and impunity, which has become so commonplace uh, in our parliaments. And a good place to start, Deputy Speaker? Well, how about a well-funded, independent and genuinely effective national audit office that can build on the good work it's already done in the public interest time and time again? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for Clark. The member for Ron? You... Next motion. Sorry. Okay. Apologies. There being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and resumption of debate be made all day for the next day of sitting in clerk. Private Members Business, Notice Number 2, COVID-19 Vaccine, motion to be moved by the Member for Ryan. The Member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to the COVID-19 vaccine in the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. Member for Ryan. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to move this motion today, very proud of the incredible work that Australia's top health scientists are achieving, and in particular to pay tribute to those working on the vaccine in my electorate of Ryan. As the world races to find a vaccine to the crippling coronavirus, Australia is a key player in vaccine development, with direct investment in the work being progressed at the University of Queensland St Lucia in our electorate of Ryan. The Morrison government is steadfastly committed to ensuring safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine to be available as soon as possible. Our national goal is to make sure that every Australian who wants to be vaccinated will be by 2021 or in 2021. An effective vaccine will not only save lives, but it will reunite families and boost our economic recovery. The Morrison government has announced production and supply agreements for the University of Oxford, AstraZeneca and the University of Queensland CSL COVID-19 vaccine. Australia will acquire 33.8 million doses of the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine and 51 million doses of the UQ CSL vaccine, with both vaccines likely to require two doses per person. In October, the Prime Minister visiting our electorate of Ryan was able to hear firsthand from the team at the Australian Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at the University of Queensland to be updated on the vaccine development. And then just two weeks ago, the Minister for Health, also on a visit to our electorate of Ryan, attended these same labs to hear some excellent news from Professor Paul Young, who is leading the research team. Professor Young revealed that the early data from the phase one clinical trials indicated their vaccine is safe and has been incredibly well tolerated amongst the trial participants. Professor Young also declared that these results show that the vaccine induces a strong immune result and an antibody response equivalent or better than what has been seen in COVID-19 patients. Importantly, the University of Queensland's COVID-19 vaccine trial is running ahead of schedule. Now, Professor Young and his team, as I commented on on the day, are incredibly humble and modest people. 
But the reality is that they are working incredibly long hours, insanely hard. And it's not only them, but their families that are making sacrifices to make sure that they can work those long hours on behalf of Australians and the worldwide community. It was such a thrill to be there in the lab myself with both the Minister for Health and the Prime Minister to talk to those researchers one-on-one, -on -one, to hear about their efforts to create the, va the vaccine, to hear their passion for the project, to hear how well the collaboration is working worldwide with colleagues right around the world that they are working together with every single day and how well the team is working within the lab itself. I have to say that after such an anxious year for so many of us, holding that vaccine in my hand was quite a thrill. Deputy Speaker, not all heroes wear capes and in the Ryan electorate, many of them wear lab coats. And I'd like to take this opportunity to really thank and honour that team that I met and all of those behind them that are the hidden heroes behind this history-making research. I want members in this chamber and in the House to understand just how much work has been done in such a short time frame. On January 10th, the UQ team had their first official meeting, and from that day on, it was full steam ahead on the vaccine creation. The very next day, January 11, their own molecular clamp technology was put into action in the development of the candidate vaccine. By March, March, the team had selected their first vaccine construct, and by June, 120 volunteers had already been recruited for the trial, and then by September, an agreement for 51 million doses had been reached. The University of Queensland obviously has form when it comes to vaccine. It was there in, the, in our electorate of Ryan that the very successful vaccine, Gardasil, was created that helps women right around the world with cervical cancer. But even, even with that success, this kind of speed for this team was something that they hadn't experienced before and took an incredible amount of work. I'd really like to thank all of the heroes that I met, particularly the brilliant scientists of the UQ vaccine team, Professor Young, Professor Keith Chappell, Professor Trent Munro, and Dr. Daniel Watterson for all their efforts in leading a team of over 105 special people for whom Australia owes a great uh, deal and a great deal of gratitude. Thank you. Thank the member for Ryan. Is the motion seconded? Second. Yeah, sorry. Second, second the motion. Thank Reserve you. your right to speak. Yes, Hello, mate. Thank the member for Bass. The question is, the motion be agreed to? And I call the member for Corwell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm very pleased to be speaking to the member for Ryan's private member's motion today, noting the worldwide development for the COVID-19 vaccines. I also do want to acknowledge the government's recent announcement of the $1.7 billion agreement for two of the most promising COVID-19 vaccines, the University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and our very own University of Queensland CSL vaccine, an agreement that will see the, the vaccine manufactured entirely in Australia. Deputy Speaker, I'm especially excited about the prospects of this vaccine uh, because, being a Victorian, I can say with relief that today marks 31 days of zero cases, zero deaths <laughs> and zero no active cases. And this is a very fine achievement by my fellow Victorians because we've emerged from one of the toughest and longest lockdowns in the world. And, uh, Deputy Speaker, my electorate bore the, some of the brunt of that pandemic and uh, that was why it's so ex that's why it is so exciting to be speaking to this motion today because my electorate of Cornwall is also at the center of where Australia's covid-19 vaccine is going to be manufactured and that of course is at CSL Broadmeadows CSL Bering has a long history in Broadmeadows the deputy speaker it's an iconic institution and we are proud as a community to be part of this very exciting venture uh, last week, I visited CSL with Shadow Minister for Health, Chris Bowen. We received a briefing from CSL which confirmed that it will begin manufacturing the University of Oxford AstraZeneca AZD1222 COVID-19 vaccine candidate at its advanced manufacturing facility in Broadmeadows. We were also taken on a tour of where the manufacturing will be happening. CSL has separate contracts with AstraZeneca and the Australian government to manufacture approximately 30 million doses of the AZD1222 vaccine candidate, which are planned for release, Deputy Speaker, in the first half of 2021, pending, of course, the outcome of clinical trials and regulatory approvals. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the manufacturing process will start with the thaw vials containing vaccine cells, the cells frozen under liquid nitrogen to preserve their integrity 
need to be thought in preparation for replication in the bioreactors at the company's Broadmeadows facilities. After growing in the bioreactors, the vaccine is then filtered and purified, leaving just the antigen or the vaccine product. It is then ready for final formulation and filling into dosage vials. The vial thaw milestone follows several months of close collaboration and preparation by CSL and AstraZeneca technical experts, which I'm told, Deputy Speaker, is a first, and it's a first that CSL is actually manufacturing someone else's vaccine. So during 2020 to 21, CSL will manufacture eight large-scale batches of vaccine drug substance. Should the vaccine demonstrate its safety and efficacy in clinical trials that are currently underway, it is anticipated that it will require a two-dose-per-person regime. The vaccine will not be released for use, of course, uh, until the relevant clinical trials and manufacturing data are reviewed and approved by the Australian Government's regulatory authority, the TGA Administration. The Australian Government has also provided support to CSL, Deputy Speaker, in order to augment its capacity and capability to manufacture the AZD1222 vaccine. And this support has enabled the acquisition of specialised equipment and production inputs, the recruitment, training and redeployment of dozens of additional production personnel and the reconfiguration of air handling and some structural modification to the manufacturing facility. Through extensive company-wide coordination, CSL has scheduled production of the ADZ1222 in addition to manufacturing the UQ CSL V45 COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, candidate, which also maintained its commitment, while also maintaining rather its commitment to manufacture the company's vital core biotherapies. Multiple doses of the UQ CSL V451 vaccine candidate have already been manufactured at the Broadmeadows facility and are held in readiness to progress the vaccine to phase two and three clinical trials. CSL Chief Scientist, a scientific officer, Dr Andrew Nash, said, and I quote, this is an important milestone and marks the end of many months of around-the-clock preparation by our skilled personnel globally within CSR bearing secrets and research and development. Both campaigns are still technically challenging, but currently we are tracking well and expect to produce the ADZ1222 and the UQ CSL V451 vaccine for Australia by mid-2021. This is indeed great. Uh, news, uh, Deputy Speaker, and there's great cause for hope, and I look forward to Australians receiving um, a, a COVID-19 vaccine at some stage in the course of next year. Thank you. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As the representative of Goldstein, it is a great pleasure to be able to move this uh, to support this important motion, particularly um, as it has been moved by my good friend and outstanding representative of his community, um, the member for I've had a terrible mental block. Ryan, the member for Ryan, uh, uh, and he's moving this motion because of the critical role of the vaccine innovation and research that's being done in his electorate through the University of Queensland. And of course, Deputy Speaker, we all know that universities play a critical role in the innovation, research and development uh, of this country. They don't stand alone, but they're a critical part, particularly in primary science, and bringing about important health treatment options uh, and vaccinations. And one of the best things about our universities is their international outlook. And because of their international outlook, they're able to collaborate with research institutions all around the world to be part of international efforts, particularly in crises such as these. And it's important that it's done not just with the hard work and effort of our medical research and scientists, but it's also done through the commitment and, uh, and support of the federal government. In the 2021 budget, we allocated a total of $2.3 billion to support the development and production of a safe and effective vaccine in sufficient quantities to ensure all Australians have access to such a vaccine relating to COVID-19. And we know this is critically important, not just for the protecting the health and well-being of the Australian population, though that is absolutely critical, uh, but it's also important because it provides the foundation for which we can have the investment to rebuild and continue to strengthen our economy as we get Australians back to work, travelling internationally and connecting with their families and loved ones. The benefits aren't just in dollars and cents, they aren't just in lives, but they're also in connection. And that's what we're slowly seeing as we've been able to keep uh, COVID-19 largely out of the Australian community. 
is being able to rebuild the bonds that have suffered as a consequence of this virus and the response measures that have been introduced. Now, of course, Deputy Speaker, Australia is playing a critical role in the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, not just for our country, but for the world. We have four vaccine candidates that have commenced clinical trials in Australia, an important step towards a safe and available, readily available vaccine. This includes candidates developed by the University of Queensland, as I mentioned before, represented by the good member for Ryan, uh, Flinders University vaccine, Novax and Clover Biopharmaceuticals. So at every point, we have both the private sector and universities working together to be part of building Australia's vaccine future. A total of 363 million in Australian government support for COVID-19 R&D has been announced so far, including $96 million through the Medical Research Future Fund for research into COVID-19 related vaccines and treatments, as well as further preparedness. But as we know, it's not just about having a vaccine, though that's important, but it's getting a delivery out to the Australian community. And so much of the resources that the Commonwealth has allocated is to make sure that when we have a vaccine that is available, it gets to the affected communities, particularly obviously taking care of our older Australians, those who are vulnerable and need extra health support, to our critical healthcare workers. And we thank them once again for the role they have played in containing and managing this virus, as well as, of course, other people from communities who are susceptible to the risks, who manage comorbid comorbidities or other health conditions, and of course, the general Australian community so they can go about their lives as well. And that's why the research, for instance, the University of Queensland, with $5 million from the Australian government for the innovative molecular clamp vaccine technology is so important. It's why uh, all of the different pathways, including the University of Oxford, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, BioNTech, Janssen, Nova, Novavax and Moderna pathways are critical because there is never any one foolproof solution because everybody has different health conditions and some people respond to different vaccines in different ways. But making sure we have vaccines that are available, that can be rolled out and given to people in the community so they can go about living out their lives is a critical path to getting from what is now for us a kind of COVID normal back to simply normal. And that's what I think Australians desperately want and that's why the Morrison government is providing so much funding so that we can uh, get back to normal from a COVID normal and be in a position to have a successful Australia into the future. I give the call to Member Phil McNamara. Thank you, Acting Speaker. And I rise to speak on this motion put forward by the Member for Ryan, um, who um, I think we, we all agree in this House that, well, and I remember his electorate, um, member for Goldstein, um, and, and uh, I think we all agree in this House that it's not a matter of politics, it's a matter of science to support vaccines, um, that we must be guided by science in our support of vaccines. And I've said it before publicly, and I'll say it again, that vaccines save lives. Vaccines have been a miracle of modern medicine, a miracle of science and of understanding and of study and of evidence and of facts. And I want to start my contribution by uh, saying thank you, first of all, Acting Speaker. Um, last week I was joined by the Shadow Minister for Health, uh, the member for McMahon, and we visited the Burnett Institute in my electorate, which is one of the um, absolute top medical research facilities um, and centres in Australia. And it is proudly located in McNamara, even though they do have plans to head up north into the Parkville precinct in Melbourne. Um, but the Burnett Institute, led um, very ably by Professor Brendan Crabb, um, hosted us as well with the, um, the leader of the Doherty Institute, Professor Sharon Lewin, who also was there. And she is a board member of the Burnett Institute, is a highly collaborative ecosystem in the medical research space. But, but we, we had the privilege of walking around and speaking to the Burnett Institute. And they are doing amazing work on instantaneous COVID tests, um, blood tests that will be able to determine whether you do have COVID, how long you've had COVID for, or whether you're free or whether you've got antibodies in your system. Um, a highly, um, a, highly a, a, a really important test that will be able to instantaneously tell you whether you do have COVID at a very, very high um, success rate and a, a very low 
um, mistake rate, which is obviously a very important piece of information. Um, but they are also continuing a lot of work on their other, their other um, aspects of their research, including malaria, um, malaria drugs, and also um, supporting work around malaria vaccines. And there is actually a vaccine coming out for malaria. It does only have a, um, in the end, a 30% efficiency rate, um, but that is better than nothing, and, and that is also being explored at the moment. And I think that's the story of the COVID vaccines at, at the moment, is that there are some promising vaccine signs. There are some promising signs early on with the science where, um, whether it's the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, the UQ, there has been some early um, results that suggest that there is hope, that we might be able to get to a place where the world as we know it might, have, might be severely disrupted by a piece of science and a piece of medical technology that we are so desperate for in the vaccine. But even, even if we do get there, even if we do have a highly efficient and effective vaccine, it is still uncertain about how long that will, the vaccine will be efficient for or effective for. It is still uncertain about how long that a vaccine will protect us from the coronavirus. So it is important that we are constantly based and focused on science and we are constantly listening to the science and constantly respecting it and um, constantly assessing the, the efficiency and the safety of a vaccine. But it is amazing work and we thank all of those who are putting their time and effort into it. But I, I think before I finish, it is important to say that in Australia, we have been guided by science in order to deal with this pandemic. We've been guided by experts. And, and um, across the country, our health experts have stood up next to our politicians and have answered hard questions and have answered questions on subjects that many members of our public haven't had to think about before. And they needed to be supported by politicians. And I know that there are many people in this place on all sides of politics that have stood by our public health experts. But there have been members who haven't. And, and the member for Hughes has constantly undermined our medical health experts in this place. The member for Hughes has constantly undermined, has constantly undermined our health experts in Victoria, has constantly undermined our, um, our, those overseeing the, um, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA. Um, he's, he's constantly spouted dangerous and false medical solutions to the coronavirus um, pandemic. And sadly, despite hundreds of occasions where the member for Hughes has used his prominent position, the Prime Minister has said nothing. He said nothing to, under, to stop his MPs undermining the health response. This vaccine will be based in science. We need to respect the science and we the need all government MPs to do so. Time has expired and I give the call to the member for Reid. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion put forward by the member for Ryan on the COVID-19 vaccine. Securing a COVID-19 vaccine is critical to Australia's health and economic recovery. A vaccine will give Australian people and businesses certainty and confidence the certainty and confidence they need to reopen the economy and our borders. That's why the Morrison government has ensured that we're ready for an expected rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine in 2021. Our government is contributing significantly to research and development, both in Australia and around the world, investing $363 million in vaccines, therapeutics and COVID medicines, including 257 million in vaccines. As an allied health professional, I have great respect for our scientists and those who work in the health and medical industries, especially with pressures that this pandemic has created. CSIRO, Australia's leading science agency, is playing an important part in the development and testing of a vaccine here in Australia. Our scientists and researchers have been doing incredible work, contributing on a global level to finding treatments and a vaccine to COVID-19. And so I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for their exceptional work. Under the Morrison government's COVID-19 vaccine and treatment strategy, Australia has secured 134.8 million, do million doses through advanced purchasing agreements. By securing multiple COVID-19 vaccines, we are giving Australians the best possible shot at early access to a vaccine should trials prove successful. 
We have invested over $1.7 billion into our two lead vaccine candidates, the, Ox uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the University of Queensland's molecular clamp, which is being developed here in Australia. These vaccines will largely be supplied through CSL, an Australian-based company in Melbourne, um, and who will facilitate the production of the vaccines here in Australia. And this means we will be boosting manufacturing in Australia. In fact, CSL has begun manufacturing the University of Oxford AstraZeneca's coronavirus candidate vaccine in Victoria. And this will mean that production is starting on approximately 30 million doses of the vaccine. It should be very reassuring to many of us that these vaccines are being produced by a trusted Australian supplier, one that has likely supplied many of our flu vaccines. This agreement shows where our government's priority lies, protecting the health of Australians and backing our economy by locally producing our vaccine supply. To strengthen our position further, the Morrison government has secured two more COVID-19 vaccine agreements. This takes the Australian government's total COVID-19 vaccine investment to more than $3.2 billion. Our strategy puts Australia at the front of the queue if our medical experts give the vaccines the green light. And trials are proving to be very promising. It means that we're on track for first vaccines to be delivered in the first quarter of 2021 and will be available for free to those who choose to be vaccinated. Health and aged care workers, as well as the elderly and vulnerable members of our community, will be the first to gain access to the vaccine. When Australia has fulfilled our domestic vaccination plan, we will provide additional vaccines to regional partners in the Pacific and the South and Southeast Asia. This will allow for a shared recovery across our neighbours, which will not only play an important role in leading humanitarian aid, but will also mean that tourism and trade across our region can pick up sooner. Australia has a world-class vaccination program and with world-leading vaccination rates. The Morrison government has built on this capacity to secure a COVID-19 vaccine and treatment strategy. It places us in the best possible position to attain a safe and effective vaccine, a vaccine that will be manufactured locally in Australia and rolled out free of charge to all Australians who choose to be immunised. It's an essential part of our plan to protect the health of all Australians and recover from the COVID-19 recession. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Member. Give the call to the member for Oxley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This morning, I'm not only a proud member for the member electorate of Oxley, but also a proud Queenslander. And it's been phenomenal to see how, over the last six months, the world has truly rallied together to fight what has been a pandemic like no other. And as a proud University of Queensland graduate, uh, I thank the member for Ryan and the work that he has done in highlighting the work of the University of Queensland in particular. And as the neighbour for the member for Ryan, I'm someone who wanted to go on the record today to thank our doctors, research scientists and specialists who have been working tirelessly and around the clock uh, to create a COVID-19 vaccine. I will acknowledge the work of the federal government and the Queensland government for their investment into research and creation of the vaccine. This is a vaccine that opens back up the doors to the world. It opens Australia for business. It's the vaccine that we need that has the potential to bring families back together, open international travel and further Australia's investment and mark on the international stage. The University of Queensland is the, only, is the only Australian organisation tasked by the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to develop a vaccine against the novel coronavirus. And the funding announced is an important expense for CEPI's ongoing financial support. The world, I believe, one day may thank the UQ vaccine team, including Professor Paul Young, Associate Professor Keith Chappell, Professor Trent Munro and Dr Daniel Watterson for developing a vaccine that stops the killer COVID-19 in its tracks. Madam Deputy Speaker, all eyes are on these brilliant scientists who are standing front and centre in the war. But the thank you also goes to the 105 leaders who have emerged out of the darkness of 2020, offering a bright, unified spirit of togetherness. When interviewed, the scientists shared they felt the arms of Queenslanders and other hero across, heroes across Australia, holding them high and spurring them on. Quote, the generosity and commitment I've witnessed has been nothing short of amazing, and the enormous group of contributors is still not 
it is still not listed for everyone who's been involved. I'd like to thank absolutely everybody who was part of this broader team in the ongoing journey, says Professor Young. Together they've been working day and night on all fronts and they've had teams of people and members completing lab work, managing trials, addressing legal and regulatory requirements and, of course, raising the funds to supercharge vaccine production. But, of course, we need to make sure that when a vaccine does become available, that it becomes available to as many Australians as quickly as possible. That's the objective here. Vaccines don't solve this issue and stop the virus. The actual vaccinations do. And that's why we need to make sure that we maximise the number of people who have access to those vaccinations. And I've been uh, with alarm, alarms have been raised with me when I've seen the anti-vaxxers out and about already trying to position themselves, those kooks and uh, people who misspeak constantly warning people of vital vaccinations. So my message to my community and to the rest of Australia is trust the science, trust the evidence and trust the leaders of what they are doing to help protect our country. Strategical tactical planning as part of a, a comprehensive industry policy will help Australia anticipate and be better prepared for such global challenges and changes ahead. Now, I want to acknowledge all of the support staff in particular, not just the lead scientists, but all of the uh, wonderful scientific community that have been rallying and supporting the, the work of the scientists. And it's important to be realistic. And of course, the Australian people must know that they need transparency when it comes to a, vac a, a vaccine strategy and who sees safety and health first. Hope needs to be lifted in a difficult and hard time, but it's important that we make statements and projections as realistic as families, so families and community aren't set up for disappointment. The aim here, whenever they are around the world, is to protect as many Australians as possible. I want to thank the Queensland Government, particularly the Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaget, for her, her tough stance on borders and protecting Queenslanders. We know that in our state that the Queensland Government has led the way when it comes to the health and safety. The Queensland election was a flashpoint in how Queenslanders saw the performance of our state government and they resoundly, resoundly returned the Queensland Premier because of her deep commitment to the protection and the health and well-being of my fellow Queenslanders. So I want to thank all members of the government and in particular my friend, the Premier of Queensland, who has worked tirelessly this year to protect, to keep the Queensland safe, to do the best for our country. Expired, and I give the call to Member for Higgins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. COVID-19 has dominated our lives and wreaked havoc on the health and prosperity of almost every nation on this planet. That said, Australia has done better than most countries when it comes to aggressively suppressing COVID-19 and learning to live with the virus. This is a testament Madam Deputy Speaker, to the Australian people and the personal restrictions that we have, have undertaken in order to help keep each other safe. It's also a testament to the trust that we as a country have placed in our Australian governments to deliver safe and secure quarantining arrangements and, of course, effective contact tracing. There have been stumbles along the way, but it's fair to say that we have now achieved, in terms of aggressive suppression, what is to be the envy of the world. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, what next for Australia? With the influx of overseas arrivals hoping to return home for Christmas, it is critical that we continue to defend our borders and stringently enforce 14-day mandatory quarantining requirements. We cannot let our guard down on this front. This means this remains our strongest defence. It has been what has kept us safe as a nation. But looking forward over the next months and years, in order for this island nation to be able to effectively connect again with the world, whether it is in trade, tourism, international students or Australians simply returning home, we will need an alternative to 14-day quarantining, and that alternative is a vaccine. Thanks to the extraordinary work of researchers here and around the world, the excitement of a vaccine is ever closer to a reality. There are more than 315, 350 vaccines now in trial around the world. Now, over the weekend, it was announced that the National Health Services hospitals in the United Kingdom have been told 
to prepare for the first deliveries of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine as soon as December the 7th. That is one week away, Madam Deputy Speaker, so we're really on the cusp of a completely new world when it comes to COVID management. Madam Deputy Speaker, so far Australia has entered into advanced purchasing arrangements with vaccine manufacturers AstraZeneca, CLS, Pfizer and Novavax. We have contracted for 134 million vaccines directly. I am proud to say the Morrison government will ensure the vaccine is provided free to all Australians. Australia also has an access to a number of other potential vaccines through the International COVAX facility. So we have lots of lines of inquiry open because we understand in research you can never be sure about what's going to develop. So data on vaccine safety, safety and efficacy is very promising, promising, leading to the confidence of a successful vaccine being delivered here in Australia sometime in 2021. The great news is that there are many vaccines showing promising results, just not, just not just those that we've invested in, but right around the world. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is also worth noting that three vaccine candidates have begun clinical trials in Australia, including one by the University of Queensland using molecular clamp technology, one by Flinders University and Adelaide Company Vaccine, and one by international company Clover Biopharmaceuticals. Australia has always punched above its weight in the field of medical research, and this time is no different. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is also incredibly imperative that we make sure every vaccine is safe and effective. And one aspect of safety and effective, effectiveness, so that we can ensure that there is no vaccine hesitancy about this new development, is that different vaccines may be required for different ages because our immune system appears to be differently and responding differently to COVID. So Australia has in, um, enabled the most experienced scientists and biotech and pharmaceutical experts to provide advice through the COVID-19 Vaccines and Treatments for Australia Science and Industry Technical Advisory Group. Now, this group is essential because we we want to ensure we continue to have the trust of the Australian public in this incredibly important development. The advisory group is led by Professor Brendan Murphy, our former Chief Medical Officer, who many will have seen on a daily basis in press conferences, who does have the trust of the Australian community. And he will lead this group of experts to assess and work through all viable op options to test, secure and administer a safe and effective vaccine if and when one is finally ready to be delivered. The vaccine will go through Australia's safety tests, and while we all encourage people to take it, it will remain voluntary. Madam Deputy Speaker, the world is looking hopefully to a future we will have contained and controlled COVID. This is a crisis the likes of which we have never seen. But Madam Deputy Speaker, what distinguishes this crisis from the past is our ability to respond in an unprecedented way with globally collaborative research to develop diagnostics and treatments like these vaccines to beat this pandemic. This is an incredibly exciting time for the world's scientists. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. There being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made an order of the day for the next sitting. I call the member for Kingsford Smith. Thanks, oh, Deputy. Oh, my apologies, member. The clerk first. Private members' business. Notice number three, National Water Safety Day. Motion to be moved by the member for Kingsford Smith. I give the call to the member for Kingsford Smith. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. And I move the motion relating to National Water Safety Day in the terms in which it appears in the notice paper. The member for Kingsford Smith. Uh, is there a seconder for the motion? I thank the member and I give the call to the member for Kingston Smith. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Tomorrow is, of course, the first day of summer, uh, the day when Australians think about flocking to the beaches and our waterways over the wonderful warmer months of our year. It's also the first National Water Safety Day, a day where we highlight awareness and the risks associated with swimming and drowning over the course in particular of the summer months. It's vitally important that on this day we highlight the importance of staying safe and acting responsibly around water. Australia is of course a nation surrounded by water and we're blessed with some of the most beautiful and pristine coastline and waterways of any nation in the world. Now as the weather warms up more of us will head to the beaches, to the rivers, to the pools to cool off and have fun. We love being in and around the water. But unfortunately, too many Australians lose their lives uh, in the water, particularly in the summer months each year. 
Summer is the peak season for drownings in Australia. From the 1st of July 2019 to 30 June 2020, 248 people drowned in Australia. 39% of those drownings occurred over the three months of summer. We are losing too many young Australians uh, to the water. Royal Life Saving in its annual drowning report found that those aged between 25 and 34 years accounted for 17 per cent of total number of drowning deaths. It's the most of any age group and represents so many lost summers into the future. And for family and friends of those lost to the water, summer will forever be tinged with sadness. The Royal Life Saving Report shows that an additional 504 people experienced a non-fatal drowning incident. These are two many close calls that could easily lead to more tragedy. Deputy Speaker, all drowning deaths are preventable and one drowning is still too many. But as a nation, we have made some slight progress to turn the tide on drownings. The drowning report indicates that the total number of drowning deaths over the past year decreased by 8% on the previous year. And despite still being the leading location for drowning deaths, Rivers and creeks decreased by 32 per cent compared to the 10-year average. And as we get ready to dive into summer, we know that drowning and accidents in the water can be avoided if we act responsibly and follow the basic water safety rules. And I urge all Australians to always swim between the red and yellow flags at the beach and obey the instructions of lifesavers. Please don't swim on unpatrolled beaches or swim alone. And never, ever take your eye off children when you are around the water. And of course, alcohol and swimming don't, and, and or boating don't mix. Ahead of the National Water Safety Day and the first day of summer, it's also vital that we note that there are too many avoidable drownings that occur when people go rock fishing. Rock fishers should always stay alert to the weather conditions, learn how to swim, choose the safest possible location for fishing, wear the right gear, never ever fish alone and always wear a life jacket. I also encourage all Australians to learn how to swim from a qualified instructor before they enter the water on their own. And for all of us who use the waterways regularly, please take the opportunity to learn rescue techniques and resuscitation from organisations like Surf Life Saving Australia by joining your local surf club. And I know that there are many uh, members of local surf clubs uh, that are in the parliament and encourage people in their communities to become involved in those clubs. Our leading water safety authorities, including Surf Life Saving Australia and Royal Life Saving, play an important role in helping to keep Australians safe in and around the water. Their dedicated efforts, including professional lifeguards and lifesavers, as well as thousands of volunteers contributing to millions of hours of patrols each year, make a vital and greatly valued contribution to our nation. Interventions performed by surf lifesavers and lifeguards resulted in more than 1,300 avoided fatalities and 800 avoided critical injuries each year. So ahead of National Water Safety Day, I join with my fellow co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Surf Life Saving, the member for, for, for McKellar, uh, and other surf lifesavers in this place to call on Australians to play it safe when enjoying your time around the water this summer. If we stay safe together, we can enjoy many more summers into the future. The question is that the motion should be agreed to, and I give the call to Member for Fisher. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I want to acknowledge the, uh, the uh, Member for Kingsford Smith for bringing on this motion. It's uh, well timed uh, and well executed, so thank you. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've been a surf lifesaver for 14 years. I had to check that this morning. I couldn't quite remember how long it had been. Um, and in that time, I've seen the very best of people and their selfless dedication to their fellow Australians. I've seen and experienced great acts of bravery where volunteers have run and swum towards danger to ensure that a member of the public gets to go home after an innocent day at the beach. This speech is for the brave members of the Surf Lifesaving Fraternity who at times are called upon to risk their own lives to save another's, who usually is a complete stranger. The motto of Surf Life Saving Australia is vigilance and service. Between the red and yellow flags dotted around the coast of this great land are surf clubs and life saving clubs, 
whose volunteers give up time from work and their own families to keep our beaches safe. In the 113 years of the existence of surf clubs in our country, there has only ever been one reported case of a death of someone swimming between the red and yellow flags. And when you compare that to almost 150,000 people who have been saved swimming between the red and yellow flags, that is an amazing accomplishment. Um, I'm so incredibly proud to be a member of the Alex Surf Club, where I've been active for 14 years. The club is an amazing family-friendly club and has, been, and has been since its inception since 1924. Joining the Alex Surf Club certainly changed my life, not just by the people I've worked alongside, but by the emphasis it's taught me to place upon my own health and fitness and has taught me so many life and leadership skills. Whilst I've seen the very best of people in my role, I have also seen the very worst. On a recent patrol just a few weeks ago, one of my team, Steve Ling, pulled two little kids out of the surf. They'd been caught in a strong sweep and were being pulled out to sea. But for the quick thinking and actions of Steve, the outcome could have been disastrous. Assisted by another team member, when the two young kids were brought to shore, and they were no older than 10, where I asked, the, where were your mum and dad? They were up at the bluff bar. Sadly, this is not an isolated incident. Parents, lifesavers and lifeguards are not babysitters. Your children are your responsibility. It's your responsibility to be down at the beach and depending upon their age, be with them in the water or at the very least by the water's edge. Watch them like a hawk. Unsupervised children can drown in the bath, let alone the ocean. I see so many people who choose not to swim in the, in the, in the, who choose not to swim in the flagged area. Some of them are drunk or under the influence of drugs. Some can't even swim at all. Why do they do it? I simply don't understand. Please, please swim between the flags. Bathe in accordance with your own abilities and the conditions. Don't swim whilst under the influence and always feel free to speak to lifesavers to ask them for up-to-date weather and surf conditions. Remember, if we can't see you, we can't save you. Finally, I want to thank the, the following members that have volunteered as part of Patrol Team 3, which I have been the captain of over the last eight years. In alphabetical order, Amy Bateman, Dakota Burkery, David Birch, Olivia Bredhauer, Caroline Campbell, Paul Campbell, David Clancy, Carl Ditko, Peter Duffy, Mitch Duffy, Benjamin Ellers, Brett Fellows, Carl Fiddler, Jacob Flaherty, Brad Graver, Isaac Hampstead, James Hill, Julie Horgan, Scott Howarth, Dale Kleinschmidt, Jonathan Last, Gavin Lewis, Steve Ling, Harry Ling, Jessica Ling, Cheryl Ling, Rob Matchett, Chris Morrison, Angus Roberts, Lynn Roberts, Gary Roberts, Richard Short, Ben Sinak, Christy Taylor, Louise Taylor Smith, Dylan Wheeler, and Kale Willis. Finally, I want to thank Glenn Garrick, OAM. Glenn, but for your encouragement and mentorship, I would never have become a lifesaver, nor would I have become involved in the, in the leadership of the club, nor would I have become PC for Patrol Team 3. Thanks for your friendship and thanks for continuing to fill in for me when this job doesn't allow. I give the call to Member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, the New South Wales South Coast is best known for its beautiful beaches. We are a water community and we have some of the most famous beaches in Australia and indeed across the world. Going hand in hand with that, of course, is some of the best surf life savers. So for National Water Safety Day, I want to talk about the amazing work our surf life savers do in our community. I recently visited the beautiful Kayama to chat with Brad from Surf Rescue 50. This jet boat is a vital asset that is almost unique to the South Coast. 
Manned largely by volunteers, last summer this team responded to over 20 emergency call-outs and accumulated over 700 patrolling hours. It is an incredible achievement and a stark reminder about why boat and surf safety is absolutely critical. Many of the rescues this team does would not be possible without their ability to mobilise quickly and efficiently around the clock. We are so lucky to have them on our south coast. Thankfully, the work of our local surf lifesavers does not go unrecognised either. When you have the best beaches and the best surf lifesavers, you also have outstanding rescues. Last year, I was proud to present three of Kiama's surf lifesavers, Reese Dawson, Brad Dawson and Toby Streamer, with the National Rescue Medal in Parliament House for a harrowing rescue of a rock fisher who was swept out to sea in dangerous surf on August 4, 2019. Remarkable. Well done and thank you to Reese, Brad and Toby. It isn't just Kayama that is lucky enough to have award-winning surf lifesavers either. In November, Batemans Bay Surf Life Saving Club captain Anthony Ballet was named the winner in the Surf Life Saving category of the 2020 Rotary Emergency Services Community Awards. Congratulations, Anthony. Far South Coast Surf Clubs deserve special recognition here, and there is no doubt that Anthony played a pivotal role in the response to the summer's bushfires. The volunteers did a simply remarkable job of helping and supporting the local community during the bushfires. Across the Batemans Bay, Browley and Bermagui Surf Clubs, teams of volunteers led by Anthony, Andy Edmonds and Cheryl McCarthy sheltered over 7,000 people on New Year's Eve. Devastatingly, thousands of local people ended up on those beaches during the fires, trying to find a means of escape. In the middle of the night, teams of surf lifesavers snapped into action, arranging food and water. They provided medical support to those who needed it, and when buildings around the Batemans Bay Club caught fire, they evacuated people from the clubhouse to the beach. All of the clubs used their ATV to collect people from the nearby streets and bring them to safety. They literally saved lives in what were terrifying conditions. Browley came under direct and significant ember attack, with 1,000 people in the club, many of whom the volunteers had helped to evacuate there. They all ended up on the beach. It was incredible. The clubs also stayed open the next day and for weeks as community recovery centres. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, as soon as the highway was open, I visited the Batemans Bay Surf Club to see firsthand how they had kept this incredible effort going. The club was now a donation hub. Food was being cooked for those without power or homes. They just kept going. So it is no surprise that club captain Anthony won this award. It is also no surprise that the club won the Far South Coast Branch's Rescue of the Year for the bushfires, or that the Batemans Bay Bushfire Response Team won the Services Team Award at the New South Wales Surf Life Saving Awards of Excellence. All of these clubs deserve this and so much more. Thank you to all the club's members and all the amazing volunteers for their efforts, not only during the bushfires, but every day. Deputy Speaker, I grew up on the south coast and I understand how important our surf life saving clubs are. That's why in the 2019 election I committed with Labor to a new training centre for the south coast branch of surf life saving as part of the integrated emergency management centre in Nowra. I was thrilled when the government matched my commitment and I was pleased to see the contract for construction signed last week. Like so many local people, I am incredibly proud of our surf lifesavers. Too many amazing clubs to name here, but you all deserve recognition. Thank you for everything you do. Thank the member and give the call to the member for McKellar. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Deputy Speaker, it is my great pleasure to um, co-sponsor this motion with my good friend, the member for Kingsford Smith, whose love of all things surf lifesaving is well known, and if it isn't, it should be, and um, whose time as a nipper, I'm, I'm assured, was great and glorious, and he saved many, many people. And to hear him, um, you would think he saved um, me at one point. And um, <laughs> for that, uh, he needs to answer to the Australian people, and he will in due course, Shame. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I was born in Manly, and it was kind of a prerequisite to be born in Manly, you have to love the ocean. As a kid, summer days were spent swimming, 
in the ocean and rock pools of North Narrabee. Feeble attempts at surfing, which continue to this day, and an admiration for those men and women in the red and yellow caps. Quietly lining the shore, their protective gaze scanning the water as swimmers bob in and out of the waves. As an adult, I still enjoy those very same beaches and respect those very same guardians in the red and yellow. As a proud Nipper's dad, I take great pride in seeing my own daughter getting involved with our local club, giving me an added appreciation for the work Surf Lifesafers do for our community. And I want to go off script and thank Zeke, because occasionally 30 girls will swim so far out to the ocean that you can no longer see them, and somehow Zeke makes sure that 30 girls come back. I'm sure one day a couple of them will end up in New Zealand, but until then, we're OK. McKellar is home. Because McKellar and the Northern Beaches is one of the best places in the world, we have the most surf life-saving clubs in the world. Um, as a beaches community, water safety is always on our mind. Mums and dads swim in the ocean for exercise and leisure. Boys and girls participate in nippers and their surf rescue certificate for the same reasons. And it all stems from the amazing volunteer organisation that is Surf Life Saving Australia. It's an organisation which represents the best in Australia, volunteerism. Every day, Australians from all walks of life giving up their time to help others, often receiving little to no thanks or favour, they do it because they care. The federal government commits millions of dollars each year towards water safety. To organisations including the Royal Surf Life Saving Society Australia, Surf Life Saving Australia, Ost Swim, and Laurie Lawrence's Swimming Enterprises. Surf Life Saving Australia is the largest recipient of funding under this program, with $20.8 million over the three years. This considerable investment has supported programs and projects to reduce the incidence of coastal water related injury and death, increase community awareness of coastal water safety, and enhance coastal water monitoring and rescue services. I have proudly supported local clubs um, in my election by fighting for further financial support and upgrades to their facilities. This includes the $1.9 million to upgrade the dilapidated Long Reef Surf Life Saving Club house. Peter Kinsey, Rob Pearson, Margaret Pearson and the entire club membership deserve a state-of-the-art clubhouse to support their operations, and that is exactly what they are getting. Of course, there are many other groups which contribute to keeping us all safe in the water, including swim schools and the first aid organisations educating Australians on how to perform CPR. The federal government is committed to supporting the work of the Australian Water Safety Council, which includes the Surf Life Saving Australia and Royal, Sur and Royal Life Saving Society Australia. The Council's Australian Water Safety Strategy 2016 to 2020 is coming to a close, and I understand the next strategy is set for release early next year. Royal Life Saving Society Australia is, is being provided with $10.3 million to enhance monitoring and rescue services in the water, including inland waterways and swimming pools. Undertake research and collect data on fatal and non-fatal drownings. Develop education and communication tools for various audiences. Educate the community and promote safety awareness and develop and use systems to benchmark national standards. Much can be said about the brave men and women of Surf Life Saving Australia. But put simply, it displays the best of our community. For it is these volunteers which make our society so great. Yeah, time has expired and I give the call to Member for Dobell. Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak on the motion moved by the Member for Kingsford Smith and in doing so recognise his contribution as a surf lifesaver for 35 years and past president of Maroubra Surf Life Saving Club. Tomorrow is the first day of summer. It will also mark, mark the first National Water Safety Day. And I congratulate the co-chairs of the Parliamentary Friends of Surf Life Saving, Jason Belinsky and Matt Thistlethwaite, on this important initiative. Australians love the outdoors and the water, swimming, fishing or boating, surfing, snorkelling or sailing. It's part of our way of life. 
especially for coastal communities like mine on the central coast of New South Wales. And National Water Safety Day is an important opportunity to focus on staying safe and acting responsibly around the water as we head into the summer months and the school holidays. Deputy Speaker, each, week, too many, each year, too many Australians lose their lives to drowning. From the 1st of July 2019 to the 30th of June 2020, 248 Australians lost their lives in the water. And Royal Life Saving Estimates, another 504 people experienced a non-fatal drowning incident. We are getting better. The statistics show a reduction in the number of incidents. The Royal Life Saving Annual Drowning Report shows a number of drowning deaths over the past year decreased by 8 per cent on the year before, and that deaths in rivers and creeks, the leading location for drownings, decreased by 32 per cent compared with the 10-year average. But we must always be vigilant and even experienced swimmers can be at risk in the water. Only last month, there was a serious incident at Wyong Olympic Pool in my electorate, where three Central Coast Council lifeguards on duty at the time, Douglas Kingston, Adam Che and David Lamont, helped save the life of a young water polo player in distress. I would like to thank Adam, Doug and David for their quick actions to help save the life of this young man and recognise the important work professional lifeguards do every day, keeping us safe. Deputy Speaker, alongside the professional lifeguards are our volunteers, Surf Life Savers giving their time to keep us safe on the beaches every summer. Yesterday I joined Toowoon Bay Surf Life Saving Club President Phil Ramont to present the National Medal to four outstanding volunteer Surf Life Savers from Toowoon Bay, joining the ranks of 13 others at their club recognised with this prestigious award. The National Medal, established in 1975, is one of the original elements of the distinctive Australian system of honours and awards and you require 15 years of service to qualify for this medal. Congratulations to Tracy Cole, who joined Tawoon Bay in 2001 as a Nipper parent, attaining her bronze in 2004. Since then, Tracy has patrolled consistently and is now a patrol captain. To Craig Cole, Craig joined Tawoon Bay in 2004 as a Nipper parent, attaining his bronze in 2005, and has consistently patrolled Tawoon Bay since. To John Vergara, patrol captain John joined Tawoon Bay in 2001, attaining his bronze medallion in 2004 and consistently patrolling to Wound Bay since attaining his bronze and is now part of the emergency call-out team, is a trainer, assessor and facilitator. And finally, to Wendy McNamara. Wendy joined to Wound Bay in 2006, having been a previous member at Lakes Beach. Wendy attained her bronze medallion in 2000 and consistently patrolled to Wound Bay since gaining her bronze. This is a big contribution as the member for Kingsford Smith would understand, patrolling for over 30 hours a year, every season for 15 years. And it's a big responsibility. Surf Life Saving Central Coast annual report showed that 806 people on the Central Coast were treated with first aid and another 564 people were rescued last season by our volunteer Surf Life Savers. And we need more volunteers to help out. If you're ready for the next step to jump in and become a surf lifesaver, signing up for your bronze medallion is the start. Like I did in September, yeah. signing up to do my bronze medallion with Tawoon Bay Surf Life Saving Club. Starting this October, each week I've learnt new skills and gained a better understanding of the surf, the conditions of safety and risk and how to help out. And on Sunday, I'll be taking my final assessment. I'd like to give a shout out to my instructors Chief, Chief Training Officer Sue Hale and life members Mick Cook and Graham Shearer, who have shown this rookie the ropes, and to Patrol Captain and life member Bill Kenzie, who will be assessing our group of bronzies next Sunday or this Sunday. I'd encourage anyone who is interested in signing up for their bronze to have a go. You'll learn valuable life skills like rescue techniques and resuscitation, and the course is offered through Surf Life Saving Clubs locally and across Australia at Tawoon Bay, Lake, Soldiers Beach, North Entrance, The Entrance, Shelley Beach or Wombrel. Ahead of National, National Water Safety Day tomorrow, I'd like to thank all our professional lifeguards working on the Central Coast and the pools this summer and to the volunteer lifesavers, keeping everyone on the coast safe for visitors and locals across the summer in the sand and on the water. Thank you. Thank you, Member. And give the call to Member for Cowper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I am pleased to rise to speak on uh, the motion by the Honourable Member for Kingsford Smith. And I acknowledge uh, the work that he does in this place and, and outside as well, particularly uh, with the Surf Life Saving Club. And I also acknowledge uh, the Member for McKellar and the work that he does with his surf club on the northern beaches. And I'm sure there's some competition between north and south. Uh, but uh, I'm one of the lucky ones, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, 
growing up on the mid-north coast, I had uh, the benefit of the beautiful beaches of Crescent Head and Southwest Rocks and Hat Head, as well as swimming in the mighty Maclay. Um, I'm also lucky that I don't recall learning how to swim. I always, it just seemed I, I always knew whether that was the benefit of being the youngest of five children. Um, but I know that it was a consequence of my mother and father knowing how important it was to get their children uh, into the pool and learning how to swim as early as possible. And whether that was because of what they saw, my father was a, a country GP, my mother a nurse, and I certainly, certainly saw in my time as a police officer the, the tragic consequences of failing to do that. Uh, we've heard today, Madam Deputy Speaker, that last year alone 248 people drowned in Australian waterways. 80 per cent of those were males. And interestingly, the top three locations, one always thinks about the beach being the most dangerous, but the top three locations were in fact a river or creek, 21 per cent of uh, river or creek, 20 per cent in the harbour and 18 per cent at the beach. And one quarter were recreational swimmers. Uh, 20 per cent were from boating. Despite this being an 8% decrease from 2018-19 and a 12% decrease over the last decade uh, of the national average, it's still far too high and I have to say many of those deaths were avoidable. I would like to concentrate today on what I hope we can reduce to zero and that, that is young children, zero to four, dying in backyard pools. From July 2002 to June 2017, 87% of drownings for children zero to four happened in backyard pools. And uh, a study over that period found the most common causes of distractions were indoor household duties, doing the washing, washing up, outdoor duties, electronic distractions, looking at your phone, being on your computer, looking at your iPad, not looking at the kids. And childcare, looking after another sibling and thinking that the little one's gonna be okay just sitting on the step there. Or looking after somebody else's kids. I ask the parents, mums, dads, child caregivers, uh, grandparents, You've got to watch your kids. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of it. I've answered the phone when my kids have been in the, phone, uh, in the pool. We can't do it. We cannot do it. And most importantly, make sure you check your locks on your gates regularly. Yes, you might think that my child's not in the pool. It's OK to go off and do everything. But make sure your gates lock properly and make sure there's no other access, no other avenues for the kids to put a block there and get over the fence. It is so important to do that because this is where our most vulnerable people, our children, our little ones, are dying. So please make an effort over this summer to do that. I would like to thank all the Surf Life Savers. They do a fantastic job. They're volunteer workers and uh, I'm proud to be the patron uh, for both the Southwest Rock Surf Club and also the Kempsey Swimming Club. And I thank them for having me as one of their patrons. I'd also like to thank surfers. I know there's a bit of competition between clubbies and surfers, but invariably when the flags come down, the surfers are still there and they do such a fantastic job. They make many, many life-saving um, saves and I, I'd like to give a shout out to them and thank them for their efforts. I thank the member. The time allotted for this debate has expired. There being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned. The assumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. A division has been called for in the House. The proceedings are suspended to enable honourable members to attend the division. The proceedings will resume when the chair of the Federation Chamber is resumed at the conclusion of the division or subsequent divisions.
Call the clerk. Private members' business, notice number four, relating to NAIDOC week. Uh, I call the member for Barrera. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to NAIDOC week in the terms on which it appears in the notice paper. 
NAIDOC week was held from the 8th to the 15th of November, having been moved this year because of COVID-19 from its usual July time slot. Uh, NAIDOC week celebrates the history, culture and traditions of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It traces its history uh, to the um, Aboriginal activist movements of the 1920s and 1930s, led by that remarkable Yorta Yorta leader, William Cooper. And when I think of that generation and the generation that followed of Yorta Yorta leaders, what a magnificent group of people they were, whether it was Cooper himself or Sir Douglas Nicholls or in more recent times, Burnham Burnham, uh, they did so much uh, to uh, bring to the public's attention the issues that were facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. William Cooper in particular um, is noted for his petitioning of government through various petitions and his most famous petition um, of King George, um, where he asked for uh, recognition um, of Aboriginal people. And we trace some of the current debates that we're having about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander recognition to the work of, of William Cooper. Um, Cooper was, among other things, a, a man of Christian faith. Um, and it was churches that first um, took part in National Aborigines Day, which uh, today be, is, is, uh, we observe as NAIDOC week. Dr Meredith Lake, in her History of the Bible in Australia, quotes Cooper's letter to Prime Minister Lyons, um, drawing on his Christian heritage. He says, are you prepared to admit that since the Creator said in his word that all men are of one blood, we are humans with feelings like yourselves in the eyes of Almighty God, that we can have joys and our sorrows, our likes and our dislikes, that we can feel pain, degradation, humiliation, just as you do. Um, although Cooper was a Christian, one of the reasons that I particularly acknowledge his memory and honour it is because of the extraordinary thing he did in 1938 uh, at the time of the Kristallnacht um, uh, incidents in Germany where Nazis came around and smashed up the shops, synagogues and homes of Jewish people. William Cooper led one of the very few protests against Kristallnacht anywhere uh, and at a time when his own people um, were facing the absolute nadir, there was a view in the, in the 1930s that uh, the Aboriginal population in Australia was in terminal decline, despite all of the problems his own people faced, that he took this remarkable action in standing up for others who are persecuted around the world makes him a truly remarkable human being. And I was pleased to represent the Minister for Indigenous Australians last year at a Jewish community event in December to commemorate 81 years. Uh, since the uh, protest that um, Cooper led in relation to Kristallnacht. I thought NAIDOC Week is a, is a time that we should actually reflect on remarkable Indigenous Australians. And having mentioned Cooper, I also want to mention another remarkable Indigenous Australian who was born 100 years ago this year, and somebody who during um, NAIDOC Week I had the, the cause to think about because we, we uh, sat for the, uh, and stood for the uh, Remembrance Day ceremonies in the Reg Saunders courtyard over at the Australian War Memorial. Reg Saunders was born in 1920 in uh, Framlingham Reserve in Victoria. His father had served in the first AIF, and uh, Reg went on to be the first commissioned officer uh, of uh, Aboriginal background in the, uh, in the ADF. That's a point of, uh, of history and knowledge that many Australians will know. What most people probably won't know is what a remarkable war service he actually had. Um, he enlisted almost at the start of the war and served initially in the Middle East, in, in Libya, uh, and then took part in the battle in Greece and Crete. I want to read something from the Dictionary of Biography about uh, his exploits in Crete. On the 26th of May 1941, he took part in the bayonet charge at quote unquote 42nd Street that temporarily dis disorganised the enemy. When Allied resistance on the, uh, on the island ceased at the end of the month, the 2nd 7th Battalion was left behind in a hasty evacuation. Saunders was one of a number of soldiers who refused to surrender. Assisted by sympathetic people in Crete, he avoided capture for 11 months. On the 7th of May 1942, he escaped aboard a trawler to Libya. That's an extraordinary act of daring do that he, that he engaged in. That wasn't the end of his war service. He went on to serve in New Guinea, where he was promoted uh, uh, as a captain, uh, and later in Korea um, served uh, in the 3rd RAR in a, a major battle against the Chinese and North Korean forces, and his battalion was awarded the US um, Distinguished Unit Cross. He had a wonderful sense of humour and was a man much loved by the soldiers he commanded. Uh, my favourite story about Reg Saunders was when one, one officer said, Korea is not much of a place for a white man. Saunders quit, well, it's not much of a place for a black man either. NAIDOC Week is a wonderful occasion for us to remember distinguished Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the contribution they make to our country. I thank the member. Is there a seconder for the motion?
Uh, I second the motion. Okay. Uh, the question is, the motion be agreed to? And I call the member for Adelaide. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And Deputy Speaker, I too rise uh, to support this motion. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the traditional owners of this country, past and present, including the uh, Ngunnawal on whose land we stand on today. Now, that statement, many may say, uh, who may wish to dismiss the uh, acknowledgement of the country as just a symbolic statement. But it's much more than that, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, it's something that should be respected, uh, and I and many people respect this symbolism, because symbols create tradition. Uh, they create uh, culture. Uh, and importantly, they can, bit by bit, chip away at biases, prejudice, preconceived notions and stereotypes and create change. And this is why NAIDOC Week is uh, so important, Deputy Speaker. Uh, every year, NAIDOC Week gives us the chance to celebrate uh, the history, culture, achievements of our First Nation people. And it's Im an important celebration because all too often uh, our discourse around First Nations people centres and inequalities and injustices past and present. Um, now, Deputy Speaker, it is vital that we keep on doing everything in our power to correct these inequalities. Uh, and right those injustices wherever we can, because the disparity uh, in, uh, uh, in the life choices and chances for First Nations people uh, in this country remains absolute shocking. Uh, whether it's children in detention, uh, domestic violence, uh, um, health outcomes, educational outcomes, incarceration, the list goes on and on and on. First Nation people remain so dis, uh, disproportionately represented in these areas that there is no other word for it than shocking. Uh, this is something, uh, Deputy Speaker, that we must all take responsibility for, all of us as a nation, uh, and we all must play a part uh, in addressing it. But at the same time, it should not stop us from celebrating uh, First Nations people, especially their unbreakable connection to the land and to this country and the contribution to our society. Uh, the theme for this year's NAIDOC week, NAIDOC week is always was and always will be, and that is a powerful statement. It always was and always will be, and it reminds us that First Nations people have occupied and lived on this land that we call home today uh, on this continent for over 65,000 years. Um, Deputy Speaker, uh, uh, during those 65,000 years, they've had a long and rich spiritual and cultural connection to this country. And this year's NAIDOC Week reminds us that Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Islander people were Australia's first explorers, uh, first navigators, first engineers, first farmers, first botanists, first scientists, first diplomats, first astronomers and first artists. And that is something we should celebrate one of the longest periods of any history in the world, over 65,000 years. Uh, we should be proud of this, and we should be proud to have one of the world's oldest oral stories, paintings of ceremony and unique technologies right here on this country we call home. Their connection to and knowledge of the land has taught them to adapt to climate change, droughts, rising sea levels, and the list goes on, Deputy Speaker. So while we learn at university, um, and schools about Shakespeare, Egyptian pyramids, European explorers, classical Greek. Uh, we should also be learning about the great pioneers who inhabited this land long, long before us. So NAIDOC Week remain, reminds us that there is a gap in our knowledge and understanding and that we would all be richer were we to know more about it. Uh, and as I said, always was and always will be. Imagine there were hun once hundreds of nations uh, throughout our continent speaking hundreds of different languages, um, with different stories, different histories. It's estimated in the late 18th century, around 250 distinct indigenous language groups covered this continent. Today, 100, around 120 of those languages are still spoken, and many, unfortunately, are at risk of being lost as the elders pass on. Uh, and the loss of language is that link that connects us from generation to generation. When you break that link, that connectivity somehow uh, breaks as well. So it's so important to try and keep as many of these languages going uh, as much as we can and to do everything we can as governments to assist those languages continuing. Um, Deputy Speaker, uh, they're not just the means of communication, they express knowledge about everything, law, 
uh, geography, history, family, human relationships, philosophy, religion, anatomy, childcare, health, caring for our country, astronomy, biology and food. So their continued loss is also our loss, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. The question is the motion be agreed to and I call the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And Deputy Speaker, can I firstly uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet and pay respect to the elders past and present, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, as the foundation of this discussion about the celebration of NAIDOC week. And uh, I want to do so also by thanking um, in particular uh, my esteemed colleague, the member for Barara, for bringing this motion on um, to acknowledge the critical role that NAIDOC week plays in the celebration of our national life and culture, and while it was only a couple of weeks ago, that the spirit that sits behind NAIDOC week is not something we need contained to the week, but something that we can celebrate as part of the ongoing continuum of our country year round. And that is what we are ultimately celebrating in NAIDOC week. Not a moment, not a day, but the continuation of a culture surviving for more than 65,000 people on, let's face it, one of the most arduous and challenging continents on earth. And of course, against the backdrop of European settlement and the consequences that have come for that, come for, that for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And that's why the theme of always was, always will be is such a critical theme because it's about that continuum. And that while there may have been moments of disruption that we celebrate the contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, as uh, the uh, member previous remarked, as the first explorers, first navigators, first engineers, first farmers, first botanists, first scientists, first diplomats, first astronomers, first artists, but first owners, first cultivators, first contributors, and first celebrators of the earth that sits beneath our feet. And that is something we should celebrate critically for one week, but it's something that we should celebrate year round because it's part of our journey as a country. And while we go through discussions about what should be in the constitution or other legislative proposals for recognising the critical role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and making sure they have their voice, not just to our nation's parliament, but of course to address the historical injustices uh, that have confronted them, we must always recognise that continuum and that the objective is not to have separate mobs but to have one mob where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders recognise the contribution that all Australians make and that we recognise the contribution that they make. And I was particularly touched many years ago when I went to a recognised dinner uh, where this point was made critically. Uh, by that incredible uh, Indigenous uh, leader and daughter of another incredible Indigenous leader, Rachel Perkins, um, who's always been both pragmatic but romantic, and I say that as a compliment about the role that we all have in the, continuing or the continuum of this country and its future. And we should do so because there is so much that we as all, uh, all Australians can learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders through their arts, their culture, their cultivation and their respect for this land. And one of the issues that we all um, uh, must confront is the consequences of denying culture and particularly of the erosion of languages. Because languages are not just the pathway obviously to communicate, but sitting behind them are so many of the values and sitting behind them are so many uh, of the stories that pre-existed the codification through modern European settlement. Some of them survive in artworks, but we must keep them alive today. And it's also an opportunity, or NAIDOC Week is also an opportunity to celebrate the incredible contributions of many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who have made their contribution to the success of our country. And I know the member for Brower referred specifically to William Cooper, who uh, uh, is one of the most significant people in our country, regardless of their uh, indigeneity. It just adds even greater weight because of the specific challenges that Indigenous Australians were focusing at the time. Mm -hmm. To be bold and courageous enough to stand up for people across the world and to say no more. And this is not the type of conduct that we will accept. And of course, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who've made their way into this parliament 
and have made an incredible contribution uh, to this parliament as well. And I always remember, of course, the first Indigenous senator, um, Neville Bonner, from the great state of Queensland, as uh, followed by many other Indigenous leaders who represent uh, all communities in this parliament today. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. The question is, the motion be agreed to? And I call the member for McNamara. Thank you, uh, Acting Speaker. And I, I rise to speak on the member for Barawa's motion on NAIDOC week, and I commend him for putting this motion forward and also note his ongoing commitment to this issue and to, um, and to Indigenous Australians, and his sincerity and his commitment to it is, is noted, and, um, and it is a very good thing, um, Acting Speaker. I, I, I too start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge traditional owners from where I represent, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. This NAIDOC week locally um, was marked in a couple of ways. The city of Port Phillip, um, together with Ngawi, Dr Caroline Briggs, AM, the um, elder of the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boomerang, um, uh, celebrated NAIDOC week. She welcomed the country and then there was a, a number of local uh, events, including Uncle Jack Charles did a guided meditation for those in Port Phillip, and um, it, it truly was a celebration of um, local Indigenous culture, but also Indigenous culture locally. And, um, and I, I think it's a wonderful thing that we stopped and celebrated and, and, and marked it. But it is not all just, it is not all just um, positivity, to be honest, Acting Speaker. I think that whenever we stop and speak about Indigenous Australians and the issues that confront them on a daily basis, we need to be sombre as well and note that there is much to do and that while we are constantly reminded and renewed um, of our focus through events and, and um, celebrations like NAIDOC Week, it does also mean that we have to be honest and fair about the work that still needs to be done and be critical of the fact that we haven't achieved what we should have up until now. The theme of NAIDOC this week was, always was and always will be. Always was, 65,000 years of history of this great country and the fact that we will never ever be able to, we will never ever take that away and we will celebrate that into the future identity of what it is to be Australian. Indigenous Australians understood things that I think that we are still grappling with, how to live sustainably onto the land, how to manage water sustainably, how to not take too much from the land on which we live, but to live in harmony with our surroundings. And I think that we have much to heed from the past and from the, the, the thousands of years of civilization that happened before we all arrived in this country. But I also think that in order to bring that forward and to close some of the truly ugly and awful differences in the life and life expectancy between Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians, we need to listen to the one key thing that Indigenous Australians are asking for, and that is more of a say in their own affairs, and that is more of a say in their own issues and the policies that affect them and their lives. And the coming together in 2017 at Uluru for a remarkable and sincere document of the Uluru Statement from the Heart is one that it, it, it saddens me a little bit that we, are, we don't have bipartisan support in full for the Uluru Statement from the Heart, that that is, that is fracturing and that, that there is actually only one political party that supports the Uluru Statement in full. And that is not something I say with pride, that is something I say with disappointment, that we stand ready and that we will um, we, we await the government and the coalition to come on board and to not let this be a partisan issue. It is, we, we gain nothing by having this as a partisan issue and we need to come together. And in fact, a recent survey found that a vast majority, 81% of Australians, are happy for a constitutionally enshrined voice, a voice protected in the constitution. It's not something that we should be afraid of. My, my, you know, we, we all remember the hesitation that, that Former Prime Minister Howard said, had in saying sorry, it became 
it became a matter of culture and politics when it didn't need to be. We don't need to be standing here today afraid of what a voice and what listening and, and respecting the requests of Indigenous Australians means. We, we can stand here with confidence and engage and build something that is, is unifying and is embracing of the past and of the future. And NAIDOC Week presents us with an opportunity to remind ourselves of that. And I hope that we have a better future and a bipartisan future on this very front. I thank the member. The question is the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the, the sorry, the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand and acknowledge their leaders emerging past and present. Thank you. Um, this week's NAIDOC Week theme is always was, always will be. This theme recognises that Indigenous Australians have occupied and cared for this continent for 65,000 years. Indigenous culture is important today as it was 65,000 years ago, and Indigenous Australians remain spiritually and culturally connected to this country. NADOC Week provides an opportunity for all Australians to reflect on and understand our nation's shared history and the remarkable and ongoing contribution of our Indigenous people. That it always was and it always will be. Indeed, a greater understanding of the role of Indigenous Australians has played in building and shaping the nation we all call home, and it's critical for all Australians. This year, we celebrated NAIDOC Week to recognise the history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The challenge of COVID-19 meant that this year we came together differently to ce celebrate our community and history. This was often done virtually or in smaller numbers, though it did in no way reduced the significance of this year's celebration. Mr Deputy Speaker, as a medical student, I successfully won an AMA travel scholarship. I used this scholarship to travel to the Northern Territory to investigate the high mortality rates for newborns in our Indigenous population in Arnhem Land. What I saw there shocked me. It mirrored what I'd seen on an elective in Kenya just the year before. It was hard to grapple the stark difference between the remote Indigenous communities I was working in and the inner city Melbourne where I had lived. At the time, child and infant mortality rates were off the scale. In 1986, children born then had a life expectancy that was dramatically different from non-Indigenous Australians. Fast forward 30 years and there has been marked improvement in outcomes for Indigenous women and their children. This is because of concerted efforts of consecutive governments from both sides of the aisle. But it is still not good enough, and the rates of mortality remain twice that of non-Indigenous children. More Indigenous mothers are attending antenatal care earlier and more frequently, and education about risks such as smoking remain lower in women now than they were before. And these are important measures that hopefully will, will lead to improving outcomes. You can't just wish for outcomes, you need to take action. And it is important that the Closing the Gap report has been refreshed this year by the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, and it has more ambitions for better outcomes. But the target to close the gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians within a generation by 2031 is still not on track. Non-Indigenous mortality rates have improved at a similar rate, but unfortunately, to, to, to non-Indigenous Australians, but unfortunately the gap has not yet narrowed. Mr Deputy Speaker, I firmly believe that education is the key to self-determination, not just for non-Indigenous Australians, but definitely for Indigenous people too. Education leads to better health and social outcomes for all communities around the world, and that is the one takeout from the Closing the Gap report that we can celebrate then that is that there are, better, there are better entries of children into PrEP for Indigenous communities and there is better retention at year 12. This means that with more, year, more Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders uh, achieving year 12 or equivalent collocations, there'll be more of them attending higher education and more of them um, entering better jobs and better professions. And this will lead to better outcomes for the Indigenous population and the wider general community. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said in my first speak, speech, a strong country is one that is at peace with its past. NAIDOC Week is one small, regular but critical annual event in this journey of healing and understanding. I believe that constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians is a critical next step on that road to a stronger future for all Australians. I thank Minister Ken Wyatt, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, 
for inviting me to be a member of the work Parliamentary Working Group on Constitutional Recognition for Indigenous Australians. Mr Deputy Speaker, NAIDOC Week has evolved into a proud tradition which recognises the remarkable and ongoing contribution of our Indigenous people. Modern Australia must recognise our Indigenous <coughs> people. This may not be and always was, but it most certainly must be and always will be. By reflecting on our past, we can understand the present and look to a better future. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. The question is, the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Solomon. Thank, thanks, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, NAIDOC Week is, of course, a fantastic opportunity for the entire country to celebrate our diverse Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and their very long, deep history across this continent for millennia. Now, there's much to celebrate and there's much that we can all be very proud of. Uh, there's also obviously things that we are not proud of, but the strength of NAIDOC Week is that we focus uh, ourselves on where we've come from, uh, celebrate uh, the incredible First Nations communities that we have in our country and look to the future and making lives better. Uh, during NAIDOC Week, we were here in Canberra for sittings, uh, so along with uh, colleagues from our Labor's First Nations Caucus Committee, we visited uh, the Winunga Nimitja Aboriginal Health and Community Services Centre in Narrabunda. Uh, it was a fantastic visit. Uh, that's an Aboriginal controlled health service right here in the nation's capital. Uh, it was an excellent reminder of the power of Aboriginal controlled health services uh, and the results they get, the fantastic results they get. Our First Nations health professionals obviously have a unique insight and are best place to uh, improve the lives of First Nations people. They have the culturally appropriate uh, way about operating. Uh, they know uh, how to get the best results uh, for our First Nations brothers and sisters. Uh, the work of uh, our First Nations Caucus Committee uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Mike Freelander here with us today, who, along with the member for Lingiari, Warren <coughs> Snowden, have really been pushing this um, really important concept of the first thousand days. Uh, and that is not just limited to First Nations Australians. Of course, if all um, parents uh, create a really healthy environment from antenatal uh, through birth into that postnatal stage, Good perinatal health for the mum and the bub uh, is going to give us the healthiest young Australians possible, yeah. um, which, is, uh, which should be all of our aims. And the role of the Aboriginal controlled health centres is that that support during that first thousand days is uh, absolutely essential and is making a huge difference. Uh, these Aboriginal controlled health organisations around the country are also really empowering our First Nations communities, uh, as well as improving their access to health services. In the top end of Australia, and we heard the member for Higgins refer to uh, her eyes being opened whilst visiting the Northern Territory, uh, but in my electorate in Darwin and in Palmerston, uh, we've got a fantastic Aboriginal controlled uh, health centre series of clinics uh, called Danila Dilba. Uh, they do wonderful work and they serve about 80 per cent of our large Indigenous population in the Greater Darwin area. Uh, they also look after huge numbers of uh, First Nations people, Aboriginal Territorians that come in from the communities into Darwin. Uh, they do a great job. They're reducing strokes and heart attacks, they're preventing low birth weights and they're also preventing complications from diabetes. Um, now people who engage with Danila Dilba Health Services are likely um, are less likely to need to engage with other health services and a Deloitte analysis found that every dollar invested in health services gener generated a four dollar return or, or benefit to society. So that's uh, terrific economics uh, by any measure and it's terrific humanity by any measure. I uh, also want to acknowledge uh, Yili Yurung and when the Labor leader Anthony Albanese was in Darwin recently we visited this great NGO is helping in the accommodation space for First Nations uh, people. So I want to acknowledge their CEO, uh, Leanne Caton, 
and also congratulate her for being appointed chair of the Aboriginal Benefits Account Advisory Committee. She's a great asset uh, and will do a fantastic job in all her roles. Um, during NAIDOC week, the Larrakia Nation uh, launched its Lightning the Spark initiative, which is working with young people to help promote youth entrepreneurship, and I want to uh, congratulate Nicole Brown from Larrakia Nation. I want to also congratulate quickly uh, the NT Indigenous Business Network, in particular CEO Jerome Cabillo and Steve Cardona, who are doing a fantastic job uh, helping Indigenous businesses thrive. I thank the member. The time allotted for this debate has expired. The debate, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made an order of the day for the next sitting. I call the clerk. Private Members Business Notice Number 5 relating to refugee resettlement. I give the call to the member for Scullin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to refugee resettlement in the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. I often say when beginning my remarks, Deputy Speaker, that I'm pleased to be speaking to this motion, but I'm not pleased to have to speak to this motion. I'm not pleased that after seven years these issues are still before the parliament, still unresolved when they could so easily be resolved. There are many issues when it comes to our obligations to people seeking our help from uh, places around the world in turmoil that are difficult, that are challenging, and we should confront them. We should debate them in this place and in the community thoughtfully, decently and guided by our values. But here we have a simple proposition that sadly is not being addressed. It is being addressed in the community, and that's something that this motion acknowledges, that uh, more than 65,000, and I understand more people since then, have signed a petition saying enough is enough, calling on the Morrison government after seven years to accept the generous offer made by a former Prime Minister of New Zealand to resettle these people found to have been refugees there to enable them to begin their lives. But I move this motion now um, to speak to a number of audiences, firstly to those refugees who have been trapped in limbo for so long, to say that they are not forgotten in this place, to say that those who have come together to sign this petition to stand up for their values, for Australian values, that they are being listened to, that they are a part of this democracy and their voices matter uh, to many of us in this place. I'm very pleased that this motion is not just a, a Labor motion, it's a motion that's been seconded by my friend, the member for Ringa, and I believe it's broadly supported on the crossbench. Um, all of us who, who have different perspectives on this issue and many other issues, but on this case, we've come together to say we can do better and that for this group of vulnerable human beings, enough is enough. And I was very pleased to stand out the front of Australia's parliament uh, in the last sittings and receive this petition along with many parliamentary colleagues and uh, to acknowledge the enormous work that Craig Foster and Sonny Bill Williams have done together with that fantastic group of Australians, Amnesty International Australia, to bring together so many people. And I want to recognise their leadership. And, and we hear a lot of talk in this place about Australian values, Deputy Speaker, in particular about the fair go. But Craig Foster and Sonny Bill Williams have really exemplified that in a way that many of us should think about. The core of this issue is really at the failure of this government to do what is right for a group of vulnerable human beings. For seven years, slightly longer than the time that I've been in this place, New Zealand has offered to, to resettle those refugees who are on PNG and in Nauru. It's now been seven years and 134 days that people have been detained, seemingly endlessly, with all that entails, all the damage to their prospects. We have seen too often the most tragic stories result from that unimaginable tragedies, and these are things that I reflect on more than anything else as I go about my work in this place. And I acknowledge that some, a large number in fact, I should say, have been resettled in the United States through arrangements that we supported at the time, and I hope those arrangements can be complete. It is heartwarming to hear about lives being rebuilt once people have been resettled. But why have they not been resettled in New Zealand when this is an offer that has been on the table for so long? when there is no plausible argument against it being accepted. Too often in this place, too often in this debate, we see the purest and basest politics attached to the issue of people seeking asylum in Australia. Too often, 
too often in the administration of this portfolio, we have seen cruelty for cruelty's own sake. And just last week, I spoke about a man, Farad Ramadi, who's uh, been moved around for what appears to be the crime of speaking out, for alerting the Australian community to what is happening initially in the Kangaroo Point APOD and subsequently at other facilities of detention. And in reflecting on him and the contribution he might be making, I again urge government members, and I'm very pleased that the member for Rara will be participating in this debate because we uh, perhaps come at our roles from rather different perspectives. He is a thoughtful and decent man, and I'm sure he applies himself to the challenge of this with all the qualities he brings to the other aspects of this. But I've been thinking fundamentally about this seven years, what's happened in my life, the growth of my children, the significant events that have taken place, the significance that some aspects of my work have brought to me. And I ask myself, what is different for these people? And I say to them, for me and for us, enough is enough. I thank the member. Is there a seconder for the motion? I second this motion and reserve my right to speak. I thank the member. The question is, the motion be agreed to? And I call the member for Barrera. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the member for Scullin and his uh, genuine commitment to these issues and his very kind personal reflection on myself. I, I have great respect for the member for Scullin, but on this issue, I think we're going to find ourselves on, opposite, uh, on very much opposite sides. Um, I want to start by looking at the history of this issue and go um, a bit deeper and a bit longer than, than the member for Scullin did in his contribution, and that is to go back to the end of John Howard's period in government and to remind this parliament that when John Howard left office there were four unauthorised maritime arrivals in detention and no children. That's the truth of what happened at that time. On election eve, Kevin Rudd, the opposition leader, said that he backed John Howard's strong border protection policies, but that is not what he proceeded to do when he sat uh, on the Treasury benches. And as a result of the policies that Labor brought in during their time in office, over 50,000 people arrived by boat on 800 boats. 1,200 people drowned at sea. 1,200 people drowned at sea. I never want to forget those people because they are lives that were needlessly lost because of the failure of the Labor Party's border protection. 8,000 children were detained. And in July 2013, at the end of the Labor years, there were 10,201 people in detention including almost 2,000 children. 17 detention centres needed to be reopened as a result of these failed policies, and the border protection failures cost the taxpayer $17 billion. These are things that we never want to see restart in Australia. We never want to return to this. And these policies came about because the Labor Party was not prepared to undertake the tough measures that the government has been um, able and willing to bring into place, which have stopped the boat arrivals, and those include the turnbacks where it's safe to do so, offshore processing and the temporary protection visas. These are tough measures. They're hard measures. But they are measures that have stopped the boats coming and they have stopped the deaths at sea and they are measures that I am proud to support. They've also seen the closure of 19 detention centres and the removal of all children from detention. And that's, again, something that we should be proud of uh, in this parliament. What does having a border protection program that actually works allow you to do? It restores public confidence in immigration. That's so important. And it allows you, as a result of the restoration of public confidence, to be more generous about your humanitarian program. We went from a period uh, under Labor where we had 13,750 refugees to a period now where we have 18,750 uh, refugees. We've increased the number of refugees from the Syrian conflict, allowing us to take 12,000 refugees. You cannot incorporate people in those situations unless you have public confidence in the program. And that is why the tough border protection policies that we've taken uh, and the tough border protection policies that we've put in place have been so important. Now, the member for Scullin is wrong to say that this matter is unresolved. I mean, the, for people who are genuine refugees, um, there is the option, if they wish to do so, um, to be repatriated to their home country or to go to the United States. And so far, we have resettled over 870 people in the United States. But the, the benefit of this, the benefit of our policies, is that we've stopped the criminal gangs, we've stopped the people smuggling gangs, which are looking at what Australia is doing every single day and um, looking for any signals that we might restart 
the particular proposal again. On Nauru and Manus in particular, it's important to remind people that every child has now been removed from Nauru, and of the remaining adults on Nauru or Papua New Guinea, none are in detention. They all live in the local community, and the overwhelming majority are single males. Over 140 of them have been found not to be refugees. As I said, the government is happy to help, uh, including booking and paying for their return travel if they wish to voluntarily return to their country of origin. On the New Zealand offer, the government appreciates this offer, but remains focused on completing the United States resettlement arrangement. As I say, this has been a positive uh, arrangement with 870 refugees res resettled and further departures expected in the coming weeks and months. We're committed to ensuring that people smugglers cannot exploit any resettlement arrangement to market illegal maritime arrivals and illegal maritime ventures and try to bring people in through the back door of New Zealand. Any potential resettlement arrangement must not undermine our ongoing efforts to combat people smuggling. This has been absolutely vital in terms of restoring the reputation of Australia's migration program both here and abroad. And I commend the government's program, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Uringa. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, I can only say the member for Barara has done this same old thing, trotted out the political games, blamed the other side, but ignore the very real issue. Seven years in detention. You should, all members that condone that should be ashamed of themselves. I thank the member for Scullin for bringing forward this motion. Like many others in this place, I received the petition referenced in the motion, signed by over 65,000 people, calling on the Prime Minister to accept the New Zealand offer and to resettle the remaining refugees. Currently, there are 290 people remaining in Papua New Guinea and on Manus Island. There is an offer from New Zealand to take up to 150 asylum seekers from PNG and Manus, and that offer per year, and that offer has been on foot for seven years. This could have all been dealt with by now. There would be no refugees left in PNG or Manus had we taken up the offer back in 2013 when it was first made. So with due respect for the member for Barawa, that what he just said to the House is just an insult to proper management of people that are in distress and being held without proper process. We're keeping refugees in indefinite detention without hope of release or knowledge of where they will ever call home. They've suffered immensely. They're separated from their families and loved ones. They've been left without hope for seven years and are destitute physically and emotionally. I was proud to represent Australia on numerous occasions on the world, world scene, but I'm definitely not proud of this. Craig Foster is not proud of this, nor is Sonny Bill Williams and many others. There are stories and videos on the gameover.org.au website, and I'd urge you all to go and watch them. Listen to Adam's story, Samad's story, Moz's story. Then tell me again why you think these people should be kept in indefinite detention. Mohammed is a former farmer from Sudan. He hasn't seen his two young daughters for seven years. One of them he's never met. She was born after. He worries about them every minute of every day. While locked up on Manus, his wife was murdered. He found out on a short weekly call when he was allowed to make and he has to live with that reality for years. He's been stranded on Port Moresby. He's tired, sick beyond his endurance. He just wants his freedom so he can rebuild his life. And his is just one of many stories collected by the Game Over campaign, being championed by Craig Foster, Sonny Bill Williams, Amnesty International, and many others. We all need to call time on the seven years of detention these refugees have suffered and demand the government finally accept the offer on the table from New Zealand. It is absolute rubbish to stand in this place and justify this ongoing cruel policy. Offshore detention and management of facilities is costing Australian taxpayers over a billion dollars a year. I would urge the Morrison government to consider how that money could much better be spent in actually standing up for some humanitarian uh, conduct and actually taking proper care of what needs to be done at home. Last, mo last month, I spoke on the, this issue with the Nagami Peace and Justice Group, who I met with, and I reiterated their calls for more funding for the Status Resolution Support Services. Another group I recently met with was the On Arrival Detainee Support Group. 
They're highlighting the plight of refugees in alternative places of detention. They were brought to Australia under Medivac legislation, and we know how well that's working out for them. They've raised their concerns around an inability for people to be referred for specialist health treatment. One of those is Moz, a Kurdish refugee who escaped his home after a siege. He's a talented musician who has inspired many others through his songwriting. He dreams of a life filled with music. He spent seven years in Papua New Guinea with severe asthma until he was medevaced at the end of 2019. But instead of getting the treatment he requires, Moz remains trapped in a hotel, unable to leave with no knowledge of what's next. So with due respect to government members, and I would say both sides of this chamber, both parties have, have condoned policies that have been incredibly inhumane on legitimate refugees. Whilst we take a completely perverse approach to these refugee people seeking asylum, we have an influx of people coming in through the airlines and coming by other means. It's time we call time on this policy. These people deserve to be resettled, accept the New Zealand offer and get on it. Call game over. I thank the member. There being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The Federation Chamber will now suspend until 4pm. Thanks, colleagues. And uh, the time being 4 p.m., I ask if there are any statements by honourable members, and I give the call to the member for Melbourne. When I hear from this Liberal government that they want to reform Australia's workplace laws, alarm bells start ringing because this is a government that has shown us time and time again that they're more interested in looking after their millionaire mates than the millions of unemployed. Right now, as we hit hard by the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, the share of business profit of income is at its highest in 60 years, and the share of workers' wages are at their lowest. People are working harder, but wages growth is flatlining, and too many people, especially young people, aren't getting the hours of work they want and need to live a decent life. This government's proposed plans to reform our workplace laws look likely to leave millions of workers behind and entrench low-paid and insecure work. The government's unambitious employment target of 6 per cent shows they are content with leaving 2 million people either without work or without enough work. Working people are under attack and have less certainty and rights at work than ever before, while insecure work is spreading the coronavirus. And meanwhile, corporations are exploiting loopholes and making their profits by underpaying workers. And as someone who's spent several years representing low-paid workers before getting elected to this parliament, I know the damage done by insecure work. The Greens will be fighting tooth and nail against the government's proposed changes. We need to make sure everyone has a job if they want one, as well as a living wage, while we tackle job insecurity and restore workers' basic rights. Thank you. I give the call to the member for North Sydney. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On the weekend, I had the great pleasure of attending a very important milestone in the history of the New South Wales Liberal Party, and that was the 75th anniversary of the New South Wales Young Liberal Movement. It's an organisation that is a former federal and state president of the division that is very close to my heart. And I have to say that the history of the New South Wales Young Liberal Movement is one of both great political activism and it has always been the conscious conscience of the Liberal Party in New South Wales. But it's also been an incredible incubator for talent in the Liberal Party. And I'm proud of the fact that, in fact, the very first elected president of the New South Wales Young Liberals was one John Howard. It's all gone downhill since then. But nonetheless, he was our finest prime minister in my lifetime. Uh, since then, he's been joined by people in parliament, including uh, in the current parliament, the member for McKellar, the member for Mitchell and our foreign minister. And in the New South Wales parliament, people like our premier, uh, the Honourable Don Harwin, the Honourable Andrew Constance, 
and members like Shane Mallard, Catherine Cusack, Scott Fallow and Natasha McLaren-Jones. They follow in a fine tradition of leadership, including people like uh, Philip Ruddock, John Brogdon and, of course, I mentioned our former Prime Minister, John Howard. I want to congratulate the outgoing President, Chenegg Torres, and the incoming President, Hugo Robinson, who I know will do an outstanding job. I encourage anyone interested in politics to get involved in the youth movements of political parties and hopefully make the right decision and join the Young Liberals. Thank you. I give the call to member for Kingsford Smith. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Last week I was privileged to visit Benet Brith in Kensington in my electorate um, and meet with some of their fantastic volunteers to hear about their Courage for Care program. Courage for Care is an outreach program uh, by B'nai B'rith, the world's oldest Jewish service organisation, and it aims to inform Australians of the dangers and prejudice of discrimination. Since 1999, Courage to Care in New South Wales has run a travelling educational exhibition inspired by the many stories of rescue and courage displayed by non-Jews who saved or helped Jews during the Holocaust. A unique feature of all Courage to Care programs is a session with a living historian, a survivor from the Holocaust, who shares their positive story of their rescue and survival and who explains the support he or she was given by others. And I was fortunate to meet with Ernie Friedlander, who told of how he and his mother escaped the concentration camps due to the humanity of a German soldier and was the only, they were the only two to survive in their family. The program celebrates the people who had the courage to care, ordinary people whose acts were extraordinary in bravery and impact. Courage to Care in New South Wales is run by a team of nearly 100 volunteers and with the help of the Kingsford Smith Volunteers Grant, they've been able to support the teaching of more anti-discrimination programs in our community. I'd like to thank and congratulate all of the volunteers from Courage to Care who help individuals and people in our community stand up to prejudice. Thank you. I give the call to Member for Longman. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Today, I want to give a shout out to the amazing work of the Rural Fire Service volunteers, in particular, those of my electorate of Longman. I recently attended the 30th anniversary celebration and open day for the Roxburgh Marina Rural Fire Station, which was very well attended and well supported by the local community. A significant part of my electorate is classes rural, and we are blessed to have 381 RFS volunteers across nine stations in Longman. Volunteers in the Roxburgh Marina, Wamuran, Torbal, Delaney's Creek, Mount Mee, Stanmore, Stony Creek, Narangbar and Palmerstone all do great work in their communities. They help raise awareness about what to do when fire strikes and can be called into action when needed. If any Australians, particularly are those living in rural, semi-rural or urban fringe areas, needed a reminder to get fire prepared, they need only look to the fires raging right now on Fraser Island and elsewhere. The RFS has many online resources that can help residents prepare for the worst of the bushfire season. It's also important to note that the RFS is an organisation that relies, relies heavily on volunteers. In fact, there are about 35,000 RFS volunteers across Australia in a whole range of different roles. RFS volunteers receive training that may one day help save a person's life or a family's home. If anyone out there wants to lend a hand, I know they will be welcomed with open arms. Thank you. I give the call to member from Maribyrnong. I wish to raise an important matter to Greek Australians in Victoria and Greek Australians in my electorate. The Greek diaspora's contribution to Australia is long and it's proud. From the time of the waves of immigration, especially, uh, but not limited to after the Second World War, uh, the suburbs of Melbourne and indeed the communities of Australia were very fortunate that so many Greeks chose Australia as their home. But it is so terribly important that young Greek Australians don't lose touch with the culture of their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. So it is with much sadness I learnt that La Trobe University is uh, terminating its modern Greek language program. It is the only tertiary institution in, a, in Victoria providing uh, modern Greek language teaching. Modern Greek should be part of our secondary school curriculum, but in fact, uh, what will be the point of that if, they can't, if students can't take their study of modern Greek to university level? This is a great uh, cultural loss. It's a great loss of contribution of the diaspora and it's a great loss of the Australian Greek story. This is part, I think, also of a bigger trend where universities are not being properly funded for the humanities. We're seeing the cost of arts degrees going up yep. and we're seeing uh, pressure on languages. What we don't want to see is the death of language teaching in our universities and higher education. 
I call upon La Trobe University to change course straight away, and we will not give up fighting for modern Greek language teaching La Trobe and in Victoria. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Goldstone. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I know Australians would be disgusted at the gutter tweet from the Chinese Communist Party today targeting the Australian Defence Forces. The fake images misrepresents a soldier murdering a child. The Chinese Communist Party's tweet was rightly being described by the Prime Minister as repugnant. It is shameful, and they should be ashamed of this post. It is welcome to know this condemnation is bipartisan, with similar sentiments expressed by the Leader of the Opposition. That the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr Li Jianzhao, removes any ambiguity that it was the indulgence of a rogue official by tweeting it from his account. The Australian government and the, Australian, and the Chinese Communist Party may not always see eye to eye on important issues, but even in the most heated disagreements, there is no proximity in parallel. Normally in our disagreement, we are respectful to ensure that anything we say avoids China losing face. Today, the Chinese Communist Party removed it from its cells. Thank you. I give the call to member for McNamara. Thank you, Acting Speaker. And last Saturday, I joined with locals at the St Paul's, St Paul's Cathedral in Melbourne outside to mark what was then 800 days that Kylie Moore Gilbert had been held in Iran. And outside the St Paul's Cathedral in Melbourne were, were 800 butterflies of, filled with well wishes and of people in Australia thinking of Kylie and of sending their best to Kylie in um, Evan Prison in Iran. And it was pretty amazing news to, to hear that Kylie was then freed. And I would note the member for Wentworth who sent remarks. Obviously, it was in Melbourne. He couldn't be there. And Senator Rice, who also joined us on the day. But I guess my message today is that despite those 800 days, Kylie should know that her friends and family did not forget her at any point. And Many of them were knocking on our doors and were seeking us to do more to have Kylie freed, and they were pushing for Australia to do more to um, have Kylie Moore Gilbert freed. And I guess tonight, or today, I would say thank you to everyone who was involved, um, from the government and from the department, to help free Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert. It is a wonderful thing that she's home. We, we never ever believed that she was there for a good reason and we're very pleased that she's now free in Australia where she belongs. Thank you. I give the call to Member for O'Connor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Esperance is a tight-knit coastal town and their sense of community and service is second to none. Given their isolation, the Royal Flying Doctor Service is greatly appreciated by the Esperance community and several groups fundraise year-round to help keep the doctor flying. One of, the, one of those groups is the Royal Flying Doctor Service Woodchoppers. At the invitation of Steve Smith, I recently visited the woodchoppers to see firsthand this impressive initiative. I was warmly greeted by their president, Neil Livingston, who gave me a tour of their setup. Their woodyard is co-located on the property of M. McD Contracting, and the woodchoppers are supported by many other local businesses. On Monday and Wednesday mornings, you'll find a group of 28 retired choppers, along with a couple of shift workers, running three wood splitters, several chainsaws and a mobile saw bench. Together, the team donate their considerable talents and time to this worthy cause. I was blown away to hear that so far this year, the sale of their firewood has resulted in over $85,000 in donations to the Royal Flying Doctor Service. It was great to chat to Neil, David Ovens and Steve Bull about the importance of the Royal Flying Doctor Service to their community. I understand there is also a social aspect to the group, with the woodchoppers rewarded for their hard work with a beer and a barbecue after each shift. What a fantastic initiative, raising funds for the Royal Flying Doctor Service while fostering connection between their members and also the local community. I commend the Esperance RFDS woodchoppers for their service and thank them for their part in keeping the doctor flying. Thank you. Who is seeking the call? Member for Oxley? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yesterday was the completion of a month-long T20 cricket tournament, and I was invited by local community leader Satay Yelisetti to join the Springfield Lions Cricket Club. It was the club's first time in holding the final tournament awards event, and it was fantastic to see members from all parts of Springfield and the surrounding suburbs who come from a variety of backgrounds, cultures and communities over a common love of cricket. Sporting clubs and groups work hard to promote community, a place of belonging and a great environment for those who have shared an, an interest. There are over 70 sporting clubs in the Oxley electorate, and they are certainly growing. 
It's been an incredibly tough year for sport and recreational clubs around the country have been unable to meet or even at times were not able to play contact sport during the COVID-19 restrictions. Club managers, coaches, parents, presidents have all done a fantastic job in keeping up the sense of community connection and involvement throughout the pandemic and have still managed to find innovative ways to increase community involvement and stay connected. I want to congratulate all of the volunteers who've worked so hard during the pandemic to keep community sport, including kids sport, alive. I look forward to seeing all that is ahead for the new Springfield Lions Cricket Club, a new club in my electorate who are there helping to create fantastic opportunities for our community to come together. And I put on record my thanks to everyone for helping put together a wonderful event and I look forward to sharing many more in the year ahead. Thank you. I give the call to member for Robertson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Upgrades to the Terrigal Trojans Clubhouse have now been completed. The project was partly funded by a $275,000 grant through the National Stronger Regions Fund and was refurbished with the help of a whole group of volunteers, business owners and local tradespeople. Improvements include a separate function room, a new separate function room, an outdoor terrace, a new eating area, two new bars and kitchen. I've got no doubt that this popular facility will bring even more opportunities to our region, not only for sport, but also for functions and community events right in the heart of Terrigal. And I recently joined some of the club's talented players and executives to hear about what this meant for amateur sports on the Central Coast. The captain of the first grade team, Sam Kenny, said that the new clubhouse had created a real sense of community and it will help attract even more young players. He said it was great to have space for club memorabilia, memorabilia to showcase the many fantastic achievements of fellow teammates. John Stevens, president of the Trojans Rugby Club, said that the upgrade was possible with the dedication of club members and local supporters, that local businesses work free of charge or at heavily discounted rates to help transform the building, providing services and materials like roof sheeting, gyp rocking and structural beams. And he put it perfectly when he said that the clubhouse was built by the community for the community. So to, to John Stevens, to the Terrigal Tro Trojans Rugby Club and everyone involved in creating this fantastic facility for our community to gather, enjoy and call their own, I say thank you. Thanks. I give the call to the member for Fennel. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. According to the Energy Minister, the Morrison government has strong targets, clear plans and an enviable track record on reducing emissions. Well, some might take that at face value, but coming from the minister that brought us Grassgate, Watergate and Clovergate, I thought I'd see what some experts have to say. The New Climate Institute, they ranked Australia dead last out of 57 countries for climate policy. The Climate Action Tracker, they say Australia's climate policies are insufficient to meet the, the agreements we signed up to in Paris. Deloitte find that climate inaction will cost Australia $3 trillion and nearly 1 million jobs. The Investor Group on Climate Change estimates that three quarters of Australia's trade is with countries that are pledged to reach net zero by mid-century, which we are not. The Climate Transparency Report ranked Australia in the bottom bracket in every climate policy area but one, finding Australia had one of the highest shares of fossil fuel use per capita emissions three times the G20 average and ranked highly for vulnerability to climate risk. The Coalition Government has had 22 energy policies in the last eight years. And this hopeless, hapless minister has no policies that will reduce emissions or power prices and deal with the catastrophic risk that faces Australia more than any other advanced nation. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Mali. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The closure of Australia's international border has amplified pre-existing workforce challenges in the horticultural industry in my electorate of Mali. The industry faces a shortfall of thousands of workers until international labour can once again be employed. Although worsened by COVID-19, these challenges are not new. The industry is heavily reliant on overseas workers because low-skilled, semi-skilled and skilled labour supplies have always been a challenge for our region and our industries. Last week, I convened a webinar for horticultural producers and contractors in my electorate to discuss current visa options and the horticultural industry labour. The webinar was joined by representatives from the Department of Home Affairs. Those present have decades' worth of experience in horticulture and associated labour hire industries. There was clear frustration and expressed confusion with current visa processes. 
Nathan Falvo suggested that decentralising the department responsible could be worth considering. I agreed. As part of the agenda of decentralisation, I am eager to establish a home affairs hub in Mildura. Why not? To service the complex workforce needs of business in the region and to support the many thousands of migrant workers that come to our work on our farms. A home affairs hub would be an important step toward improving a government mechanism to manage workforce shortages and red tape complexities. Yesterday afternoon I had the pleasure of attending a ceremony hosted by Maruka's Clifton Hill Scout Group alongside uh, Minister Mark Bailey. It was a warm afternoon, but the local scouting movement had plenty of excitement and pride over what was to take place, where Ventura Scout Georgia Thomas was being presented with the Queen's Scout Award. Yeah. This is the highest youth ach award achievement in the scouting movement in the Commonwealth. It has four main areas, which include leadership development, personal growth, outdoor activities and community involvement. Georgia joined the scout movement as a joey when she was six years old. Her two brothers are also scouts and both spoke yesterday. It's taken Georgia two years to complete the work needed for this award, and she was very gracious when accepting this honour. While the, the Queen Scout Award is an individual award, Georgia very generously attributed her success to the Clifton Hill Scout Group. She talked of the support and friendship she's gained over her years as a scout and how the scouts helped her overcome her shyness and develop leadership skills and teamwork and confidence uh, to lead Georgia to be able to speak to audiences. Becoming a Queen Scout is no mean feat. Georgia has also just managed to complete her last year of high school last week in a most difficult year. In fact, she was taught by my good friend John Carrozza, who Georgia spoke very highly of. She's, Georgia is the eighth Clifton Hill Venturer Scout to receive a Queen Scout Award in the last three years. So it shows that the leaders at Clifton Hill Scout Group are doing great work. Congratulations, Georgia. Thank you. Give the call member for Fisher. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to say that on the Sunshine Coast we are welcoming a growing, vibrant and successful community of new migrants. Today we're seeing new residents from an ever broader and more diverse range of countries and cultures. I've recently had the pleasure of meeting more of these new migrants through a series of morning teas organised in conjunction with Stella Ramagnoli, Caloundra Community Centre's terrific multicultural worker. I've sat down with the coast's newest residents now at two events at the community centre in Beringa and one in Caloundra. And we've had some robust and useful discussions about issues faced by new migrants and their ambitions for the future. Already, Stella is helping to create an emerging migrant welcome centre group to build on this momentum. I also recently had the honour of joining Arvind Pandit and Dr Vaz Srinivasan and many of our sorry Vaz, and many of our local Indian residents for their Festival of Lights Diwali celebration. I learned a lot about this ancient celebration and was warmly welcomed by what is one of the coast's fastest growing and thriving new communities. On behalf of all Fisher residents, I welcome all of our new migrants to the Sunshine Coast and wish them all the best for their new future as part of our community. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Scullin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I've often spoken in this place about my concern about loneliness, which is a crisis that affects too many Australians. It's been a particularly acute crisis through the pandemic. Before we'd even heard of COVID, one in four Australians reported feeling lonely some or all the time. And we know this isn't just something that's of vague concern. It has very significant health consequences as well as life course consequences as well. It damages communities as well as individual lives. I was shocked, but sadly not surprised by research indicating that this has doubled over the course of the lockdown experience that has characterised the pandemic for so many Australians. I found this out when I had the great honour to launch Australia's first white paper on loneliness, produced by the Ending Loneliness Together uh, Coalition last week. This is a shocking statistic, but one of many. It shows us how much work we have to do to better understand how loneliness impacts Australians and the great diversity that is modern Australia. It shows us that we have so much work to do to build an evidence base to allow us to put public policies in place that will target effectively loneliness. And it shows us that we've got more to do in terms of listening and respecting experiences of loneliness treating them with the seriousness they deserve, 
Loneliness is a killer. Thank you. And I give the call to the um, member for uh, Bonner. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Last week I was pleased to host a special barbecue to congratulate Bonner's local legends, the people in our community who were nominated for their selfless acts of kindness during a difficult 2020. While this year has been a trying one for us all, it has brought out the best in our community. So to recognise that, earlier this year I put the call out for the community to nominate those who went above and beyond to support others for a local Bonner Legend Award. As a result, we received some heartwarming nominations and last Monday we celebrated these incredible people and learned more about what motivated them to be so kind, caring and compassionate to others. Amongst them were neighbours, volunteers and members of our everyday community who just didn't know how their actions made such a difference to the lives of others. This included Brisbane Coast Guard, who keep our boaties safe on Moreton Bay, and Darling Point Special School's Coral Brenner, who runs the before and after school program. I'd like to recognise all of our local legends who make Bonner great, including a friendly, caring neighbour, Rebecca Barlett, Malkovat Hawks President, Mark Britton, disability support worker, Keone Driscoll, Belmont State School Pr Principal Lisa Morrison and Care Kits for Kids President Christine Rafter, Dance Studio Instructor Michelle Thompson and Wildlife Australia Volunteer and Carer Nicole Blums. These are the people in our community nominated by our community for their amazing work that they do. Thank you. Yeah. The yeah. Member for yeah. being. Thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker. Throughout this year, we've repeatedly heard the term essential workers. Today I would like to add my congratulations to a Bean constituent who is firmly in that category, communicating life-saving information to members of our community. Amanda Delegsi was one of the finalists in the ACT's 2020 Local Hero, a category within the Australian of the Year Awards for her work as an Auslan interpreter. This recognition demonstrates the depth and commitment of Amanda's work in her field. She is the ACT's only fully certified Auslan interpreter and began her Auslan journey, er, journey early as a result of having a deaf childhood friend. The past year has been fraught with disasters, with bushfires and a global pandemic. Through, throughout it all, Amanda has stood next to local and national government officials and ministers, ensuring that all citizens of the ACT and more broadly receive the vital and life-saving information that is being broadcast. She's a champion for those who speak Auslan and she's passionate about ensuring that they receive the exact same message that the hearing community receives. At our morning tea with Amanda, she spoke candidly about the fact that there's a shortage of qualified Auslan interpreters and not enough support for training or career paths despite the need across emergency services and for fair access to our health and justice systems. Governments at all levels need to do more for all our interpreting services. Congratulations again, Amanda. Again, Amanda, you're an amazing constituent of Bean. Thank you. And I give the call to the member for Braddon. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. On Friday, I visited Montello Primary School. Ms Howard and Mr Langford's Grade 5 classes are studying government and democracy. And they're also starting to think about what jobs they might look to do when they leave school. Let me tell you, you couldn't find a bunch of more enthusiastic, smart and fun kids than these Grade 5s at Montello Primary School. We started the session by looking at the role of media in my office. The students showed us that they already had an outstanding writing, outstanding writing skills and social media skills and they developed a Facebook post and joint media release about our visit. I then had a chat to them about what I do as a federal representative in Braddon. We talked about how parliament works and how different tiers of government work and how it's important for them as kids. Deputy Speaker, Montello Primary School has done a great job nurturing these young people. I know that sitting in the classrooms are our region's future leaders, maybe even the nature's future leaders. I want to remind students that when it comes to jobs, the sky's the limit. You can do and achieve whatever you are prepared to work hard to do so. Thank you, Ms Howard, Mr Langford, and all the great kids for making me so welcome at your school at Montello Primary School. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Parramatta. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Last Wednesday, a purple bench appeared on the veranda outside the Harris Park Community Centre. It's part of the Purple Bench Project, part of an international project of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. 
The project honours the memory of people murdered by their partner or family by creating awareness and starting a conversation about the issue of domestic violence in Australia. The bench will feature at the front of the community centre with information flyers, and a second bench will be appear in various parts of Parramatta, in restaurants and retail outlets, to remind us that at least one woman every week is murdered by a family uh, or partner um, in Australia each year. One a week. I'd like to acknowledge the, the large number of people that were involved in this project. Stella Zickpe, who painted the Western, uh, from the Western Sydney University Social Work student, painted the benches and did a great job. It really is an amazing um, colour. The Harris Park Community Centre Manager uh, and White Ribbon Ambassador Patrick Suse, who says he wants to shine a light on domestic violence, particularly dowry abuse, and has been behind this project from the start. The founder of the Indian Crisis and Support Agency and dowry abuse advocate Kitu Randawa has been working alongside the community on their upcoming projects. And finally, Nikhil Seth, who helped create the program and is working on a range of new ones. Well done, Harris Park Community Centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, and I give the call to the member for Herbert. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Last Saturday, I have the privilege of being invited to Calvary Christian Church's Movember Men's Breakfast. It was fantastic to see men's mental health issues front and centre on the agenda. This event consisted of a slow-cooked barbecue breakfast and gave me a chance to have a chat with other blokes. As you can tell, Deputy Speaker, I think I overindulged. Uh, but it also featured a panel of people who endured their own mental health challenges. It was an honour to join celebrity chef Matt Golonsky, uh, who tragically lost his wife and three daughters in a house fire, and former Cowboys winger Antonio Winterstein, who also ha who has had his own challenges. These men have had first-hand experience of what it's like to feel the low and need some extra support, but also reached out to get the help they needed to come out the other side. It was great to hear their stories. They also shared with the group the need to keep up their mental health fitness and continue to look after themselves as they carry on with their careers. It was a great morning and an excellent reminder for blokes not to bottle things up, but to speak up and speak out. And more and more men are realising it's okay not to be okay. And by talking about mental illness and the importance of mental health, we can go a long way in preventing long-term problems. I know this event will have started a long and important conversations and I look forward to supporting this, uh, this event next year. Thank you. And I give the call to Member for Solomon. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. I'm very proud that the Northern Territory is now open to everyone. All Australians can come to the NT uh, without the need to quarantine. And I'm so proud of the role that Darwin has played this year in serving as a national hub of repatriation processing and onboarding in our gravest health crisis in living memory. We played a major role from the outset of this crisis by repatriating Australians from Wuhan in China to Howard Springs in Darwin, and then the Territory stepped up again by wel welcoming 180 Australians off the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship. I'm proud of our role now in receiving Qantas repatriation flights from India, the UK, Singapore, France and Germany to start flying all those Australians that are stranded overseas home. The planes land in Darwin and passengers spend two weeks at the Howard Springs uh, quarantine facility. Now this facility is maintained by the NT government and is vital to our national interests. It would be great if we could do even more for this effort. Now the federal government should support the territory if it wants to increase our burden sharing capacity in future crisis. Uh, well done to the Northern Territory Government and uh, we stand ready to help the nation in the future. Thank you. And I give the call to Member for Sturt. Thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. Well, it's been a big two weeks in my home state of South Australia since we last met here in Canberra, obviously. Um, about, around about 10 days ago, 11 days ago, uh, we had some concerning developments regarding a coronavirus outbreak in South Australia and we made the decision uh, last Wednesday, uh, the state government made the decision to put uh, the whole state into a form of very significant lockdown, uh, which we thought might last six days and involved all of us needing to stay at home, in our homes with our loved ones and uh, do our best to stomp on that outbreak as quickly as possible. Now, thankfully, uh, it only lasted three days and some developments meant that the restrictions could be lifted. But I want to thank 
everyone in my electorate, my community, all the people of Adelaide, all the people of South Australia, we really came together and understood the need to take urgent and significant action early, because if you act early on these things, you can avoid longer term, much more significant impacts, not just from a health point of view, but also from an economic point of view. So um, I thank my community. Unfortunately, we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, there are still some uh, examples of the virus um, being contracted by close contacts of those in the cluster, but the health experts have got that under control and they've got a lot of people in quarantine that are at risk of uh, being infected. Uh, we've come together as a community in South Australia. Uh, it was a difficult, uh, what ended up being just a few days, uh, but it was very worthwhile given the outcome that we've had. Thank you, and I give the call to them for the quarry. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Year seven students at Bede Polding College in South Windsor have overcome one of the most challenging years in their school careers, and they're helping others in need. Their first year at high school hasn't been anything like what they would have expected, but these inspiring kids have still been able to focus on social justice, helped by a visit from Zoe Grant of the Jesuit Refugee Service. They've been so motivated by what they learned that they've organised a food drive to help refugees and asylum seekers. In an email to me, Chelsea Privatera, on behalf of her fellow, fellow students, told me, we're doing this because year sevens feel sympathy towards the less fortunate, and we knew we needed to step up and do something. They believed it's important because for refugees and asylum seekers in Western Sydney, the heat, weather and the COVID-19 pandemic have inevitably taken a toll on their already stressful and hard lives, Chelsea wrote. The students are bundling food and toiletry items into packages to be distributed by the Jesuit refugee services. These kids have risen to the challenge and overcome their own problems and are giving others a helping hand. Bede encourages students to strive to, uh, for excellence and to equip themselves with the skills and passion to make a difference in the community, and that's what these kids are doing. I'd like to congratulate them for not only raising awareness of the struggles that refugees and asylum seekers face, but for taking practical steps to help. Congratulations, Year 7. Thank you, and I give the call to the member for Ryan. Thank you very much. Over the weekend, I attended the Gap Community Christmas Fair, and it was fantastic to see local residents out and supporting local small businesses and community organisations. Everything was made locally, from handmade jewellery by Junction 44, a local business in The Gap, to freshly made cinnamon donuts from the Ashgrove The Gap Lions Club, which my son Theo enjoyed immensely. In the lead up to Christmas, it is very easy to get swept up in the online deals and the department store sales, but this year we can make a difference to local businesses and in turn local jobs. Small businesses in my electorate and across Australia have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic and we must support them this Christmas. I am starting a Christmas in Ryan campaign in my electorate to encourage my constituents to buy their Christmas gifts from local businesses and retailers. Each day in December, I will be highlighting a local business in Ryan and encouraging others to do the same to support them. Day one will start with Tickled Pink Designs, the local business that creates beautiful handmade newborn and toddler clothing and accessories. Natalie from Orkin Flower runs an online store and also sets up at local markets around Brisbane. My four-month-old baby girl, Izzy, is a big fan of, of her clothes. If you are looking at gifting baby clothes this Christmas, please check out Tickled Pink Designs and support local. But it's more than that. Support local venues if you're going to have a Christmas party. Support local vendors. So the message for all of us is to get behind our local businesses this Christmas, yeah. to give them the boost that they need this festive season. Thank you. Give the call to the member for Karanga, mate. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I stand today to call on the City of Greater Geelong and its councillors to listen to residents of Kerr Lewis, who are expressing grave safety concerns about a recently built local road, Divoli Drive. This is a long, straight, undulating road with several blind spots. Large trucks travel both ways to get to new developments. Horns are blasted as cars must pull over because the road is too narrow to cope with parked vehicles. It's noisy, it's dangerous, and something needs to be done now. Many constituents have reached out to me and labelled the road as a dangerous horror. I've written to local councillors and the CEO requesting action. One of my constituents, Mer Finger, said the increased traffic, incessant noise and lack of safety has become a nightmare for residents. I urge the council to listen to these residents and resolve this serious safety issue as soon as possible. I do acknowledge the City of Greater Geelong has reduced the speed to 50 kilometres an hour, and speed humps are set to be built in December. 
But this is plainly not enough. My constituents say this is an accident waiting to happen. But the city says the road will not be widened for another five years. Five years! This is unacceptable. The current plan is unacceptable. The community cannot wait any longer, and many are selling up. I will continue to stand with local residents and urge the council to take immediate action. Thank you. I give the call to member for Wentworth. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, members would be aware that uh, Dr Kylie Moore Gilbert, who had been imprisoned in Iran now for over 800 days was released from Iran in custody last week and yeah. returned to Australia. And I wanted to commend at this point um, the personal courage and strength and resilience shown by Dr. Moore Gilbert, who's had to undergo an ordeal that none of us uh, could ever imagine or could ever foresee, and also her family, who has um, suffered largely in silence and uh, maintained their hope and their vigil for her fate in silence. I also wanted to thank um, the Prime Minister the Foreign Minister and the many officials uh, throughout the Australian Government who have been involved in these negotiations uh, now for, for two years. And uh, Kylie's friends and colleagues and um, students and pupils who organised themselves in the Free Kylie Moore Gilbert campaign and other venues to highlight her cause. And it was important, I think, for Kylie to know that she was never forgotten throughout her time over in Iran. But Though we are relieved at her release, we should remember exactly what's gone on here. This is an Australian academic who was visiting Iran at the invitation of an Iranian university to undergo studies. She was detained, she was uh, imprisoned, she was tried in secret on evidence uh, that we never got to see uh, within effective and improper legal counsel. Um, she was never given a fair go. Uh, she should never have been held. She should never have been held there for one day, never mind 800 days. And this sort of practice from Iran of arbitrary detention and arrest of foreign nationals and hostage taking simply has to stop. Thank you. Thank you. And I give the call to member for Fremantle. Deputy Speaker, it's, it's 25 days until Christmas. It's been a very difficult year and people around Australia will be looking forward to being with friends and family and sharing those rituals that connect us to one another, a meal, a hug, uh, maybe even a song. Those 25 days will go quickly and we hope that they go well. But on Christmas Island, the family of Priya and Nardis and their two daughters have just marked 1,000 days since they were taken from their community in Queensland and consigned to a bizarre form of isolated incarceration. Meanwhile, on Manus Island and in various motels here in Australia, there are asylum seekers who are entering their seventh year without liberty, their seventh year without certainty about their future. Needless to say, they are unwell because they've been subject to circumstances that produce hopelessness, anxiety, self-harm and worse. Men like Amin Afravi, with whom I spoke via, uh, uh, by the telephone the other day, that they only want a future. They want an end to the punishing limbo which costs taxpayers something like $350,000 for each person each year. Deputy Speaker, it doesn't have to be like that. The government can accept the opportunity to resettle asylum seekers in New Zealand. It can choose to allow Priya and Nardes and their children to come home to Biloela. I ask them to do that. It doesn't need to be a Christmas miracle at the end of a dark year. It could simply be an act of grace, a gesture of common sense and of compassion. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Craig. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It comes as a, as a fairly cruel blow, I must say, the announcement by China to uh, put 100 to 200 per cent tariffs on Australian wine. Um, South Australia will be uh, badly hit by, th by this outcome, um, given that uh, we are the biggest wine producing state uh, in Australia and the home of many of the premium brands uh, which have been finding their way into China on the back of a free trade agreement. Um, the fact that they have said that um, Australians are dumping wine there is uh, beyond ludicrous, quite frankly. Uh, we can't produce wine all that cheaply in Australia. We don't have that kind of low-cost economy. And in fact, the product that has been finding its way into China of recent times has been the higher end of the market. There's no cheap giveaways there. Uh, there's no great subsidies for agriculture in Australia. Uh, so uh, it, it appears clear now that given uh, their actions in other areas, um, that there is more to this uh, than meets the eye in the terms of trade. And now, I've been very careful uh, not to try and stir up any kind of antagonism. Uh, that we say we take one thing at a time and we deal with the issues individually. But there's certainly a, 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 a large back, back bank now, if you like, uh, of actions they are taking across timber, uh, um, coal, um, uh, barley, uh, and now, of course, uh, wine, uh, that would indicate there are 
other uh, drivers in this particular uh, outcome, and, I, and I, it's deeply Thank regretful. You, Spider, call to the member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, it's no stretch to say this year we have a renewed appreciation for the wonderful work volunteers do in our community. So today I rise to congratulate local volunteer with the Rural Fire Service, Wendy Roberts, for her 58 years of service and dedication to the people of the New South Wales South Coast. Wendy is a true pillar of our community. Not only has she been with her local Errol Bay Brigade, now amalgamated into the Crossroads Brigade, for more than half a century, she has also spent 38 years with the Jervis Bay Lions Club, as well as dedicating herself to the local girl guides, camp quality and Meals on Wheels. She has spent time helping and supporting others because that's what she loves to do. She is an inspiration to us all and deserves our recognition and praise. That's why I was so thrilled to see Wendy named Rotary's National Emergency Services Community Volunteer winner recently. It was definitely a tough pull with so many amazing volunteers who have stepped up this year to support our community. But I was proud to see Wendy receive this recognition for her tremendous years of service to the South Coast community. Thank you, Wendy, for everything you have done to help and support others. Volunteers like you make our community a better place, and there has never been a better place than the South Coast. Well done also to all our amazing volunteers who were nominated for this award. You are all stars this year. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Ford. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to one of the great but humble elders of our community in Logan, Auntie Eileen Williams, who sadly passed away on the 27th of September 2020. Auntie Eileen was a Yugambeh elder, traditional owner and a descendant of Bill and Bill, also known as the King of Logan. She grew up in and around Mount Cravat and Holland Park with her two sisters, Robin and Loris, and three brothers. We are lucky, Madam Deputy Speaker, to have a record of Auntie Eileen's life shared through our Aunties and Uncles Digital Stories Project that Logan City Council conducted a few years ago. But the most important aspect of Auntie Eileen's life was that it was devoted to serving our community. And in particular, Madam Deputy Speaker, seeking to make a life or life better for women and children in our community, particularly our Indigenous women and children. Auntie Eileen's father was from Bow Desert. He was a Mullinjali man, and her mother grew up in Shilberg under the Aboriginal Protection Act. Family was particularly important to Auntie Eileen, and with her sister Robin, they also, and I, I checked this on the transcript of uh, the project, they refer, referred to themselves as the Black Brady Bunch. Auntie Eileen spoke Yugambeh language and taught language in local schools. I want to extend my deep condolences to Auntie Eileen's family and all of the lives that she touched during her life. Thank you. Uh, the uh, time in accordance now with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded and I invite the clerk to call the next item of business. Private member's business, notice number six relating to koala populations. Thank you. I give the call to the member for Griffith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to koala populations in the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. And Madam Deputy Speaker, as you will have seen, that motion calls on the Morrison Liberal National Government to prevent further habitat loss through yet to commence development in areas in which the koala is listed as vulnerable, pending the completion of the formal assessment for uplisting, the making of a threatened species recovery plan and the making of a new koala conservation strategy. Madam Deputy Speaker, Australia's environment is in decline. And today, as we're about to head into summer, Australians are anxiously following the news of some of the first of the season's bushfires. They're looking to the nation's government to take a stand for wildlife. But national icons like the koala have died in record numbers. Environment department funding has been slashed by 40%. Successive ministers have run the department into the ground and the Morrison government, frankly, has very little idea what has happened to our threatened species. The motion I've moved today calls for new development in koala habitat areas to be stopped unless and until the government gets its act together on koala conservation. There's no national koala conservation strategy and, in fact, there hasn't been since the last one ran out in 2014. 
There, one, there are 171 outstanding threatened species recovery plans, of which 170 are overdue. The koala is among the species for which a threatened species recovery plan is well overdue. It was originally due to be created by 2015. It's now 2020 and still no sign of a recovery plan from this government. There's also no threat abatement plan that is relevant to the koala, despite the threats to this iconic native species. Koala populations in Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT were listed as vulnerable in 2012. In 2019 and 2020, the national bushfire crisis raged throughout the land, burning millions of hectares of, of land and killing or displacing three billion animals, tens of thousands of koalas among them. Yet the government waited until September, just gone. So a year after the national bushfire crisis kicked off, to formally request that the koala be considered for uplisting to a higher conservation status. Madam Deputy Speaker, a New South Wales inquiry found that the koala is heading for extinction in that state by 2050. None of this is good enough. This passed good enough a long time ago. I don't want future generations to have to learn about koalas in the history books, but that's the path that we're on right now. I don't want to lose this national iconic species and I don't want to lose all of our other threatened species either. The government should put the brakes on any yet to commence development in koala habitat areas. Loss of habitat is a key threat to the koala and that was true even before the national bushfire crisis burned so much of Australia's land. The government should get the uplisting sorted out and they should put the threatened species recovery plan in place. This should be done urgently. And of course, they should finally get around to replacing the National Koala Conservation Strategy. It expired six years ago. It's time the government got their act together on this. Once these instruments exist, they can assist the government, along with scientific and other expert advice, in understanding how best to conserve the koala. The government should listen to the science. The parliament shouldn't have to step in and say, we better put a stop on development because you haven't got your act together. Actually, the government should be listening to science and getting the instruments in place that can conserve the koala. But the fact is, right now we're in a policy vacuum. Parliament shouldn't have to do it, but we do because the government has been so poor at acting and taking action to support the koala and conserve the koala. But until the relevant science exists, until the, I mean, it exists now, but until the instruments that are informed by that science exist, we're in a policy vacuum and new development shouldn't go ahead. I put this motion on the notice paper back in early November. Since then, the government has come up with a hastily cobbled together package of re-announced funding to support koalas. In it is a $2 million koala census. Labor has been calling for a national ecological audit since the height of the fires when we made the call in January 2020. It should not have taken the Morrison government until November 2020 to agree to undertake an audit, albeit only of the koala population. The bushfire crisis was quickly followed by the pandemic and the recession, but neither of those crises is an excuse for failing to deal with the consequences of the bushfires, and neither is an excuse for being slow to act on an urgent priority, and that is saving Australia's koalas. One of this government's big problems is that they're always there for the photo op and they're never there for the follow up, and we're certainly seeing that in relation to koalas. At the May 2019 election, they promised up to six million for a major koala initiative. We're still waiting for that to be continued to roll out. Madam Deputy Speaker, the government must do better at protecting this national icon. <laughs> Thank you. Do I have a seconder for the motion? Member for MacArthur, you're seconding? Thank you very much. Excellent. And I give the call to the member for Ford. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I do like the member for Griffiths, but uh, as much in what her contribution had that uh, I would like to disagree with. But there are many things in this chamber and across the chamber, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we can agree on. And one of those, I think, is that the koala is one of our iconic species. Now, you know, we see the koala in all forms. We see it printed on mugs, tea towels. We see it when they get sold to tourists and locals alike. We see them on our TV screens in the form of Blinky Bill, the iconic TV children's TV show that graced our television screens for over a decade. They come in chocolate form with caramel inside, and they come in a foam suit, of course. I'm referring to Borobi, the mascot for the 2018 Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. They're very much an iconic species, and we, as a nation, 
need to do everything possible to protect and preserve them for future generations. It is our duty to preserve and maintain our environment for these future generations, to enjoy and ensure they have the opportunity to enjoy our natural environment as we do. And I think that's one thing in this place we can all agree on. But what we may not agree on, Madam Deputy Speaker, is how we get there. But unlike those opposite, members on this side of the House have a record to stand on when it comes to not only protecting koalas but looking after our environment. And we actually have a very good record. One of the things we don't do is talk about it very well, but we do have a very good record in the environmental space more generally. Now, just last year, we announced the delivery of over $3 million to the Australia Zoo, to the Queensland RSPCA and to Crumman Wildlife Hospital, providing each with over a $1 million in funding for each hospital to create an important network of services to support koala populations. These animal hospitals are located in areas of high koala populations and were sadly largely affected by last year's bushfires in Queensland. We've supported these hospitals and we'll, we're delivering the funding to, to show and support the great work that they are doing in helping our koala population in southeast Queensland. At the time, Madam Deputy Speaker, Dr Michael Pine, senior veterinarian at Currumbin Wildlife Hospital, welcomed the funding, saying that the generosity of this federal grant will allow Currumbin Wildlife Hospital to expand its veterinary services to cope with the rapidly growing number of koala admissions. He went on to say, and I quote, Currumbin Wildlife Hospital will also participate in crucial koala research projects looking to unlock the cures and identify the prevention options for many of the koala diseases that are threatening the species. This is important, groundbreaking work that the Morrison government is delivering in partnership with experts, the people on the ground each and every day working hard to support our koala populations. Madam Deputy Speaker, just last week we announced an $18 million package to protect koalas, with $2 million going towards a national audit of koala populations looking at where koalas are, where the habitat areas are and can be expanded, and establishing an annual monitoring program. We all want to see koalas flourish and prosper, but we can't do that until we know where they are and the best ways to help. The scientists are telling us that there is a serious lack of data about where these populations are and how they are faring and the best ways to help them recover. This census will create a picture that will allow us a picture that we just don't have at present. The big picture helps us understand and the important local places for our koala population. Another $2 million will be invested in koala health research and veterinary support, and $14 million will help restore impacted koala habitat in both bushfire and non-bushfire affected areas and provide targeted funding for koala habitat in northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. Since 2014, the government has invested $26 million into projects that have benefited koalas directly and indirectly. Madam Deputy Speaker, when it comes to looking after our iconic Australian species of koala, we won't be taking lessons from those opposite because it is this side of the chamber that has the record on delivering for koalas and continuing to do so, they don't. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I give the call to the member for MacArthur. Uh, look, I thank the member for Griffith for moving this uh, motion, but I've never heard so much rubbish from the other side as ever before. Uh, this environment minister has been invited to my electorate many times to see our wonderful koala population. It has been studied and studied and studied and I make mention of the work of Professor Robert uh, Close from the University of Western Sydney, who's done some wonderful population worth, uh, work tracking our koalas, checking their health. And we have one of the only chlamydia-free koala populations in urban New South Wales. As we speak, koala habitat is being bulldozed. I've invited the Federal Environment Minister many times to my electorate to see what's happening. She's refused every time. She is the environment minister like Nero fiddling while Rome burns. She is watching the destruction of our iconic Australian wildlife and the, the koala in particular 
and doing nothing about it. This government is doing nothing about it, allowing developers to reap their, their hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in development uh, payments for their land and uh, destroying our iconic koala population. <coughs> Habitat loss is amongst the most significant threats to our koalas. And the constituents in my electorate are crying out for action on the dire land clearing that's been allowed to occur under the watch of this government. It is an absolute tragedy that is involving, evolving in front of our eyes and this government and this Clayton's Environment Minister is doing absolutely nothing about it. It is an evolving tragedy. On numerous occasions, I've invited the Federal Minister for the Environment to come in and see our koala populations. Uh, more recently, I invited the State uh, uh, Environment Minister, Matt Keane, to come and see our koala population. He came and he was amazed by what we have in MacArthur. We sh it should be a national park. But as we watch, bulldozers are clearing koala habitat. It's a shame, and it's a shame on this government they're doing nothing, nothing about it. Not to my surprise, this Environment Minister has refused to act, refused to even visit our, our uh, electorate. The gov government is currently uh, six years overdue in making a threatened species recovery plan for ko the koala. Yet this government kicks the can down the road by saying they're going to have a census. As I've shown you, our koalas have had multiple censuses over many years by Professor Robert Close. All the information is here. The koalas have been tracked, they've been named, they've been checked for health, their breeding's been checked, the, the genetics are all known. This is what's happened in my electorate. Yet this environment minister, this government, just wants to kick the can down the road. It is just shameful that they would do this. Um, we've, we've seen on so many occasions uh, our, our really unique koala habitat uh, destroyed for development. We're really frightened that the remaining uh, koala habitat that's left in my electorate uh, could be the subject of bushfires this coming bushfire season and nothing's been done to protect it. Labor's long called on the federal government to immediately work with the states and with each electorate on an electorate by electorate basis to save our koalas. We have schools in my electorate where the students are distracted by watching the koalas through the windows of their classroom. Yet this government wants to see that destroyed. And when I say wants to have it destroyed, it is quite clear what their policy is doing. They're kicking the can down the road so their developer mates can continue development, can continue with habitat destruction until there is nothing left. And they should be ashamed of themselves. And I have since come, I've come into this parliament, I've written to every environment minister since I've been here requesting urgent action, yet nothing is happening. And yet we hear again from this minister, we'll just kick the can down the road and we'll ignore them. Labor's call for com comprehensive audio or ecological audits, of course. But we know in my electorate of MacArthur, southwestern Sydney, we know the koalas, we know their names, we know their habits, we know their breeding patterns, we know how they track. They go between the, the Georges River and, and uh, the Dupean River. We know what's happening and we're watching as we speak, their habitat being destroyed. It's a huge shame. I commend this motion to the parliament and I call on the government to act because if they don't act soon, there will be nothing to act for. The only koalas left will be, as the previous me member said, chocolate koalas that you can buy in a confectionery shop. You won't be able to see them in the wild. And this is an absolute tragedy that's evolving in front of our eyes and this government does nothing. I thank the member for MacArthur. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Cowper. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, koalas are synonymous with the township of Port Macquarie and my electorate. And when you drive into Port Macquarie and exit off at the Pacific Highway, at the service station there, you'll meet Oceana, Mr T, Koala Z and Kira Lee, four individually painted koala structures, uh, of sculptures sorry, standing at a metre high. And if you enter from the north end, you won't drive far before you see another one metre tall uh, koala sculpture named Douglas. And koala, uh, koala, Hello Koalas is an award-winning tourism conservation initiative coordinated by Margaret Ma. It's been in operation since 2014, and now there are about 77 koalas in the Hello Koala Sculpture Trail. One of the latest is Frankie the Firefighter, 
a koala dressed in the proud yellow and red uniform of the Rural Fire Service. But, Deputy Speaker, in Port Macquarie, we also have the Koala Hospital, which rates as the number one reason on tourism app TripAdvisor to visit the town. The Port Macquarie Koala Hospital has been outstanding in its actions to assist koalas from across New South Wales since its inception in 1973. During and after the Black Summer bushfires, it raised about $8 million through its GoFundMe page and constructed and distributed 140 water drinking stations into koala habitat areas. The koala hospital is run by four paid staff and 140 passionate local volunteers, and in fact, there is a waiting list to become a volunteer at the hospital. The hospital consists of one treatment room, eight intensive care units, six outdoor intensive care units, 33 rehabilitation yards, many with trees. But it's not only a hospital to treat sick and injured koalas, it is an organisation that assists with koala research by partnering with the University of Sydney and the Queensland University of Technology. About 250 koalas are emitted through the hospital annually and they come from all over New South Wales. The hospital is about to embark on a world first facility delivered through its GoFundMe page and the state government's generous gifting of the land along with a further $5 million state grant. I'm told that the new wild koala breeding facility will not only increase the number of koalas, it will dramatically increase their chance of survival when released into the wild due to extensive research. Port Macquarie Hospital Director Shane Flanagan says it will be a partnership project with universities and other research bodies as well. And I know Ms Flanagan supports the member for Griffith's motion today to consider uplisting the koala status of vulnerable, uh, of vulnerable under national environment laws. I also know the Environment Minister, Susan Lee, who visited my electorate on the 13th of January following the bushfires, also supports it con its consideration. The Threatened Species Scientific Committee is currently assessing all the available information and will be undertaking a full assessment of the combined koala populations of Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT. This assessment will consider the impacts of the devastating summer bushfires on koalas, as well as such threats as cl chlamydia and other diseases. So with the potential uplisting of the koala status, the Morrison-McCormack government is acting. And indeed, the coalition government since 2014 has invested over $26.4 million on projects supporting outcomes for koalas. Projects have included tree planting, propagation of food trees, and reconnecting corridors. Under the Environment Restoration Fund, a total of $6 million has been allocated for koalas, including $3 million for koala hospitals in South East Queensland. The remaining $3 million from the Environment Restoration Fund is for projects that will improve and protect important koala habitat in New South Wales and South East Queensland. But we must ensure our investment in the restoration enhancement of koala habitat is targeted and backed by science. This is why on the 23rd of November, the Environment Minister announced our government will be providing two million for a national koala census. The Environment Minister knows many states and territory agencies, researchers, community groups and volunteers are collecting good information about koalas in the wild, but there are gaps and there, needs to, uh, there is a need for coordination and reporting. I look forward to working with the Port Macquarie Koala Hospital, its volunteers and other residents, uh, and encourage them to become involved in the, the census. For Cowper, the question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Fremantle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Shadow Minister for the Environment, the member for Griffiths, for bringing this motion forward for our debate. It's a critical topic at a critical time. The country is again in the grip of a heat wave, which of course freshens the still raw memory of last summer's awful devastation. It was our first national climate change disaster. It included the largest single fire ever recorded, 12 million hectares scorched, 3 billion animals dead, including, of course, many koalas, and a number of species and ecosystems pushed closer to the brink. Since that time, we've had the interim report of the EPBC reviewer, Graham Samuel, who has said quite plainly that Australia's environment has been seriously degraded, that our environmental protection framework is not effective, 
and the present trajectory is of further decline. So we have to ask, when exactly is the government going to start acknowledging the environmental reality and its responsibility to do something about it? When is a seven-year-old free-term government going to take responsibility for presiding over the serious mismanagement and neglect of one of its core tasks, and that is national level environmental protection and biodiversity conservation? How can it be that there isn't a threatened species recovery plan for an iconic species like the koala when it was, last, it was due in 2015? The only possible excuse, if you can call it an excuse, is that the koala is not alone in being neglected. Under this government, 170 out of 171 threatened species recovery plans are overdue. If it's too much to ask that the government do its job when it comes to environmental protection, they could try to stop actively making it worse. Stop cutting resources to the Environment Department. Stop weakening our environmental protection framework. Stop ignoring the reality of climate change. And stop undermining the efforts of Australia's scientists and conservation sector. It can be made even simpler than that. The Minister for the Environment should see their chief responsibility as standing up and speaking up for the environment all day, every day. And that hasn't been the case. Instead, the various ministers for the environment in this government, because there have been four of them in the last five years, have consistently made it their priority to slash green tape. In other words, despite being ministers whose job it is to protect our environment and our biodiversity, they have focused their attention on weakening regulation and in always seeking to accommodate economic interests at the expense of our wildlife and our landscapes and our marine environment. Deputy Speaker, the bottom line is that Australia's biodiversity is under enormous pressure and it has already suffered significant harm. We are, sadly, a world leader when it comes to mammal extinctions. And now the koala as a species is drifting from its present vulnerable status towards a situation where its survival may not be just threatened but endangered. Of course, the greatest danger to the koala comes from the destruction of their habitat, the destruction of the trees in which they live, of the 50 different species of eucalypts out of 700 species in total that provide the kilo or so leaves uh, of leaves that koalas eat each day. Yet despite the clarity we have in relation to the chief vectors of harm and risk, we also have a minister who is looking to make the environment come second best at every turn, never mind that in present circumstances, as Australia's wildlife battle against deforestation, invasive species and climate change, second best will inevitably deliver more extinctions and more irreversible environmental harm. It's for all these reasons that Labor, through the Shadow Minister for the Environment, has called for a full ecological audit in the aftermath of the bushfires. Not just a koala census, a full ecological audit. We've called on the government to reverse its cuts to the department and to scientific organisations like the CSIRO, and we've fought against the government's effort to ram through legislation that would undermine the EPBC at a time when it desperately needs to be improved in accordance with Graeme Samuel's advice. That requires significantly improved and in some cases uncompromising national standards, and it requires an independent and properly resourced tough environmental watchdog and oversight agency. The fact that the government ruled out such a watchdog before the final report has even landed tells you everything you need to know about this government's lack of commitment. In conclusion, Deputy Speaker, I take this opportunity at the end of what has been a very difficult year and at the beginning of another challenging summer to acknowledge the incredible work and effort of people around Australia engaged in our great shared cause of looking after our remarkable and distinctive environment. I say it to all the Indigenous rangers and traditional owners, to the fire response volunteers, to people in rural and regional Australia working on revegetation and sal salinity remediation projects, to those who support local animal rescue centres and hospitals, to those who work in the sustainable timber industry and who fight to protect old growth forests, to those who turn up to beach cleanups and work to reduce the harm caused by marine plastics, to everyone who makes environmental conservation, restoration and activism a part of their lives, whether that's professionally or as a volunteer, I say thank you to them. Thank you. You're all engaged in a vital effort. Keep going. I thank the member from, for Fremantle. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And certainly I can agree with the member for Griffith in this aspect of the motion, and that is the importance of protecting our koala population and our local, particularly our local koala population in the Ryan electorate. However, the statements made in the motion that this side of the House, that the government, is not steadfastly committed to this task is simply not the case. Since 2014, the government has invested over $26.4 million on projects that support the protection and the growth of our local koala population. Projects like tree planting and reconnecting vital koala corals, like preserving uh, important koala habitat. 
This month, we have announced an $18 million package to help protect Australia's koalas, including a national koala audit that will help scientists better understand the locations and the movements of our local koalas, enabling us to better determine how best to support their continued growth as a population. I know in particular that my good friend and um, neighbouring uh, electorate, uh, the, Assistant the Assistant Environment Minister, uh, the member for Brisbane, is very passionate about this particular issue, as he knows, like I do, how important the local koala population is, particularly to our home city of Brisbane. Throughout my time as a local councillor and now in this place, we've been proud to support the koala facilities, particularly in our electorate of Ryan. And it's ironic that the member for Butler is the one who has moved this particular motion when in her electorate is in the city, in the city of Brisbane, where the local council invests more in protecting koala habitat and supporting local koala population than any other local government around Australia. The Ryan electorate itself is home to two fantastic koala facilities that I wanted to take the opportunity of this particular motion to highlight because they are out there on the ground every day as volunteers and as staff helping to protect our koala population. The first is Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, the world's first and largest koala sanctuary right in our electorate of, of Ryan at Fig Tree Pocket. It's home to 130 koalas, a decent sized population in of itself. It is a fantastic tourist attraction, of course, but Lone Pine serves, as a koala sanctuary serves in a very important purpose of helping to further research on koalas and helping to re rehabilitate injured and sick koalas as well. Through its, tourist, through its to efforts with tourists as well, it is of course continuing to preserve our Aussie icon by ensuring that the world knows just how precious the koala population is. Now COVID-19 has proved tough, as it has proved a tough year for all of us, but it's proved tough for our zoos and aquariums. And it was through the federal government's $94.6 million support package the Lone Pine was able to continue to care for their animals. Robert, the then general manager of Lone Pine, described it uh, in these terms. Even though tourists weren't able to visit the sanctuary during the lockdown, it's important to remember vet bills, food costs, and other maintenance for the animals did not stop. The government's support, and I quote, was essential in ensuring the ongoing costs could be met. Lone Pine is also home to the Brisbane Koala Science Institute. This was an election commitment of mine when I was a local councillor in 2016, in which the Brisbane City Council put $3 million towards establishing. It is a fantastic addition to Lone Pine, as I said, with their sanctuary efforts. But the Koala Science Institute brings, a, brings uh, scientists, koala scientists and environmentalists from around the nation together to further their research in a collaborative manner along with the universities and our next generation of scientists to further the cause of our local koala population. Their current research focuses on trying to understand why some koalas develop disease, severe disease when they are infected with chlamydia, which is a major threat, of course, to our declining northern wild koalas population, including the role that genetics can play, and they are looking at the way that they can sequence out those genetics. These facilities at Lone Pine will allow other reach researchers to analyse samples from koala populations right across the southeast Queensland. And the work being done there at Lone Pine is helping to pioneer Australians' conservation efforts in this related field and will play a crucial role in protecting the koala species. Our lecture of Ryan is also home to the Mogul Koala Rehabilitation Centre, which was opened in 1991 to provide care for injured, sick or orphan koalas. The Mogul Koala Centre is part of a greater network of wildlife facilities in southeast Queensland serving our injured koala population. Just like these two great Ryan institutions, this government will be focused on practical measures to protect our koala's population, not the virtue signalling virtue signaling of the opposition, but practical on the ground measures and finding the that we can to help our koala population. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for MacArthur. Macquarie. Macquarie. I'm sorry. Macquarie. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It isn't unusual in my electorate for my constituents to post photos and video on Facebook of koalas in trees in their backyards. This is not something we go to a zoo to see or go to a facility to see because we live in world heritage and it's world heritage that allows, the, creates the habitat for these koalas to not just 
pass through but to breed and establish themselves. So the bushfires, which went through 80 per cent of the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage, have taken a terrible toll on the koala populations that we have had. Uh, vast numbers were killed in last summer's bushfire crisis. Now, across New South Wales, it's estimated that around one third of the population of koalas died, 30,000 nationally. And locally, it's been devastating for those who care for koalas through wires and volunteer organisations, but also for our New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service, who go through bush now not seeing the things they have seen for so many years. I, I think the, uh, the, the thing that troubles me is that we have had so little trickle down of promised bushfire funding to try and support the existing koala populations or even get in early and find them. Volunteers did so much, just as they did during the fires, where they organised parties to go in and rescue as many koalas as they could. So what we're seeing is a, a, an incredibly endangered species. And it is time for this government to get serious about what it's going to do to ensure these populations come back and then thrive. Uh, in the first really comprehensive scientific study that's been done of a post bushfire of the New South Wales koala population, and this was done mainly in the North Coast, they found 70% of the population were killed. That's the sort of scale we're talking about. In my own area, in the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury in particular, when the bushfires came, began to take over this time last year, Science for Wildlife's Executive Director Kelly Lee uh, organised an incredible rescue operation. And these were koalas that had been fitted with radio collars. The authorities gave her team just two days to get in and try and save as many koalas as they could, because uh, they thought if it all burns, then at least there'd be some good genes that had been um, rescued. So her, the, her um, volunteers found out through smoke uh, and scorched earth, and they scaled, one, uh, one person scaled a 130 foot tall eucalyptus tree to retrieve animals. They saved 10 adults and two juveniles. A koala named Houdini had to be left behind because there was just no time to extract him from a deep ravine. So these were, were really difficult things to do. And the fires, which burned through 80% of that area, uh, Kelly thinks that around 1,000 koalas died. So the challenge we have is trying to bring all this back. And the lands that border National Park are so important for this. And one of the challenges is that there's pressure on development for those areas. Uh, the, there are two incredible WISE volunteers, Morgan and John. They've cared for 10 or 11 koalas just since September. Um, and they say they've just been smashed this season because there is uh, growth happening. Uh, but if there aren't enough trees, fresh trees and leaves for these very fussy koalas to make a meal of, we're going to lose them. So the biggest threat everyone knows in our area is the destruction of habitat as a result of urban development. Currajong Hills is a real epicentre for koalas and just recently an 800 acre farm has been subdivided into 10 acre lots. The EIS for this was done in 2007. It was done 13 years ago and the EIS said it was poor habitat area for koalas. Now we all know that that is absolute garbage. Uh, it is really ideal country for koalas, particularly when the world heritage has been so devastated by fires. So uh, there is a need for this government to take it seriously. Dr Kelly Lee is also surveying people to say, how much do you want to save koalas? And I'm going to put a link to her survey on my website and my Facebook page so that we can do something, I even if this government thank the won't. member for Macquarie. The time allotted for this debate has expired. The clerk. The private member's business notice number seven, motion relating to the scouting and guiding movement. Member for Longman. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move this motion relating to the scouting and guiding movement in the terms on which it appears on the notice paper. Let me hear a second. 
Uh, no, we don't need okay. a seconder until you've completed your speech. Oh. So the member for Longman. I must tell the person who writes my list out. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. There are certain qualities that many people aspire to and which are highly valued in our society. Being respectful, friendly and considerate. Caring for others and the environment and using resources wisely. Doing what is right and being trustworthy, honest and fair. Doing your best. Believing in yourself, learning from experiences and facing challenges with courage. As a business owner and employer, these are the sort of qualities I look for when I'm hiring a new employee or selecting someone for promotion. These important qualities, Deputy Speaker, are the values that are taught by scouts and girl guide groups in my electorate of Longman and right across Australia. For more than 100 years, the scouts and girl guides have been helping to build and develop the confidence of young people not just here in Australia, but in many countries around the world. Children and young adults aged from 5 to 25 have been learning outdoor skills while developing a sense of adventure, teamwork, creativity and independence. The personal development programs of the Scouts and Girl Guides have been an important opportunity for young people in communities right across the country to develop the skills that put them on the path to future success. Businessman Dick Smith, Formula One legend Sir Jack Brabham, celebrities like Shane Jacobson and Bert Newton were all once scouts. Wildlife ambassador and TV personality Robert Irwin is a Scouts Queensland ambassador. Former Liberal Party leader Brendan Nelson was in the Scouts. Around the world, other famous Scouts include Billy Connolly, Bill Gates, Sir Paul McCartney, <coughs> David Beckham, Venus Williams and Bear Grylls. Scouts and the Girl Guides are still among the most popular programs worldwide for personal development in young people. In my electorate of Longman, we are very blessed with six different scout groups in Woodford, Caboolture, Morayfield, Burpengarry, Narangbar and Bribey Island. Thousands of people have been through the doors of these groups over the years and there are currently about 350 youth members across these six groups. They continue to do a great job working with young people in my electorate and providing them with the skills and values that will help them help put them on the pathway to success. Perhaps surprising in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, scouting in my home state of Queensland has seen significant growth in membership figures since April. Membership in the Longman Scouting Groups alone has increased 22.7 per cent in the past eight months, and that trend continues to rise. When the schools and other organisations ceased to meet face-to-face -face back in April, Scouts Queensland launched the Scouting at Home program. More than 400 online resources were created, which enabled the Scouts to continue weekly meetings and activities. In fact, many of the resources created in Queensland were used in other states as well. The Scouting theme for 2020, very appropriately, has been resilience. And a recent survey conducted by Scouts Australia found that Scouts demonstrated a far wider range of resilient beha behaviours than their peers. Through, though like many groups, they need volunteers to help out and there are a range of different roles available. Local scouts and guides groups also need to raise funds so its members can enjoy the many activities and events these groups participate in. State scouting bodies have access government grants at different times, though most of their revenue comes from local fundraising activities, donation and membership fees. As you can imagine, COVID-19 restrictions have prevented many of these fundraising activities, like the Bunnings sausage sizzles. Despite, despite this, Scouts Australia is still going strong with around 70,000 members and it is part of a much larger global family. The scouting movement around the world has around 40 million members. When the Scouts were first established in my home state of Queensland in 1908, the movement spread rapidly. It was soon apparent that many girls wanted to become Scouts too, and so the Girl Guides was formed the following year. There have been more than a million Girl Guides in Australia since that time. Globally, the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts has 10 million members from 150 different countries. Next year, the Scouts in Australia will celebrate their 113th birthday and the Guides their 112th. Congratulations, Scouts Australia, Girl Guides Australia, and the World Organisation of the Scout Movement for helping our kids learn the values and skills that ultimately make our communities a better place in which to live. I thank the member for Longman. The question is the motion be agreed to and I give the call. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm, I am after a second, but yes. Thank I'll you. I'll second the motion, thank you. And reserve, and reserve my right to speak. Thank you.
Uh, the member for Parramatta has. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. You know, in, in academic circles and among business thinkers around the world at the moment, there's a, an, a, a, a real focus on how to, how to develop a commercially viable business that delivers social good rather than a one-on-one -on -one transaction that it does what it does and delivers a, good, a, a social good to the broader community. And you can see it through exploration of social enterprise and impact investing. And even you know, great academics like Michael Porter will say to you that something has to be commercially viable if it's going to scale. So if you want something that will solve social good, you need to make it commercially viable in order for it to scale. And every time I read that, and I actually am quite a fan of Michael Porter and a whole range of others, and I, do a, I read a lot of the academic research because it's really interesting, but every time I hear it, I think, yeah, except for surf life-saving and country women's association and amateur sport and scouts. And there are many others, these organisations that form as a tiny little bud and scale around the world, and 100 years later or more, they're still flourishing with more loyalty and commitment than you find to any commercial business and living longer than most commercial companies. So something very special happens when a good idea takes root in a community and they pick it up as volunteers. And scouts and guides are no doubt that. Formed as it was by Lord Baden-Powell in 1907, the World Scouting Movement, Parramatta picked it up in 1908. One year later, the Parramatta Scout Group was established. It was one of the first in Australia, of course, because we're Parramatta. We do that, um, and it is still thriving. In fact, now we have 12 scout groups um, in the electorate of Parramatta, and I am going to name them. There's 1,000 members, um, at least 1,000 members. Um, they are the first, second Maryland St. Anne's scout group, the first, second Maryland St. Anne's rover crew, the third Maryland scout group, the first Westmead Scout Group, the first Westmead Rover Crew, the first Granville Scout Group, the first Rydalmere Scout Group, which is reopening now because the interest in scouting is growing again, largely because of COVID, looking for outdoor activities, looking for really safe places for, for children to be, and the Scouts organisation have worked so hard to make sure they're COVID safe. You can absolutely guarantee that they will follow the rules that they set down and you know that your child will actually be doing the things they say they're going to do. So children are returning to Scouts. So there's a one reopening. We've got the first Parramatta Scout Group, that's the really old one, um, the first Toongabbie Scout Group, the first Carlingford Scout Group, the Western Sydney Buddha Light International Association Scout Group, and the Kings Langley Rover Crew Westmead, which is reopening for Joeys and Cubs right now again because the interest in scouting um, is growing. And what a great bunch of people they are. I've spent quite a bit of time um, with my local scouts, um, various groups of them. I've been there for all sorts of events and they are an amazing bunch of people. Um, 500 scouts attend the dawn service in Parramatta every year, 500 of them. We have three or four RSLs, so we have a few dawn services in Parramatta. I can't get to them all. They, they tend to, to stagger them so I can rush from one to the other in, in many cases, but 500 scouts attend, attend in Parramatta alone. It really is um, quite amazing. When you look back at the history of volunteers with the scouts, we have Annette Douglas, who's been a Cub Scout leader with Parramatta Scout Group since 1990 and an honorary leader since 2017. She's over 80 now. And she's still there. She's still contributing actively and supporting young people in our community um, over 80. What an extraordinary contribution she has made. This year, Annette received an OAM in the Australia Day 2020 honours for her contribution to youth and scouts and incredibly deserving. Sandy Knox has been with Ermington Scout since 2004. She served as a leader with Joeys, Cubs and Venturers and has been instrumental in putting on major local events like the Parramatta District Fun Day and, and the Water and Annual New South Wales Cubberies. Leonie Plummer has been part of Carlingford Scout since 1992. She trained hundreds of Joey leaders in this time while working with children in her own scout group. And Deputy Speaker, I can tell you that every year I get invited to the Cumberland Gang Show, which is now mm. over 50 years old, over 50 years every year, Cumberland Gang Show. And I think for the last 16 years, I've been to them about 14 times. Extraordinary 
um, organisation, extraordinary bunch of people who keep that institution alive year after year after year. So every time someone tells you if it's not commercially viable, it can't scale, think Scouts, an organisation 100 years. The question is the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a great pleasure to support the motion of my friend, the member for Longman. It is a cracker motion because it gives us all the opportunity to talk about the valuable contribution that guides and scouts provide to our community, particularly this year when our young people, when our young Australians needed the opportunity to uh, continue to keep in touch with their friends. Uh, scouts and guides provided that opportunity. And you know, when you think about it, has there has their motto of be prepared ever been more relevant than it has been this year in 2020? We all needed to be a little bit more prepared uh, and that is, what the kind of, that is the kind of things that uh, they're teaching in Scouts and Guides. Those kind of leadership skills uh, and those other opportunities uh, and skills that you need going forward for your, um, for your further life. My electorate uh, in Ryan is home to eight fantastic Scout groups. The Kenmore Group, the Mogul Group, the Barden Group, the Inogra Scout Group, the Indrapilly Group, Turinga Milton Tawang Group, Groverly Mitchelton, and the St John's Wood Group at Ashgrove. I, my scout, my, I myself was a very proud scout at the Mogul Scout Group, uh, where I learned some of those very important skills that all of our local kids and leaders and families learn. My dad was a community leader, like so many other community leaders. I saw him work incredibly hard, even long after I had left. Uh, that scouting group, he was still there supporting local young people. For a number of years after I left Scouts, I was also the chairman for the Taekwondo district, supporting our uniform volunteers in the Scouts as well, which is a tremendous privilege. I can't say I've had the same connection uh, with the Girl Guides. I was never a Girl Guide, but we have five Girl Guide groups who do a fantastic job in our local electorate of Ryan. Girl Guides at Kenmore District, Girl Guides at St Lucia District, Girl Guides at Mogul District, Girl Guides at Walton Bridge, the Gap District, and Girl Guides at the Barden uh, District. The Scout and Girl Guide groups in the Ryan electorate, I really want to pay tribute to them. They are an essential local community uh, group that facilitates the personal progression of those young men and women. Uh, and the youth program is concentrating uh, for the Scouts, particularly on leadership and teamwork in the in the categories of the outdoors, community involvement, creativity and personal growth. They of course rely uh, very heavily on fundraising and donations as well as membership fees and that's been very difficult in this year of COVID-19 but they have done tremendously well. The Turinga Milton Tawong Scout Group in particular has their annual mulch drive. Now normally I am there uh, with my shovel bagging up mulch myself uh, but that wasn't possible with COVID-19. It was a much smaller operation this year, but they still did uh, get their normal um, mulch drive out in some way, shape or, or fashion. My wife, Maddie, and I were very pleased to be able to be a keen purchaser of the mulch for the garden, uh, but also support that fantastic scout group. Likewise, the Kenmore Scout Group, uh, they're also always out there in the community, supporting our local community. They were out there for Clean Up Australia Day on the 1st of March. But again, it's been hard uh, for them to fundraise, but they've persevered and they recently finished up their fundraising raffle as, as well. Uh, but more than that, we are also proud to support them as a government. And one of the examples of where we're reaching out to support uh, the Scouts and the Guides is St John, St John Wood Scout Group uh, through the Government Stronger Communities Program. We've been able to, I've been able to support them as a local MP. Uh, by undertaking, to undertake some much needed club refurbishments to their old 45 year old building. I was able to visit their clubhouse and see what the improvements look like, including a new roof. They have put the Stronger Communities Program grant to a very, very good use and they've driven the money a long way. Not only has it given them a new roof and a building that is fit for purpose for their activities going forward, but it will now allow them to put solar panels on the roof as well to be installed in the near future to make the building more environmentally friendly and improve, um, and improve their sustainability. This group has provided a much needed, as all the groups have, a much needed important local connection during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and in fact, their energy and initiative um, of the St John Wood Scout Group, even during COVID-19, has in fact seen their membership grow 
grow and increase from 88 in April 2019 to 134 today because they were on Zoom, because they were continuing to look out and support each other. Their group leader, Alan Brake, said that, and I quote, Scouts volunteers have implemented additional sanitising to continue to deliver important training under a COVID safe plan. Many parents have expressed their appreciation for the pivotal stability that these scouting programs have provided during these difficult times. Scouts contributes to the development of young people in achieving their full physical, intellectual, emotional, social and spiritual potential as individuals. Congratulate all the volunteers, scouts and guides in the Ryan electorate. I thank, thank the you. member for Ryan. The question is the motion be agreed to and I give the call to the member for Patterson. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. And uh, I rewind the clock back to 1978 when I promised that I would do my best to do my duty to God, to serve the Queen and to help others and to keep the Brownie Guide law. Yeah. It sticks in my memory <laughs> as I made my Brownie Girl Guide salute. And uh, in those days, as Brownies, we wore the brown tunic with the leather belt. We even wore brown undies, Mr yeah. Deputy <laughs> Speaker. And what fantastic times we had. Uh, look, as, as a kid that was... Uh, born with much older siblings than me. I was on my own a fair bit, so mum sent me along to Brownies and it was one of the best experiences of my life. And I went on to be a girl guide and uh, again, you know, truly loved those experiences. Whether it was uh, doing badges and I can still tie a reef knot and a bowline and uh, you know, half hitches and a few other things, which keeps me reasonably handy around the farm from time to time and on the occasional boat. But uh, I think about those things that we learnt uh, in Brownies and Guides over the years, things like, and, and reflecting on that promise, a duty, a sense of community service, whether it was going to help out in the community or whether it was going on pack holidays and learning to get along with other people and just be good members of a group. Uh, it was such an important and informative time for all of us learning together. And we also, now that I really think back on it as a member of parliament, I didn't quite realise how much of our First Nations culture that we embraced as Girl Guides and Brownies as well. But I think back to some of my PAC leaders and uh, I think of Brown Owl, Elizabeth Masterman, who still lives in Pelamane, not very far from me. And even when I go to Coles and do the shopping, I still refer to her as Brown Owl, and she's like, Meryl, you should call me, you should call me Elizabeth, and I'm like, you'll always be Brown Owl to me. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that brownies, guiding, scouts, venturers, what they do is they give kids a sense of belonging, a sense of duty, a sense of respect, and these are all values. And it, look, it doesn't matter whether you, you know, religious, not religious, liberal, labour, Nats, Calathumpy and independent, as people, we all need to learn as we're growing up those core beliefs and values that make us good citizens. We might embellish those values as we get older with different beliefs of how we should get to that common goal. But at the end of the day, we want to be good citizens, we want to contribute, we want to have a sense of duty to our community and to ourselves. And, and I honestly believe that girl guiding and scouting give young children that. So there is no better way if you are looking for an outlet for your child who may not be particularly sporty or musical, but you want them to be involved in a group, a group that will give them good practical skills, a group that will allow them to reach into parts of uh, and experiences that they might have never thought that they'd have in a million years. They, scouting and, and girl guiding do a fantastic job. Scouts Australia has over 17,000 youth and adult members and guides have over 30,000 members. Young people thrive from life skills and socialisations that these groups provide and again, friendships that we made as brownies and guides, and, and I know young people make today, they will stand you in the test of time over the years, and you just never know when you'll bump into someone again or retain those friendships. And I want to send out a special shout out to my scouts groups, the Port Stephens Scouts. They've got Tilligree, Nelson Bay, Anna Bay and Raymond Terrace. 
great group of scouts. And East Maitland, I was actually fortunate enough to visit East Maitland Scouts a little bit over 12 months ago now, but had a fantastic night at Scouts that night, talking to young people, participating in their activities. We even did a bit of cooking. It was really quite great. And Curry Curry Scouts, uh, which is just down the hill from where our guide hall is in Curry Curry. And I'd just like to throw out a special mention to the guide hall in Curry Curry. We had a really severe storm that went through Curry a few years ago, and the after hours, after hours ambulance hall that was used for Ush lost its roof. The guide hall gave its hall for Ush to use. That's community spirit. So keep guiding, keep going to scouts, I and keep thank making the a member contribution. For Patterson, for a contribution. The question is: the motion be agreed to? And I give the call to the member for Stirling. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, I'm, I'm so pleased to be surrounded by passionate community advocates, and uh, no less than the member for Patterson, uh, an ex-Brownie, the member for Ryan, an ex-Boy Scout. I wasn't a Boy Scout, uh, but my father was, and his. Uh, pioneering ways and his uh, camp, camp, camps that he used to take me on uh, with his billy and his swag and his scout songs certainly inspired me. And I did become an army cadet, something a little bit similar and, and certainly akin to fostering a spirit of adventurism and resilience. And I think we can all agree that if there's a couple of things we really want in all of our children, adventurism, adventurism and resilience have to be right up there at the top of the list. So I also appreciate this opportunity to give a shout out to the Scouts and the Girl Guides Associations. Um, Scouts Australia is of course 70,000 strong. It's part of a 40 million member worldwide organisation of the Scouts movement. This provides boys and girls aged 5 to 25 with fun and challenging opportunities to grow through adventure. And Scouts Australia is also one of the largest youth development organisations in the whole country. And across the country, there are thousands of volunteer branch and section commissioners, leaders and supporters. Girl Guides Australia is the peak body for guiding in Australia and is a not-for-profit organisation. Girl Guides offers girls aged 5 to 17 years a unique girl-led experience in a safe, welcoming space with a variety of activity. The World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts has 10 million Girl Guides and Scouts from across 150 countries. Now, in a normal year, uh, the bulk of funds moving into the Scouts and Guides comes from fundraising. But of course, in 2020, there's been some pretty big impacts to the ability to fundraise through things like uh, the cookie drive, uh, car washes, which I know some of my local Scouts get into. All of these have been impacted by COVID. Uh, but also local, state and federal government funding forms a component of how we get behind and support Scouts. And I was delighted in my own electorate of Stirling uh, this past financial year to award $5,000 to the Tewitt Hill Yokine Scout Group. Uh, and that was under the Volunteer Grants Program. I was also delighted last November to have joined the Tewitt Hill Yokine Scout Group for its 70th birthday celebration. A wonderful occasion, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Scouts Australia also has received JobKeeper this year, which has assisted with cash flow during what has been a very difficult financial year. Uh, less obvious, uh, but quite unfortunately, has been the restrictions on movement, which I mentioned have impacted that fundraising. But that's where it's been great to see the resilience again displayed by these organisations. And we all know that uh, facing adversity is par for the course for scouts and guides, and, uh, and they will emerge strongly in 2021. Uh, also, uh, we have seen Scouts WA continue to provide uh, their services and camps throughout 2020, and that's provided a wonderful sense of normalcy for a lot of those kids who've been able to keep being involved in Scouts. Uh, also, uh, Scouts WA has completed its new program, which successfully aims to be adventurous, fun, challenging and inclusive. Now, as we end, uh, come towards the end of the year, uh, I thank and congratulate all of the group leaders and section leaders in WA, and particularly those in the Scout groups in Stirling, those at Amelia Heights, Dianella, Hammersley, Carinup, Tewitt Hill, Yokine, Scarborough Beach and North Beach. I also congratulate Aidan McKenzie, who in July was invested as the Chief Commissioner of Scouts in WA. And he is the youngest ever Chief Commissioner, and I'm told he has a bold vision for the future. Another person who's gone from strength to strength with the helps of Scouts is Caitlin Arcus. 
and Caitlin led Scouts during the COVID-19 pandemic as Acting Chief Commissioner. Mr Deputy Speaker, two years ago, at age just 26, Caitlin was appointed the youngest ever De uh, Deputy Chief Commissioner of Scouts WA. I recognise today also my good friend Warren Mickelson and his son Connor. Uh, I've watched Warren and Connor operate uh, within Scouts, uh, uh, Warwick, and, and, uh, sorry, and Warren has also uh, been really passionate in his leadership within the Scouts. Uh, this sort of passion uh, supports the kids to have the adventure and excitement that's so important for every child's development. So to Aidan, Caitlin, to Warren, along with so many others like them across the country, thank you for what you are doing. You are shining examples to our kids, helping them build that spirit of adventure and resilience. I thank the member for Stirling. The question is the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Lyons. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And as a former Cub Scout of the uh, East Paddington, ah, yeah, it does, it does, and and Army Cadet for a short time. So, <laughs> Deputy Speaker, Scouts have been around for more than 100 years. When it was first founded in the UK in 1907 by Lord Baden Powell, uh, since then Scouting has evolved into a worldwide movement of nearly 50 million young people. 50 million young people and adult volunteers and is welcoming of all genders. And I must give a shout out to my late mother. She was Balu in my, um, in my yeah. scout group, so uh, she did her bit. Uh, scouting provides young people, guided by adult volunteers, the opportunities to participate in programs, events, activities and projects that contribute to their growth as active citizens. And as the member for Patterson pointed out, that's what it's all about. This grows young kids into being really good citizens. Today, Scouts Australia is a 70,000 strong organisation and is part of the 40 million member world organisation of the Scout Movement. Scouting Australia has a vision that by 2023, Scouting will be the leading youth development movement in Australia, empowering 83,000 young people to be resilient, resilient, self-fulfilled, positive change makers in their community. Now, Scouting first appeared in Tasmania in 1909, just two years after, the, um, after Lord and Baden Powell. We are first at everything, first at everything. Within a year of the publication in Britain of Baden Powell's Scouting for Boys, so it has been around for a long time. Small groups of boys in Hobart, Devonport and Wynyard, each supported by an enthusiastic adult, undertook challenging activities like ambulance work and camp craft. And when, when Baden Powell first visited Tasmania in 1912, similar groups of scouts were functioning in other towns. For the next 50 years, senior British scouting personnel came to the state to share ideas, offer advice and provide expert training for leaders. Now, in those early years, the movement in Tasmania received a modest annual grant from the state government. I'm not sure if they still do. I'm sure they'd welcome it. Uh, this was supplemented by income from the scout shop and a, a waste materials collection service, while groups raised money from fairs, dancers and euchre tournaments. I think euchre's a card game? I'm not sure. Uh, by the mid-1920s, there were some 1,000 scouts of all ranks in the state. Uh, parent support groups began to appear and the movement enjoyed a lot of support from business, political and civic leaders. Uh, in December 33, the organisation was confident enough to stage one of the first national scouting youth events held in the state, a scout corroboree at Lake Sorrel uh, near my hometown. And membership of scouting in Tasmania has always fluctuated, reaching a peak of about 5,000 in the early 1970s. But it's still going strong. It's quiet but strong. Early this month, uh, Joey Scouts celebrated 30 years in Tasmania with birthday events at the Botanical Gardens in Hobart and at Holly Bank in Launceston with games, bush bushwalking and, of course, birthday cake. Uh, and Scouts Tasmania held its annual scout camping uh, competition this month the statewide Clark Trophy with 110 scouts and 55 leaders converging on Fulton Park to enjoy a weekend of fine weather and camping. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to personally attend with Senator Anne Urquhart, a uh, Tasmanian, the Tasmanian Scouts AGM with President Corey McGrath, uh, Chief Commissioner Michael Hovington and Chief Scout of Tasmania, Kate Warner AC, our state's wonderful governor. It was a joy to watch this community come together from all around the state, descend on Bridgewater in the south of my electorate uh, after what has been a very challenging year for a number of reasons uh, and celebrate their achievements. I would particularly like to acknowledge life member inductees Maria Doreen and Suzanne Hovington and years of service awardees Marion Blight for 30 years 
and Denise Walter for 35 years of service to the organisation. And seeing them take to the podium with great pride after a lifetime of service was really something to see. And well done also to Australian Scout Medallion awardees Evan Eastman Peck and Yamani Neva, who are the next generation of young Scouts coming through, already their leaders. The Australian Scout Medallion is the highest award in the Scout section and is achieved by only the top 5 per cent of Scouts in Australia, so it's a particularly great achievement by these young people. Deputy Speaker, I take this opportunity to congratulate Scouts Australia, Girls Eyes Australia and the World Organisation of the Scout Movement for continuing to provide an outlet for children to channel their desire for adventure, education and fun and for providing ongoing assistance around our communities. Dib, 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 dob, dob, dob. I thank, the member, I thank the member for lines. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the member for Herbert. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to, I want to start by apologising and apologising uh, to the House for not being appropriately dressed. I haven't got my scarf on, and to talk about uh, a very important issue today. Uh, I, I am a bit upset, but I, I'm sure the member for Lyons also regrets not having his scarf on as well. Local, local community groups and associations are the foundation of our society. As members of parliament, we regularly have the opportunity and privilege to be invited to be members of these groups or visit them to see, and how, to see how and why and what they do. Two such groups are the Scouts and Girl Guides. Just over a week ago, I had the honour to be invited to the Kerwin Scout Group to be, as they call, scarfed up. <laughs> this was my first experience at a scout meeting. After being greeted by my host, I was escorted uh, to a parade to see 30 or a little bit more young men and women standing proudly at attention around a campfire in their flagpole. The parade was led by one of their peers who called on various leaders to address the meeting and keep everyone up to date on what was going on. Soon it was my turn to be called upon to be scarfed up. I was humbled to receive this honour on behalf of the community I serve. I was welcomed into the Kerwin Scout family and issued an open invitation to attend any of their meetings and activities in the future, something I'm very grateful and looking forward to. I was also presented with a Scout name. I have a call sign. It's Goanna. I'm pretty happy and excited about this, uh, th this uh, call sign that I've been given because we know it's also uh, a, a very prominent animal in the north. So I was very happy and I, I told my wife and she thought it was hilarious. She thought I should be named Koala Bear. <laughs> but um, to, to her shame, no wombat's taken, wombat's already taken. But uh, to her, uh, to, for her being upset, I think Goanna's a good name. And now I... Uh, have my two-year-old daughter calling me Goanna. But there was one more job to do, and that was, as the newest member of this community, to add a log into the fire. The ashes from this log would be used next week, the week after, into the future and years to come, in a tradition that symbolises the community of the group being a part of something that was bigger than any individual or person or group of people. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Kerwin Scout Group for welcoming me into their hearts. I was struck by their sense of service and their sense of community. These young men and women and their parents were a part of this movement to grow and develop not only their own skills and character, but those of their scouting mates and help others in the community. One of those lessons was being taught within minutes after being scarfed up was the very important ability to cook a pizza over a fire. Scouts and girl guides are critical for our local communities because they encourage young men and women to seek out adventure and pursue their own dreams. It gives them an opportunity to develop life skills and drives their sense of curiosity in a safe and rewarding environment. One of the leaders at the Kerwin Group is a senior local police sergeant. Someone who has an extremely busy and important job, but an example of the kind of person who donates their spare time and energy to ensure their students have opportunities. He knows that more kids that he mentors, the better his community will be in the future. 
So that's why I'm very happy to speak in support of this motion today. Scouts and Girl Guides across Australia have a membership of over 70,000. Worldwide, this number exceeds 40 million. I know that this year has been a difficult one for Scouts and Girl Guides, as it has been for so many other community groups. One of those things have been affected by COVID-19 are the regular fundraisers, including the famous cookie drives. So there have been a lot of loss, a lot there has, sorry. So there has been that loss of regular income to keep the all important programs running. But as restrictions ease and we start to get back to normality, I'd like to see more fundraisers from these groups continue to thrive. Or going down to the local Bunnings, picking up a sausage, raising money for these groups, because they're so important for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Herbert. The question is the motion be agreed to, and I give the call to the Member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I want to give a big shout out to all our Scouts and Guides groups on the New South Wales South Coast. Wherever I go, I'm always thrilled and amazed to see Scouts and Guides out playing their part in the community helping people in our community and giving back to others, and importantly, learning lifelong skills and making lifelong friends. These young people are our future, and the skills and experience they obtain with the Scouts and Guides will no doubt stay with them for life. I want to thank the many leaders that take the time to lead Scouts and Guides in my local community. It is a time-consuming role, but one that I can clearly see provides so much enjoyment for leaders in helping guide our young people. Deputy Speaker, a while ago I attended a local Remembrance Day service for St George's Basin RSL sub-branch. Afterwards, we went to the Scout Hall and had morning tea. I was delighted to see the first St George's Basin Scout Group and their families out in action, uh, providing tea, coffee and slices, but more importantly, bridging the gap between our veterans and learning from them. These activities might seem simple, but they are so important in today's world. Well done to all the Scouts who were involved. Deputy Speaker, I've also had the pleasure of delivering a new flag to the North Nara Girl Guides. But apart from delivering the flag, I got an eye-opener into the extremely busy and well-coordinated junior programs running. The guides welcomed me with open arms and I was delighted to join with them. What struck me was the passion the guides showed with their careful thought-out activities, including groovy scientific experiments, spinning wheels and much more. Thanks for having me. Deputy Speaker, when I attended the Illawarra Rose Festival held in Jamboree, I was taken with the first Jamboree Scout Group. They were diligently providing the hospitality, preparing morning and afternoon tea, and expertly taking orders and delivering the tea and food with a smile. These young scouts were learning valuable skills, all under the watchful eye of their leaders. Well done to them all. Deputy Speaker, when I go to my local Relay for Life events, I always see our local scouts groups out there raising awareness about cancer prevention, fundraising to support cancer patients, providing support and, importantly, having a lot of fun dressing up, participating in fun events and, of course, walking, walking laps through the night. They, of course, have their tents and they are pretty good campers. All for a good cause and fabulous to, to see young kids getting so involved from such a young age. Deputy Speaker, the New South Wales South Coast was hit hard during the bushfires, but our local scout and guides groups rose to the challenge of supporting their community. The first Batemans Bay Scout Group were very busy with their fire recovery community service projects, including making wildlife feeding boxes and collecting donations. They were making new signs for the Australian Rainbow Vets and Allies Mardi Gras Market Day as they lost all their decorations and signs in the recent fires. And then on Australia Day this year, the inaugural First Batemans Bay Scout Group versus the Emergency Services Day Tug of War Challenge was held and a great day was had by all. An important event which really highlights the community coming together and the importance of groups like Scouts and our emergency services working together. So special and another amazing example of how our community has pulled together through these tough times. 
Deputy Speaker, that's the sort of passion we should be proud of. And I say a huge thank you to all our scouts and guides and their leaders for all you do. I want to recognise those groups today. It's a bit of a long list. Um, but in scouts, the first St George's Basin Scout Group, the first Nowra Scout Group, the first Bomaderry Scout Group, the first Kangaroo Valley Scout Group, the first Barul Aladulla Scout Group, the first Illaroo Illaru Scout Group, the Shoalhaven Rover Crew, the first Jamboree Scout Group, the first Kayama Scout Group, the first Batemans Bay Scout Group, and the first Maruya Scout Group. And in Girl Guides, the Huskisson Bay Guides, the Huskisson Bay Ranger Guides, the Huskisson Gumnut Guides, the Huskisson Junior Guides, the Kayama Flame Tree Guides, the Kayama Seashells Junior Guides, the North Nowra Guides, the North Nowra Junior Guides, the North Nowra Pre-Junior Guides, the Nowra Guides, the Nowra Junior Guides, the Sussex Inlet Black Swan Guides, the Maruya Swan Girl Guides. Thank you to all our scouts, guides and leaders. You are absolute champions. I thank the member for that. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the member for Longman for his motion and I would also like to note my appreciation and support for Scouts and Girl Guides associations across Australia, but particularly within my electorate of Boothby. These wonderful groups provide young girls and boys, young men and women with a range of life skills while participating in supporting their local communities as active volunteers. We know the past year has had a big impact on Scouts and Guides activities as restrictions imposed on community groups have prevented many of the typical activities they would usually undertake, like fundraising, for example, and helping out in our local communities, but they have managed to continue a lot of activities by getting creative through online meetings. In Boothby, our scout groups include the Second Adelaide Scout Group, which is based in Mitcham, the Ascot Park Scout Group, Belair Scout Group, the Black Forest Scout Group, the Blackwood Scout Group, the Darlington Scout Group, the Eden Hill Scout Group, the Hawthorne Scout Group, and the Somerton Park Sea Scout Group. Along with our Girl Guides groups at the Belair Girl Guides, Colonel Light Gardens Guides and Dover Girl Guides. I have had a wonderful relationship with my scouts and guides as their federal MP over the years, visiting them during their meetings, attending significant anniversaries to help them celebrate and helping them to secure funding for important upgrades. Last year, for example, I was very fortunate to attend the 110th birthday of the second Adelaide Scout Group in Mitcham, which I'm proud to note is the oldest continuously operating scout group in South Australia. The celebrations were attended by the Chief Commissioner of SA Scouts, Harry Long, Scout Group Leader Natalie Stewart, who celebrated 10 years in the role, Committee Chairman Andrew Hill, Scout Leader David Laylaw, and the MC for the day and local scouting legend Alex Brown, who spoke beautifully about the confidence and the skills that scouting provides to young people. A large number of current and former scouts and special guests also helped us to celebrate this wonderful milestone. The occasion was marked with the presentation of artefacts for storage in a brand new time capsule, as well as some wonderful singing led by the Joey Scouts. Over my time in Parliament, I've also spent a lot of time with the Belair Girl Guides. Their leader, Jan Childs, is one of our most dedicated community volunteers, and she has worked tirelessly to empower and teach young girls and young women the, a range of skills and what it is to be a true community volunteer. Jan had been working for many, many years to secure funding to upgrade their kitchen, which was originally built in the 1950s. I was delighted to help secure a grant for the Belair Girl Guides to finally upgrade the kitchen, and I was really excited to recently visit them to see their wonderful new facilities that supported a range of local tradies during this the most difficult of years. I was also delighted to be able to secure a grant for the Eden Hills Scout Group at Carinia Reserve. In 2019, the federal government committed to helping to fund uh, the Eden Hills Scout Group to construct a brand new hall, which I think is probably about the same, the existing hall is about the same age as the uh, Belair Girl Guides kitchen was. 
Through the new development, group leader Jeff Wheaton, his leaders and their members will finally have a functional hall, which is long overdue given its age and its range of challenges, which include the fact the hall is springing leaks. It requires new flooring and wiring, and it is worse for wear following years battling white ants. The new hall will have a range of features, including a new kitchen, sufficient storage for the group's outdoor equipment and camping gear, including undercover storage for their trailers on site. This will provide the Eden Hills Scout Group with the ability for their members to pre-pack for camps on site as part of their program. I know that this particular feature, uh, Jeff and his team are so excited about because at the moment their trailers are stored outdoors uh, around the community on the property of some very generous parents. So the new hall will also provide the group with increased flexibility uh, with a range of new activity spaces and will also mean that other community groups can use this fabulous uh, new community asset. The federal government has also assisted the Darlington Scout Group to secure a grant to assist with replacing and levelling their flooring to provide a much safer experience for the Scouts. They have also been able to line and insulate their roof which will make all of their members more comfortable no matter the weather. And we've just had a few uh, days of 40 degrees already in Adelaide, so I'm sure they will appreciate that this year. I wish I had time to mention every single Scout and Girl Guides group in my area, but in closing, I want to thank them and congratulate them for all they do, especially in this most difficult of years, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for Boothby. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today I'd like to recognise the incredible work of the many young people involved and adults involved in Scouts and Girl Guides across Indi. Indi is home to 16 Scouts and 11 Girl Guides groups stretching from Ye to the Indigo Valley to Coriong. These form a part of the 17,000 youth members and 5,000 adult volunteers involved in scouting programs across Victoria, and they form part of an even larger story. Girl Guides Victoria is connected to more than 10 million members in over 150 countries. Over 500 million people worldwide have participated in scouting programs, and more than a billion people have been through the global scouting movement in the last 110 years. Scouts has stood the test of time in part because it speaks to the universal values that are as relevant today as they were a century ago. Scouts Australia is about supporting individuals to develop a sense of personal identity and self-worth. The belief that young people are able and willing to take responsibility and contribute to society and the importance of mutual support and help between members of a community to maximise quality of life for all. Girl Guides, the sister organisation of Scouts, also has lessons relevant for all young women in today's world. Back in 1909, at the formation of what was then the Boy Scouts, a small group of girls insisted that they wanted to be Scouts too. At the time, the idea of girls getting their hands dirty in outdoor activities like camping and hiking was seen as radical, a bit like a woman joining Parliament, Mr Deputy Speaker. According to the Girl Guide's official history, the idea was denounced as mischievous new development, a foolish and pernicious movement and an idiotic sport. But those girls won, and in 1910, the Girl Guides was established. Today, it is one of the largest all-female organisations in the world. Girl Guides is about building confidence, self-reliance, team building and leadership. And I think all of us, men and women, boys and girls, can take inspiration from that early example of the first Girl Guides. I know that this year has been a tough one for all the scouting groups in Victoria. Because of the restrictions, there were no in-person guiding activities during Term 2 and 3, and only now are groups able to start meeting again in small gatherings and tentatively planning for a better 2021. I'd also like to take this opportunity to celebrate the recently completed upgrade of the Baron Duda Memorial Hall, home to the first Baron Duda Scouts group. Group leader Brendan Greaves leads a vibrant group of young people in the fast-growing Baron Duda area near Wodonga. The upgraded hall, originally built in 1955, now has new insulation, new floors, two office spaces, a kitchen and bathrooms. And importantly, Mr Deputy Speaker, the upgrade also includes accessibility improvements with a disabled shower, toilet and a ramp going out the front of the hall. I wish the first Baron Duda Scouts group all the best for a much brighter 2021 in their new facility, and I look forward to visiting you all there. 
And I congratulate all young people involved in Scouts and Guides right across Indi. The skills you develop, the lessons you learn through scouting will stay with you for a lifetime. And there is no better way to get out and enjoy the beautiful setting of North East Victoria than to get out with your Scout or Girl Guides group and have a camp. Best of luck. And now that we can start to meet face to face again, I look forward to getting out there and visiting you right across Indi into the new year. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the, uh, thank you for that contribution. The, there being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. I'll call the clerk. The private member's business notice number eight, motion relating to the Australian Federal Integrity Commission bill. Give the call to the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to the Australian Federal Integrity Commission bill in the terms at which it appears on the notice paper. Um, you have the call? Yep. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Parliamentary debate on integrity always hits a nerve. If you witnessed the matter of public importance debate on integrity this House held some months ago, you would know how swiftly rhetoric-driven debates descend into unconstructive name-calling and insinuation. The spirit of this motion is different. I want to thank those speaking to this motion from the government side in advance for their resolve to have this debate in a respectful manner. The member for Goldstein, the member for Bass, the member for Benelong and other members on the government side who also wish to speak but could not secure a slot. I thank the member for Benelong in particular for his leadership of the Menzies Corwell Club who met to discuss the merits of a robust Federal Integrity Commission and how to carve a path forward for that vision. This motion reflects the collaborative ethos that defines my politic as an independent member of the crossbench. This is how we write legislation, we, how we can all get behind, without ambushing one another or negotiating concessions in secret. The Bring On Debate campaign that started in my electorate of Indi is calling on Parliament to debate the Australian Federal Integrity Commission bill I introduced last month. Two weeks ago, I met with the Attorney-General in his capacity as Leader of the House to ask him to allow debate, but he refused. There are many MPs on both sides of the House who are still committed to that debate. It's actually quite clear what most MPs are looking for in an integrity bill. Broad jurisdiction that covers criminal and non-criminal corruption. Common rules for all, with no exceptionalism for MPs and their staff. Strong investigative powers and procedural fairness safeguards. The ability to hold public in hearings when in the public interest public referrals and powers to self-initiate investigations, strong whistleblower protections, adequate and secure ongoing funding and oversight by a parliamentary committee and independent inspector. These principles, which are embedded in the AFIC bill, are not new. The Senate has agreed to these principles. MPs from across the House have come to meet with me to support these principles through the Beechworth principles process I've run since February this year. The Australian Federal Police Association support these principles. The National Integrity Committee of former judges from the High Court, Federal Court and Supreme Court across the nation support these principles. Transparency International Australia support these principles. I could spend the five minute allocation listing the supporters, Mr Deputy Speaker. Just this morning, Professor AJ Brown launched Australia's second National Integrity System Assessment which classifies the public hearing provisions in the AFIC bill as best practice. Those who have read the AFIC bill closely and compared it to the state ICACs know that the AFIC bill builds on and improves lessons learnt in the states. Those MPs who worked with me to draft the AFIC bill know that treating AFIC the same as any state ICAC model is a total mischaracterisation. AFIC is focused on safeguards and protecting the public interest. It has special provisions to ensure personal reputations are not needlessly tarnished, including the right to request a private hearing. It includes special provisions for persons who are exonerated following an investigation. It includes protections against vexatious and frivolous claims, and it includes protections for those who are unknowingly caught up in corruption scandals or forced to act beyond their will, such as junior staffers and frontline staff. 
AFIC is a carefully crafted bill. Findings from the National Integrity Assessment released this morning show that Australians increasingly view corruption as a major problem, rising from 61% in 2018 to 66% in 2020. The proportion of those who believe the federal government is handling corruption issues very badly also has risen from 15% to 19.4% in the same time period. And over 80% of Australians want a robust in Federal Integrity Commission now as a matter of urgency. Through bushfires, coronavirus and border closures, the people of Indi continued to implore me to pursue the AFIC bill and a better culture of integrity in federal politics. I will continue to heed their call and I look forward to hearing from other members today whose constituents implore them to do the same. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, do we have a seconder for the motion? Uh, thank you. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Deputy Speaker, for uh, pronouncing the word Goldstein correctly. And this may seem pedantry, but it's actually incredibly important. The electorate of Goldstein is named after a suffragette, Vida Goldstein, and I can say with absolute confidence that's how her name is pronounced because in my research for my first speech, I actually found an article from 1904 where she not only articulated how to pronounce her first name correctly, but more critically how frustrated she was when people did not, which is why I've taken upon myself to always correct people in doing so, sometimes probably to my own detriment. But I would have thought that for fighting for the rights of women to vote, to buy property, to enter marriage on the same terms as men, particularly amongst all members, I would hope all members of this parliament, uh, that uh, they would take heed um, as part of the celebration of the historical figures of our great nation. Now, we need to start this debate, Deputy Speaker, by acknowledging I would hope, I would certainly hope, that every member of this chamber and, of course, in the Senate as well, opposes corruption. The purpose for which we get elected to this parliament should be categorically to stand up to advance the interests of the people of Australia. We will have our difference of opinion about what the best interest and the national interest is, but that is not for the objective of personal gain. It is not for the objective of achieving some sort of untoward end that isn't befalling on the public interest. But we need to make sure that the framework of oversight around making sure that when people are stepping over the line or doing, the, uh, doing wrong is appropriate and proportionate so that it catches out wrongdoing and sadly and unfortunately isn't what unfortunately has occurred often at a state level of neither pursuing legitimate issues, and I talk particularly about the case of New South Wales, or more critically, uh, that doesn't become a pathway for show trials and the use of um, corruption bodies to engage in public prosecutions for which people have limited recourse. And we all saw this recently where I think it's one of the most disgraceful public acts I have ever seen. A New South Wales Premier, who was a witness, who was not a person of investigation or interest, was dragged in through a public uh, trial. Sorry, Speaker, there's a Deputy Speaker, there's a fly flying around. Uh, the, uh, it was taken and drawn between, uh, before um, an, an anti-corruption hearing and their personal lives were used effectively as a political weapon. I think it is disgraceful. If there is corruption, there should be an investigation. But when the police conduct a corruption invest or an investigation of criminal behaviour, they don't do so in the full public square because they need to build a case. And what happens with anti-corruption bodies is they should build that case. And if there is one, it is entirely legitimate and reasonable to have it referred to a, uh, to a public prosecutor. And should they do so, then the matter if a case is brought, goes to court where there is a proper trial. But to do investigations as the basis of a public um, debate uh, simply seeks to tarnish people's reputations without any justification. And we know specifically with the conduct of the shadow attorney general and how whenever anybody does anything in this place and he disagrees with it, they refer, he refers people off to the Australian Federal Police he has a pad that is like a dodgy doctor issuing dodgy prescriptions. Oh, yeah. 
It's all he does whenever he wants to score a political point and is prepared to use any institution as a means of publicly prosecuting his argument. He's even referred me onto a case which was simply absurd and ridiculous if you'd thought about it for more than about 10 seconds. But it didn't stop him doing so because he sees these institutions as vehicles for political attack. And if you want an anti-corruption body that has integrity and has public confidence, you cannot provide a pathway where it can be used as a point of public attack. And that goes for any member in this chamber, it goes for any member in the other chamber, and it goes to the heart of whether you want to have a system of integrity. And I know the uh, uh, independent member for Indi wishes to have her bill debated, and she is more than entitled to make that argument about why that is the case. But at the same time, members of this chamber who were elected in this government went to the people of their electorates and said they would uh, debate and negotiate and support a piece of legislation brought forward by the government. So if they want us to break the trust we took to the people, we're not just breaking the trust, the relationship we had to the people at the last election, simply to indulge when the member did not get a number of members successfully elected okay. with her party. I thank the member. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise in support of this motion by the member for Indi, and in particular I would like to uh, use this time to talk about the Menzies Cornwall Club. Um, and that's very much championed, I know, by the member for Indi, but also the member for Benelong, who's also here today, and a number of other honourable members. And this club is about bringing together all sides of politics to talk about policy ideas uh, and not to regress into partisan point scoring. It's a club or a connection open for all, uh, and they meet every Tuesday lunchtime. Um, the name recognising the extraordinary friendship between two former members, two gentlemen, uh, the late uh, uh, Robert Menzies, uh, longest serving Prime Minister of Australia, uh, and the then Leader of the Opposition, Arthur Caldwell. Um, in September 2009, The Conversation, Michelle Grattan had a podcast with uh, the daughters of these two gentlemen, Heather Henderson, who knee Menzies, uh, and Dr Mary Elizabeth Caldwell. And uh, I would just urge anyone who is interested in politics to actually, it, it's free, find it, have a listen to it. it. It's really quite inspiring. The women shared personal stories uh, of, of their fathers uh, and, uh, and talked about that extraordinary friendship that those two gentlemen had. The women were honest and open and they acknowledged the friendship had its rough moments, such as during the Vietnam War, um, but it endured. And why did it endure? Well, because for one, they respected each other. Uh, they recognised the other person's point of view, while they may not have agreed to it, it was a legitimate alternative. Because politics was less about personality and it was more about policy and because uh, they were, we had an impartial and an objective public service that was able to give free and frank advice to them. Interestingly, uh, the daughters also remarked on the absence of political staffers who they think uh, were, were um, uh, perhaps uh, a little less helpful uh, as far as uh, supporting the connection between members of parliament in this place. And Caldwell and Menzies recognised the importance of empathy, knowledge and experience. Perhaps, Deputy Speaker, it was a gentler time. Um, perhaps it was a time when people were just more respectful of each other. Uh, but I know in my community, my community want to see politicians in this place work together. They hate the bickering. They hate watching question time. They hate the noise, the shouting and the performance. They want to see us work together for the good of the nation, and I think that's what Menzies and Caldwell wanted to see. My community, and I think that speaks for many communities in Australia, don't want to see political point scoring or factional games or the idea that we won't put something forward just because it's not done by the ruling party. They want to see this place used as what it should be used for, and that is the contest for great ideas and the contest for debate. And as someone who sits on the crossbench, who often sees herself as a bit like the Switzerland of the parliament, and I think um, that's probably a feeling most crossbenchers do, um, do uh, feel of themselves, we, we don't do tribal politics. 
And that means that we're open to talking to any member of parliament about good ideas because we are all here for the same people. We are all here. We all have the same employers. That is the people who elect us. And so I hope that this motion um, perhaps encourages some new members to come along to the Menzies Cornwall lunch, perhaps to reflect on those great gentlemen of times gone by, and um, perhaps to debate um, pieces of legislation, or at least let's have a really robust discussion about what a federal integrity commission should look like. And perhaps for us to be a little honest with each other around integrity in this place and how we lift ourselves up, how we lift each other up for this to be a better place, for us to be better representatives. So I commend the member for her motion uh, and uh, I look forward to continuing to uh, sit down at the table at the Menzies Cornwall lunch. Thank you. I thank the member of May for that. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Br uh, Bass. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A few weeks ago, I was fortunate to be invited by the Multicultural Society of Tasmania to discuss the role of the federal government and, more specifically, my role as the federal representative in our northern Tasmanian community. There were a lot of great questions asked. However, there was quite a focus on trust in government and trust in those elected to represent our constituents. Trust in government is paramount. There is no better example of this than what we have seen this year, with state and federal governments asking much of our communities in order to keep us all safe. We've asked for people to stay away from loved ones, put a halt on activities from sport to entertainment that bring joy to so many, and to take on the extra responsibility of homeschooling while also working all to keep our communities healthy. It was incredibly pleasing to see how communities did listen and trust the government's advice and adhered to these best practices, which has put our country in a situation that seems so different to what other Western countries are battling right now. We, as elected representatives, cannot take this trust for granted, and nor should we be above reproach. Like the member for Indi, I do believe that establishing a robust Federal Integrity Commission is essential to arresting the declining public trust in institutions and restoring Australians' faith in the democratic system. Our government is committed to establishing a Commonwealth Integrity Commission to enhance accountability across the public sector. Earlier this month, the government released an exposure draft of the legislation to establish the CIC for extensive public consultation. The draft legislation is the result of detailed planning to ensure that the new body has both the resources and powers it needs to investigate allegations of criminal corrupt conduct that could occur across the public sector. Proper and thorough consultation is essential to ensuring a robust commission. A thorough consultation process has been taken in the lead up to the draft legislation and the government has said it is committed to further national comprehensive consultation. As part of this, a series of consultation sessions is being arranged for the law enforcement and public sector groups that would be regulated under the legislation, as well as roundtable meetings with civil society representatives, academia and other stakeholder representatives from all states and territories. I welcome the member for Indi's contribution to this debate and I appreciate her putting forward such a comprehensive proposal. And it's important to point out that our government's proposed Integrity Commission has some broad consistency with many of the principles that inform the member for Indi's AFIC bill. Specifically, the CIC will be an independent statutory agency with broad jurisdiction over the federal public service and members of parliament and their staff. It'll have appropriate powers with the CIC to be given powers greater than those of a royal commission, and it will provide expert capability to investigate allegations of corruption within the public sector including conduct that's occurred before the establishment of the CIC. However, I do note that it does depart from the member for Indi's approach in some critical areas, including on the issues of retrospectivity, how corrupt conduct is defined, and on the issue of public hearings. And it's my hope that the government and the member for Indi can work together to find some common ground on these issues. As I mentioned to audience members at the Multicultural Society last week, Australia has a solid anti-corruption reputation and is consistently ranked by Transparency International as one of the least corrupt countries in the world, including in the most recent Corruption Perceptions Index, where we're ranked equal 12th with Canada, the UK and Austria. 
However, despite the trust shown in our government during a global pandemic, we must continue to be accountable and transparent as elected representatives. The draft legislation is a step in the right direction, but I look forward to reviewing the appropriate changes and updates after further consultation with key stakeholders in 2021. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for Bass for that. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Warringah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for Indi for putting this motion to the House. Consensus politics is vitally important to a functioning democracy. Yes, debate and disagreement are also part of it. But we need to get beyond political point storing, scoring and party divisions. Martin Luther King Jr. summed up the role of a leader well. He said a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a moulder of the consensus. The role of a leader is to recognise the issues that are important to the population and to the national interest and mould the consensus for the good of the nation. On so many issues and some of the most important of our times, we have seen bitterly divided politics for far too long and has driven stagnation on key issues which is not in the national interest. The issues of a Federal Integrity Commission and climate change are two of the primary examples where it's in the national interest to set a clear policy and take action. Over 80 per cent of Australians want clear policy direction and action on both of these issues, according to the Australian Institute. And given a free vote, I suggest that a majority of parliamentarians in this place would also like to vote for action on these issues. Yet party divisions and an inability or an unwillingness to achieve consensus have dragged our parliament into disrepute. We have not demonstrated leadership or an ability to mould the consensus. Time and again, it has been left to the crossbench to lead the charge on these important issues, to do the hard work, lead independent consultation, develop legislation and present it to the parliament for debate. The Australian Federal Integrity Bills present a strong and well-supported model for integrity. The need for this legislation was emphasised by the release of the Transparency International Australia's report just today on Australia's national integrity system, a blueprint for action. The report found that the corruption perception score for Australia has declined eight points since 2012. Correspondingly, in the last two years alone, the percentage of Australians who think corruption in government is, a, is, that a, quite, is a quite or very big problem has increased by 5 per cent to 66 per cent. That's a large proportion of the population that has a strong belief that there is corruption in our government. That's not been helped by the government's reaction to investigations, I suggest respectfully. Rather than increase transparency of grants, they've simply removed to the concept of merit from the criteria upon which grants are provided. Similarly, the creation of a national cabinet in the place of COAG has further obfuscated the discussions and agreements made between federal, state and territory governments. We see an increasing the veil of secrecy around government. We need to look, well, instead of increasing that secrecy, we need to look closely at the actions outlined in the blueprint to urgently address the issue of corruption and the absence of integrity in the country. Many of those actions are mirrored in the Australian Federal Integrity Commission legislation presented by the member for Indi and referenced in the motion. Similarly, the Climate Change National Framework for Adaptation and Mitigation Bill presents a proven model for addressing the challenges of climate change, having been implemented in the UK, in New Zealand and now tabled in Canada. This bill is up for inquiry by the House Committee for Environment and Energy, and submissions are numerous and continue. My intent for this inquiry is an opportunity to build consensus around the need to have sensible legislation on climate change. It's well past due. These bills, climate change bill, the AFIC bills, they're aimed at bringing the parliament together around non-partisan platform to address some of the most important challenges that we face today. The strength of the crossbench is that it lies in between the two major parties. I agree with the member for Mayo that it often feels like Switzerland. We can be the consensus builders. We listen to our constituents and to the Australian public more broadly and bring to the fore the issues that they care about most. We work with both sides to lead and shape a consensus. We do the hard yards to garner support and consult with the community. While the government may be hesitant to adopt the exact legislation tabled by those of us on the crossbench, 
The consensus that we are able to build smooths the way for similar legislation to be implemented shortly thereafter. The pressure built by crossbenchers on these key issues of national importance is key to shaping consensus on significant issues and driving change. As, as a member of the crossbench, it's really important for the Prime Minister and the government to work with all members of parliament to ensure that leadership and government is on behalf of all Australians to shape the con con consensus in the best interest of the nation. I thank the member for Ringa for that contribution. I call, uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Benelong. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the member for Indi for bringing forward this important and time-sensitive debate. You'll notice that I'm very close to the centre where common sense dwells. I'd like to thank the member for bringing forward this debate in the name of Menzies Caldwell Group. For the uninitiated, the Menzies Caldwell Group is a group of MPs who meet for lunch on Tuesdays to discuss in an open and bipartisan manner. We take our name from and uh, tradition from the group's namesakes when they were Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition, respectively and respectfully. Every Friday, they would meet for lunch to discuss the affairs of the day to ensure that the two parties could walk, work well together. They would listen to each other with respect and they would set politics aside. We'll be meeting again tomorrow in the members' dining room and all MPs and senators are welcome and encouraged to attend on the condition that politics is left at the door. Politics is forbidden in the Menzies Corwell Group, but policy most certainly is not. We want to develop ideas, not just to exercise our debating skills for the betterment of our communities and all of Australia. When meeting in the name of friendship and colleagues, regardless of party or even if you don't have a party, bipartisanship integrity is the virtue we all hold dear and integrity in parliament is something we all want to and need to improve upon. Polls always show that politics, that the faith in politics and its institutions, but especially politics, is at an all-time low. Dwindling majorities for the main parties and the growth of minor parties demonstrate how people are turning their back on politics as it has been. They are turned off by the way we engage with each other and through the game of politics rarely make good progress. It is a stinging message that we all should hear. And of course, it's not just politicians who need to be checked in on. One hat I wear is the chair of the Standing Committee on Infrastructure, Transport and Cities. And as such, the behaviour of public officials at Western Sydney Airport has come up before my recent inquiry. We have seen much about this on the news recently, but there is a broader undercurrent of fortunate speculators pocketing huge sums of taxpayer funds on the back of government infrastructure. There is a great need for a commission in the infrastructure planning space, and I'll be talking about that very soon. I'm not a lawyer, but while I'm very familiar with courts, I prefer the outdoor type with a bat and a ball. But there is no doubt that such an organisation is necessary for the proper functioning of government. There are, of course, two integrity commissions in the mix right now. One, of course, today we're discussing is the Beechworth principles. And as we all know, the government has invested time in putting forward its own version of the CIC. The government's proposed CIC bill is similarly directed towards the objectives of Dr. Haynes that Dr. Haynes has identified, an independent, effective anti-corruption body with wide powers to properly investigate all complaints. The latter is going out to consideration where it will be examined by legal minds far greater than mine. This consultation will be critically important for a bill of this nature, where the broadest considerations must be listened to to ensure that any commission that is set up is fit for purpose and does not create any unexpected results. And critically, I would like to call on the government to listen closely to the results of the consultation. This must be an open, transparent and purposeful inquiry, a show consultation where the government's suggestions were, 
where the government suggestions were rubber stamped and only recommendations were and only recommendations were swept under the carpet would not only be counterproductive, they would be the embodiment of the problem that this sort of commission is trying to combat. Before I finish, I would like to congratulate the member for Indi uh, for her incredible work on this commission, the effort to put together the foundations of an integrity commission at the same time as being an independent MP without the resources of a major party is an incredible feat. And I congratulate you on the impressive fruits of your labours. This debate is important and must be open. I thank everyone for being part of this conversation and hope that by working together in the spirit of Menzies and Caldwell, we will soon have an integrity commission that is fit for purpose. I thank the member for being along for that. Um, the question is, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, there being no further speakers on this motion, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. And I call the clerk. Private members' business, notice number nine, motion on COVID-19 and Victoria. Uh, the member for Mallee has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to COVID-19 and Victoria in terms in which it appears on the notice paper. Today I rise to present my private member's motion on an issue that must be spoken about in order that it never happens again. COVID-19 has unveiled a sleeping giant that has surprised and horrified many of us. The power of the states to control and determine the activities of its citizens in ways not experienced before in Australia's history. All this in an 82,000 square kilometre region where there were zero or a handful of cases for eight months. My electorate of Mali. Border closures have caused extreme levels of disadvantage and suffering for families, businesses, communities and our economy. Situated in the northwest of Victoria, Mallee is bordered by both South Australia and New South Wales. This unique location meant that three premiers imposed restraint on the lives of those locals, from farmers in Wichiproof, school kids in Payangle, patients in Mildura, businesses in Murrayville, families in Caniva and everyone in between. The people of Mallee have shared with me countless stories of hardship, frustration and grief. In September, I sent an electorate-wide email to check in on Mallee locals and request their feedback, to which I received over 700 responses. Only one in 10 people supported the state government's restrictions. Agricultural workers and businesses were hit hard. Daniel Berlin from Murrayville is heavily reliant on access to Pinaroo in South Australia for his farming business. He brings 80% of his produce into, into South Australia in the form of cereal grains. Coming off the worst drought in decades, the border closures were yet another strain for dryland farmers like Daniel. While farmers and businesses suffered and kids couldn't go to school, Mallee residents contended with severely restricted access to health care. Put simply, when weighing up the impact of border closures against risk of transmission, this basic human right was unjustifiably limited for Mallee locals. Hundreds and hundreds of patients in Mildura, who would normally rely on visiting medical officers from Adelaide, have suffered intensely. Several specialists would normally visit Mildura regularly, including surgeons, dentists, ophthalmologists, radiographers. But they have not visited the region for eight months because the South Australian government would not grant them leave to visit Victoria and return to Adelaide without quarantining. Not good for business. During the pandemic, I had the pleasure to meet and represent John and Jeanette Fader from Lillymoor. I worked closely with John and Jeanette to fight for them to access South Australia for John's cancer treatments. I'm very sad to say that John recently passed away from his illness. It tears me apart to know that the last few months of John's life were made vastly more difficult because of border closures. I wanted to take this opportunity to honour John his life and his memory and the strength he displayed throughout this ordeal. There have been many inspirational stories of leadership shown by Mallee locals throughout this difficult period. Di Thornton is a nurse practitioner from Murrayville throughout, uh, who owns and operates Mallee Border Health Centre in Pinaroo in South Australia. She was forced to close her clinic 
when the border restrictions began and she and her staff were unable to cross to South Australia. I've worked closely with Di to assist countless people with applications to get across the border for health care. The fact is, access to health care should never be this difficult. As a modern nation, we can't allow this type of response to occur again. It is un-Australian. This month, the Commonwealth and all state and territory governments, except Western Australia, agreed to a framework for national reopening that included an agreement on proportionate measures for controlling outbreaks, effective testing, contact tracing, and targeted hotspot controls. They agreed the removal of domestic border restrictions is a key pillar to support COVID normal Australia. Merely days after this agreement, several premiers reinstated border restrictions against South Australia. The, the hypocrisy is laughable if it were not so serious. Until a vaccine arrives and is distributed, we cannot continue this type of reactive response. Border restrictions are unduly impacting regional communities. The mantra, we're all in this together, is a joke in cross-border communities who feel expendable and left behind by state premiers. I will continue to advocate for change in the hope that we can prevent this kind of devastation being wrought on cross-border communities again. Uh, do we have a seconder for the speech? Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I first want to acknowledge the member for Mallee for her advocacy for her community during the border crisis and for bringing this motion to the House. Together, we had over 25 meetings with the New South Wales Border Commissioner, and I'm sure she had them with the South Australian Border Commissioner on top of that. And we share the belief that we need scientific foundations for policies that cause this level of harm or we don't have them at all. One week ago today, I stood on the bridge that links Albury and Wodonga over the Murray River. Gone with the police, gone with the ADF, gone with the bollards, the concrete dividers, the tents and the floodlights that comprise the border checkpoint for 138 long days and long nights. At 12.01 a.m. that morning, the border opened up again. Cars streamed across as DJ Steve Bowen, a fixture at hundreds of local weddings and formals, provided the backing track to this historic moment. Along the Murray, the border communities of Korowa and Wagunya, Jinjalik and Walwa, and many others were quietly reunited. And hours later, peak traffic returned to normal with thousands of commuters crossing the border unimpeded for the first time in months. In my electorate, we are experiencing a moment of cautious pride. In this moment, it's tempting to forget what we've just been through. But the border closure has been a deeply traumatic experience, as the member for Mellie has just recounted. For many, it rivals the impacts of bushfires that devastated my community just six months before. And my office has dealt with over 700 individual constituent concerns about the border closure, each with their own story of heartbreak, despair, frustration or confusion. The sudden announcement of the hard border closure on the 6th of July and the chaos in the week that followed was only a taste of what was to come. The mayors of local councils were not consulted, nor were schools, healthcare, construction, agriculture or the business sector. Decades of work to bring the region together was wiped away in the stroke of a pen. The long-awaited signing of the Albury-Wodonga regional deal, known as two cities, one community, scheduled just days after the border closed, was changed so it happened without fanfare. And the irony was lost on no one. An agreement on border closures was on the agenda for the National Cabinet. Time and time again, we both called for it. Each meeting, ended without one. There was no protocol, there was no plan, applications for exemptions piled up, and while we waited, jobs were lost, family members got sick, and some of them, Mr Deputy Speaker, died alone. Sensible solutions were proposed by the community. Move the border north of Albury so it doesn't split us in two. Bring whole communities into the border zone. Introduce a daily life permit but progress was slow and often too late. In the framework for the national reopening, as the member just, uh, just described, a key principle is that response measures and decisions should be proportionate to the risk 
of harm and transmission. Now, as a nurse and a rural public health researcher with a degree in public health, I am the first to support public health measures. I've been doing so all the way through this pandemic. But I find myself asking, was this border closure proportionate to the problem at hand? Was the crippling economic cost and human toll worth it? Once established, the so-called ring of steel kept the virus contained in Melbourne and only two cases were reported in my border communities in the second wave. So under these circumstances, I find myself struggling to say, yes, it was proportionate. Yes, it was worth it. I don't think so. We need to learn the lessons of this experience and understand what can be done better should the borders, God help us, close again. I'm pleased this will be examined by the New South Wales Government, who will conduct a review of the border closure response. But in the interests of transparency, this must be public so that border communities on both sides can participate and the findings and recommendations must be published. Victorians also wore the cost of border closure, but did so without New South Wales Government support and their voices deserve to be heard. For those who work daily within the two jurisdictions, we need to learn valuable lessons in the areas of health, education, agriculture and farming and emergency services. And of course, I share the New South Wales Premier's hope that this is the last time in our lifetime that the border is closed. But until we have a vaccine, the threat remains. I commend the work of the border commissioners. I commend the work of the electorate officers in my office and right across the border and the MPs I worked with, including the member for, uh, for Mallee. And I thank the community who brought the, wore the brunt of so much anguish. We must do better if this is ever to happen again. Thank the member for Hendai for that. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Menzies. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I too rise to speak on the motion uh, moved by the honourable member for Mallee. And I note that, amongst other things, it recognises that metropolitan and regional Victorians continue to face significant limitations on their freedoms due to COVID-19 restrictions, uh, commiserates with business owners that have been forced to shut their doors, notes that many businesses will not survive continued lockdowns, and calls on the Victorian government to give their uh, Victorians their freedom back. And it's some aspects of that part of the motion that I wish to address um, tonight. At the outset, can I say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I welcome the report that there are now no active COVID-19 cases in Victoria and there have been no new locally acquired cases for 30 consecutive days. Yeah. And this has enabled the Victorian Government to announce further easing of restrictions uh, on the 8th of November, uh, following the initial period of no locally acquired uh, infections at the end of October. So 30 days with uh, no new reported cases. Following a peak of cases in early uh, August, 685 cases on the 4th of August, case numbers in Victoria have declined steadily uh, with no new acquired cases. And despite low case numbers, the daily average number of tests conducted in Victoria has remained relatively high at approximately 14,000 tests per day, with an increase through early November in response to the South Australian outbreak. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a tribute to the people of Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, the people of Victoria have acted overwhelmingly in a responsible manner in relation to this. Yes, there's been some idiots who have done things which nobody supports, but overwhelmingly the people of Victoria have showed common sense and done what is needed to be done. Um, but there's a cost for this, and that's what the motion in part goes to. And that cost in particular is the economic cost affecting businesses and individuals in their jobs, but also the health cost and particularly the mental health cost that comes from this. I know from my own electorate and I suspect every member from Victoria and possibly from other parts of Australia know of businesses which have gone to the wall because of what's happened in the last few months. I know businesses that will not reopen after Christmas. They've been hanging on as best they can, but I know businesses that will not reopen in my electorate uh, and in that region of Victoria in metropolitan Melbourne that will not reopen. This has had a devastating impact on businesses, on jobs, on individuals. And part of that impact is therefore translated into the health effects. Uh, regrettably, I suspect, like many others, 
Um, I have had reports virtually every week from friends and associates that I know of somebody that they know who has committed suicide. That's the reality in terms of the depression and the desperation, and some of that is related to what I was talking to about earlier in terms of the impact this has had on jobs, on businesses, and therefore on families and communities. There is a real impact at this, and it's not over yet, unfortunately, Mr Deputy Speaker. So the measures which the government has taken, uh, the economic measures, the job keeper, the job seeker, those measures that have been taken have been important. They have been important in trying to keep people in jobs, but of course they'll come to an end at some stage and there's been some scaling back of that. So we're not out of the woods so far as this is concerned. And also the measures in relation to um, health, of putting more money into direct health supports, of enabling telehealth and things like that. These are all good measures that have been taken uh, over the last few months. But I want to conclude on this note, Mr Speaker, and that is that there were failures, and I'm not going to go through them tonight, but there were failures in terms of tracing, there were failures in terms of uh, quarantining, particularly in Victoria, in terms of tracing. We've only just got the QR uh, code uh, approach now where other states uh, have had. And we can't just forget these failures and say, oh, we've got to move on. We must learn from the lessons. And I think we need to ensure that in future, if there are responses, they are proportionate to the risks, that they are precise in their breadth and they are consistent in their application. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say that future policy responses should not pit one group of Australians against another. They should not pit people from metropolitan Melbourne against regional Victoria, or people from Victoria against people from New South Wales or South Australia or any other state for that matter. I can't imagine for the life of me that the framers of the Constitution who put section 92 in there in order to enable interstate trade freely would have been in favour of restrictions on movement unless it was very precise and for very good reasons. And we must learn from the, the lessons of what's happened in the last few months. I thank the member for Menzies for that wonderful contribution. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Ballarat, uh, Bendigo. Thank you, and I hope that you'll be as glowing as my comments as the previous speaker chair. It's always wonderful to know that we have an impartial chair that is chairing these sessions. I'm really disappointed that this motion has actually not been withdrawn, and I actually expected better from the member for Mallee. This motion is out of date. I accept that it was first tabled on the 26th of October, and things have changed in Victoria. It is also just a political attack. It only attacks the Victorian state government. Government. Nowhere in this motion does it attack the South Australian government or the New South Wales government who actually closed the borders to Victorians. It was the New South Wales government that closed the border to Victoria. It was the South Australian government that closed the border to Victoria. That's what created so many issues and heartbreak and hurt in border communities like Mildura and like Wodonga. You cannot put that on the Victorian government what the actions were of other state governments. With no help from the federal government, mind you, that didn't work. We heard both previous speakers from the government attack the Victorian Labor government for the lack of contract tracing. Well, what did the federal government's app do? It may have helped in 14 contacts. We were told by the Prime Minister, if you download the app, you'll be able to go to the pub. Didn't happen. We were told by the Prime Minister, if you download the app, borders will open. It didn't happen because the app didn't work. This motion doesn't acknowledge any fault on behalf of their own government or the lack of what they did. What their government did do was start to cut JobKeeper before our businesses had reopened. That is what has put people out of work. This government is winding back support before we're through the health crisis. If only this government actually did what the Victorian government did in their budget last week and announced massive investment, they will help every business, they will try and save every job that they can. But there's no mention of that in this motion. No, instead, it is just an attack on the Victorian government. It's an attack on people. And you know what I found? I'm a regional MP. 
The ring of steel was just below my electorate, and my people in my community were thankful for it. They were thankful because it was about um, controlling the virus where it was in Melbourne. And people in my electorate, overwhelmingly, they felt, they felt empathy for people in Melbourne. They felt sorry. They felt guilty. There was almost this guilt that we had that we still had life relatively normal. Our construction businesses did not close. Um, our hospitality were able to do takeaway in the peak. Yes, it was hard. Yes, we have lost jobs. But we have lost jobs in our electorate, in my electorate, because this government did not extend JobKeeper to the university sector. We have lost jobs in my electorate, not because of the Victorian shutdown for a health reason. We have lost jobs because this government did not extend JobKeeper to people who are here on a temporary work visa. We lost jobs in my electorate and all throughout Victoria because this government did not extend JobKeeper to people who are casuals. How dare people come here and put forward motions criticising a state government for responding to a health crisis that got Victoria through it? What was the alternative? They're not epidemiologists. What was the alternative? That we end up like the UK, that we end up like France, that we end up like the US? That's what happens when you don't have infection control in place. I acknowledge that it was tough, and I know that people in my community have done it tough, like every other Victorian. But most of them stand shoulder to shoulder with the outcome. We are now COVID free. We did it the hard way. We did it the it the long way, but we got there and now we're on the path to recovery. That is why it is disappointing that this motion was not withdrawn and replaced with a motion that recognised what Victorians did and the leadership of Dan Andrews and the Victorian government, because they did it against opposition with this government, this government who have refused to work with Dan Andrews, refused to work with the Victorian people, have not backed businesses. We've already lost jobs because they wouldn't extend JobKeeper once. Will they do it now? We will lose more jobs if they do not help sectors like the ARC sector, like the hospitality sector, like the university sector. How many more jobs do we have to lose before this government acts? Regional Victorians are backing in the Victorian plan. It's disappointing that the regional Liberal and National MPs in this place are not backing in the plan. Get behind regional Victorians. Get behind the plan. Support these businesses grow. Support them to recover. Give them back the job keeper until we are through this recession. Simple things this government can do. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I second the member for Mali's motion advocating for Victoria to fully reopen in a COVID safe manner. This means opening the doors of businesses, restoring the cherished freedom of Victorians, and ending the crippling uncertainty that has afflicted regional communities in our state, particularly in the border regions. In my electorate of Chisholm, I've witnessed the dire effects of the Andrews government's draconian lockdown measures. Small business has been given no respite or quarter. The same small business that is the lifeblood of our country and the communities within. The Victorian Labour Party has time and time again stood in the way of small businesses trying to survive this period. The Andrews government's response was extreme. It was an extreme solution designed to make up for their equally extreme mishandling of hotel quarantine. We wish the Victorian government had handled this crisis with the same care and competence that our neighbours in New South Wales did. But what is done is done. If it wasn't Victorian's fault, and I am so proud of the courage and perseverance displayed by Victorians in getting through the worst of the latest crisis. The epidemiological data for Victoria is now at the point where health experts believe it's safe to reopen our state fully, so long as we also stay COVID safe. The Victorian health system has recovered and built its capacity to deal with this pandemic. 
Because of the Victorian outbreak, many business owners have been forced to shut their doors. Sadly, many of those doors won't ever open again. It is to them that I'm talking to when I offer my commiserations. It is truly gut-wrenching to know that many small business owners have had to close the door permanently on their life's work. We will do whatever is in our power as a federal government to put Victorians back on their feet and to encourage all states to work together to avoid the border closures that have disappointed, disproportionately affected regional border communities. This coalition government will continue to act decisively in the nation's interest to help us to bounce back from the economic consequences of this disease. But it's not just the economic front that we are continuing to fight. We realize that this virus and the measures taken to combat it have caused significant issues in the space of mental health and general well-being. This is particularly the case in Victoria, where the outbreaks and lockdowns were so much more severe. So, we want to send a message loud and clear. Protecting the nation's interests necessitates protecting Victorian interests. That is why we have invested $29.6 million to establish 15 head to help clinics across regional and metropolitan Victoria. These clinics will operate free of charge and significantly boost the capacity of our existing mental health system over the next year. This means more accessibility and more help for Victorians who are needed. But some Victorians are still being left in the lurch by the current restrictions enforced by the Andrews government. Listen, a business in my electorate, Vogue Ballrooms, located in Burwood East, is still unable to operate. They have been continually forced to push backings back, bookings back, and can't get any peace of mind. For them, this lockdown hasn't eased, and they are still paying the penalty for Daniel Andrews of lockdown policy. My colleagues and I believe that it's time to unleash Victoria again, and that's why I firmly support the member for Mali's motion today. The time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for McNamara. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And reading this motion, reading this motion, I, I, I thought surely not. Surely this motion is going to be withdrawn now that Victoria is in the state in which it was. But perhaps the only conclusion I could draw that a motion talking about a Victorian lockdown that doesn't exist anymore was that it was sent in via Malcolm Turnbull's NBN. That could be the only reason as to why it took so long to get to this place and finally be debated. But if this pandemic has taught us anything, is that you don't play politics with a pandemic. You don't play politics with a pandemic, because if you do, it looks like what it does in the United States, where the political class and the political leadership is undermining health efforts, undermining the experts, undermining the efforts of those people trying to deal with this pandemic, and instead we are seeing the people of the United States resist the health measures that are designed to keep them safe. Don't play politics with a pandemic, which is exactly what this government has done. And you think, that, and this government, I'm sure, is very proud of their efforts over the time, picking on the Labor states and picking on Labor, um, Labor premiers. Well, it worked really well in the Northern Territory. It worked really well in the ACT and it worked really well in Queensland. Yeah, After great. their relentless attacks on Labor premiers, that went really well. Playing politics with a pandemic is really great stuff and I encourage you as a federal government to do that to Victoria because I can tell you one thing and that is Victorians are absolutely sick of it. They are absolutely sick of the Prime Minister lecturing Victoria about contact tracing after his excuse for contact tracing was to develop an app that they are only announcing today that they are starting from scratch. They are, Victorians are absolutely sick of a Prime Minister blaming Victorian Labor on the state of the economy in Victoria 
when they are the ones during stage four lockdown, during stage four lockdown, this government decided that instead of supporting Victorian businesses, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? They're going to reduce the JobKeeper supplement Shame. from 1,500 to 1,200. We couldn't even have family over for dinner. Childcare was shut down unless you were for a permitted worker. We were tackling a pandemic. We were at 725 cases on the 5th of August. 725 cases. A comparative state to the United Kingdom who are now tra tracking 20,000 cases. France, 50,000 cases a day. But instead, the Victorians and the Victorian people decided, no, that's not what, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to listen to the health advice. We're going to respect the experts. We're going to respect the scientists. And yes, we're going to respect the politicians who are trying to lead this Victorian pandemic and leave this, lead, the sec, lead us out of the second wave. And instead, at that very moment of need, at the very moment when Victorians needed their federal government, when Victorians needed the support from those opposite, what did we get? We got a $300 cut, a cut of support to businesses, to families, to mums and dads, and it hurt. Now, thankfully, Victoria is now in a place where we are not in lockdown. We are not in a position where we are counting hundreds and hundreds of cases a day. We are not in a position where our hospitals are being overrun. And it is because of the efforts of Victorians to listen to the health advice, to listen to the health experts, to listen to the Premier of Victoria, who each and every day admitted mistakes admitted mistakes. Front it wasn't perfect. He fronted up every day, 120 press conferences in a row. How many times has the Prime Minister stood up and said, you know what, that contact tracing app that I said was our ticket to freedom, that I said was our ticket out of lockdown, how many times the Prime Minister stood up and taken a press conference about that? How many times the Prime Minister stood up and said, you know what, that job keeper cut, the job seeker cut that I made during the middle of stage four lockdown, that was my fault. I apologise. Here's how we're going to fix it. Not once. Not once. So we won't be lectured to by these people over opposite, constantly undermining the health efforts, constantly undermining those people trying to get Victorian through a pandemic, constantly undermining the efforts of scientists and experts to keep people safe. Instead, they've got conspiracy theorists and playing political games only with Labor premiers. And the Victorians are sick of it. I know this. We know this in Victoria. But I would encourage those opposite, if you want to keep playing your petty political games, then go for it and you will face the repercussions, um, great repercussions at the next election. But Victorians did something remarkable. No thanks to those opposite. Thank you. Call the member for Dawson. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. I never thought I'd see the day in my own country, when human rights, freedoms and liberties of Australians Members would be swept left. away so ruthlessly as they have been under the guise of this pandemic. The most ruthless of all being the state of Victoria, where over the last six Members months people's left. basic yeah. rights have simply been crushed by force or by fines. A state government's desperate attempts to compensate for their own failings have seen our fellow Australians fall victim to heavy-handed, big brother-style law enforcement. We've seen police enter a family home and arrest a mother in front of her kids, her crime for posting on Facebook. People have been fined thousands of dollars for driving to work, for exercising, for travelling apparently too far to go and get food and essentials. We've watched a young woman being choked and forced to the ground by a Victorian policeman for not wearing a mask. It's clear the Victorian government has gone way too far. But the question is why? Why? Is the, virus, is the virus as bad as the mainstream media and the opportunistic politicians have told us it is, or is the cure worse than the disease? Well, let's look at the facts. In Australia, the median age of death from COVID-19 is 86. The average life expectancy in Australia is 82. If you're young and healthy, the chances of dying from coronavirus are very, very slim. It makes no sense to lock up healthy people when we can just protect those that actually need protection. Government enforced lockdowns such as those in Victoria will have severe effects on the health, the mental health 
and financial stability of many Australians. Now, the World Health Organisation has said, and I quote, lockdowns can have a profound negative impact on individuals, communities and societies. There is even doubt that they actually work at all. The American Institute for Economic Research compared global lockdown response with COVID-19 cases and deaths, and they found very little correlation. The Victorian government has mandated the use of masks, specifically recommending cloth masks as adequate protection from coronavirus. Well, the Australian Department of Health Infection Control Expert Group stated that the use of cloth masks is cloth face masks is almost completely ineffective and may even increase the likelihood of infection. Now, the Danmask 19 study, a randomised trial of 6,000 participants, found that there was no statistically significant difference between those who wore masks and those who did not when it came to being infected by COVID-19. While the efficacy of masks is questionable, the enforcement of mask wearing by law is detestable. Virus or no virus, people cannot and should not be forced to cover their face for fear of financial penalty or worse in a democratic society like Australia. It is simply a violation of individual freedom. It sickens me that we've gotten to a point where I have to stand here in this parliament and actually say that. When the virus first broke out, we expected the mortality rate would be much higher, much, much higher than it is now, particularly for people who are fit, healthy and under the age of 60. We thought it was going to be bad, and yet there are indications now that the mortality rate for COVID-19 overall is actually declining more than it is now. Even in countries where the transmission rate is actually increasing in Europe, the infection rate has risen significantly, but there hasn't been a matching increase in hospitalisation or deaths. The US study of COVID-19 tests in Detroit found that the viral load on swabs has decreased as the pandemic has progressed, correlating with a decrease in deaths. The UK built seven specialised hospitals for the purpose of dealing with a second wave of COVID-19 patients. Now, most of them are completely empty and some are now being repurposed. The fatality rate, fatality rate of COVID-19 in Australia is 0.4%. Now, that doesn't account for all of those who are asymptomatic and haven't been tested. According to the World Health Organisation, it's very rare for those that are asymptomatic to transmit the virus. A recent report published by the World Health Organisation stated 80% of cases of COVID-19 are mild or asymptomatic. Now, if that information is correct, why subject 100% of the population to draconian lockdowns and business-destroying restrictions when you could just recommend protections to older and vulnerable citizens and quarantine those who are actually showing COVID-19 symptoms? Now, there'll be calls of conspiracy theorists and all the rest, whatever have you. But if you tell me that a state government removing basic freedoms and liberties from law-abiding Australians by intimidation, fine or force is OK, then you are not Australian. Our Members, national anthem says, Australians all have a choice for we are young and free. What's free about this? The time allotted for the debate has expired. Or oh, sorry, there being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. I call the clerk. Private members' business, notice number 10, motion on expulsion of Hugh Mann from the House. I call the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move the motion relating to the expulsion of Hugh Mann from the House in the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. As the motion no, said, I call the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move the motion that has been circulated in my name, recognising the unjust expulsion of a member of this House and a century of injustice endorsed by, uh, endured by his family and descendants. Hugh Mann was a founding member of Federal Parliament back in 1901. He is the only member ever to be expelled from Federal Parliament. Hugh Mann represented the Federal seat of Coolgardie and then Kalgoorlie for the mighty Australian Labor Party. Hugh Mann was born in Ireland and came to Australia in 1882, having been a journalist and a political activist in his mother country. Hugh Mann was expelled from this parliament on the 11th November 1920, Remembrance Day, the day Ned Kelly was hanged, although uh, Ned was of Irish descent, he wasn't quite as innocent as Hugh Mann. Mann attended an Irish Island League meeting in Melbourne on the 7th of November uh, in 20, 1920, where he savagely attacked British policy and the empire. Two days after that meeting, Prime Minister Billy Hughes read a portion of Mann's speech in parliament and asked Mann if it was correct. 
Hughes had already decided on his course of action in his party room beforehand, I note. The Hansard reflects that Mann protested that he had never been disobedient to the rules of the House or shown disrespect to the Speaker of the House. When Prime Minister Hughes asked whether the House could take it that the report of his statement was correct, Mann responded, you are not to take anything of the kind. A letter was sent to Mann advising him that a motion was to be moved in Parliament calling for his expulsion. Mann informed the Prime Minister in writing that his speech was not seditious or disloyal and that the reported extracts were incomplete and taken out of context. Hughes wanted Mann to trample the shamrock and Mann would never do that. Unfortunately, Mann was unable to be present in the House when the motion was moved due to an accident and in his absence, the motion that Mann be expelled from the House, and I quote, having by seditious and disloyal utterances been guilty of conduct unfitting to remain a member of this House, was moved. Prime Minister Hughes summed up the government's case against Mann by saying, what he has done amounts to treason to Australia and makes him unfit to sit here as a member of the Australian Parliament. The motion was passed with only Mann's 25 loyal Labor colleagues dissenting, and that ended the parliamentary career of Hugh Mann, a member democratically elected by his constituents. The motion moved to expel Hugh Mann did not accuse him of treason. It actually accused him of seditious and disloyal utterances at a public meeting which amounted to conduct unfitting and inconsistent with the oath of allegiance. Hugh Mann was never charged with nor tried for, for treason. The Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Privilege reviewed Mann's expulsion back in 1984 and concluded that the government majority in the House of Representatives had demonstrably misused its powers. The Mann family had lived with this injustice for 100 years, Deputy Speaker. I first spoke about Hugh Mann's expulsion in 2016 in this House. I asked at the time that the House recognise that it was unjust and a misuse of power. Not only has there been no recognition of this injustice, but in 2018, then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, once a Republican, publicly referred to Mann having been convicted of treason. End quote. So now two Prime Ministers have wrongly stated that Hugh Mann was guilty of treason, Hughes and Turnbull. Hugh Mann's living descendants are understandably upset that not only has this injustice not been redressed by Parliament by way of a motion, uh, but that it has been exacerbated by our 29th Prime Minister. Hugh Mann's great-grandson, Andrew Wilson, lives in my electorate of Morton. I met with Andrew last week and he told me how this continuing injustice has impacted on the Mann family, Hugh's relatives. They are a proud family, the Mann's, and so they should be. Hugh Mann was a founding member of the Australian Parliament and two of Mann's three sons volunteered in the First World War, one as a medical officer and a, a second after Hugh Mann was a lieutenant in the 5th Battalion Artillery. He was awarded the Military Cross for heroism near Vervilliers and Framerville in France in 1918. Hugh Mann has three grandchildren that are living, one of them now 94 years old. Hugh Mann was not disloyal to Australia. He served this nation for 17 years as a member of this House. He was proud of his Irish ancestry, as am I, and as are many serving members of this House right now. Hugh Mann's expulsion was a bare-faced political manoeuvre and injustice writ large. I believe it is important that this House now recognises, although belatedly, that the expulsion of Hugh Mann was unjust and a misuse of the power the House possessed at the time of the 8th Parliament. I fervently hope that members of the 46th Parliament can recognise this injustice and make amends to correct the legacy of one of this Parliament's founding members. The Mann family deserves this. Is the motion seconded? The motion is seconded by the member for Werriwa. The question uh, is that the motion be agreed to. There being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. I call the member for Bowman. Move the Federation Chamber adjourn. Is the motion seconded? Second the, motion the motion is seconded. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Federation Chamber stands adjourned until 4pm on Tuesday the 1st of December 2020.